Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our inaugural Ladders to Cure Symposium. My name is Anna Grek. I'm a physician scientist and a cell biologist. I'm on the faculty at HMS, uh, a physician at the Brigham, and an institute member here at the Broad. And it's really my distinct pleasure to welcome everyone. And I'm just here at the beginning of the day to uh, provide some quick logistics uh, before I introduce um, the Broad director, Todd Golub, who will give some opening uh, remarks. So um, the first thing to say is um, I think you've all noticed that our AV, friendly AV um, uh, crew is right behind this door. So for the speakers, if you have any questions, uh, they can help us. Um, Matt is our point person, but there's a whole crew back there, and we're very grateful to them for their help. Uh, for the Q&A in the room, we have mics um, here at, at the front, but also we'll have some runners. Uh, so I know some of you who are sort of in the middle seats uh, can, can uh, uh, take advantage of that. Uh, and we hope to have an active... Um, conversation in the Q&As uh, throughout the day today. Uh, for those who are on YouTube, and we thank you for being with us online, uh, there's a small problem with the Q&A which we are going to fix, and it should be fixed um, uh, shortly uh, at the latest by 10 a.m., uh, so we're working on that. And we are recording this event, so uh, it will be posted, and so for those who may miss it, uh, there will be an opportunity to um, uh, see uh, what happened um, in, when the recording is up later this month. So um, this is uh, an inaugural symposium uh, to reflect our efforts to try to see if there's a way to use some of our modern tools and technologies to scale our efforts in rare genetic diseases. Uh, just uh, by way of quick introduction, there are approximately 8,000 rare genetic diseases. Um, as a biomedical community, we have at best made progress um, against perhaps 500 of them. So there's a huge, huge mismatch in those numbers and there's a lot more work to do. And the question is, um, can we do anything using our modern tools to accelerate our progress? And I think that's the fundamental question we'll be asking ourselves um, today. So as with anything new, there's a lot of effort that goes into um, into doing what we are going to do today to organize everything, to bring the speakers and to uh, think about the topics and the questions and the sessions. And so I, I want to start with the acknowledgements actually. Um, the most important person to acknowledge, I think, is Dr. Jillian Shaw. Um, she is a scientific advisor uh, to my group and to the Broad, and she's really done an amazing job. I know many of the speakers already know her well, uh, putting all of this together, and has been a tremendous thought partner. So, Jillian, thank you so much. Um, Katie Liguori uh, is assisting with all the logistics, and I really want to acknowledge all of her help. Many of you have uh, heard from her, and it's just... Uh, Really uh, tremendous uh, work, so I'm grateful to you, Katie, as well. Our events team here at the Broad is amazing. Um, Lindsay uh, Marokfer and Mary Kudzowski um, have done an amazing job, and you met them coming in this morning. And then our AV team, which I acknowledged, um, Scott uh, Sassone in the back, uh, Russell uh, Murakfer um, and Keith Erickson are in the back uh, helping us. And our auditorium AV tech is uh, Matt Perkins, who you also saw uh, coming in and out. So I wanna make sure I acknowledge the people who are behind the scenes, making sure that we're all happy and getting what we need and uh, have a successful day. So without further ado, because we're running a few minutes behind as well, um, I just wanted to say that it's been tremendously gratifying to see um, so much interest in this symposium, even though it's in the middle of summer, um, and to really uh, use this as a launch pad for what we hope to uh, accomplish next uh, in this uh, initiative across the entire um, ecosystem uh, here in Boston. Um, and to give some opening remarks um, uh, is um, Todd Golub. Um, Todd is uh, a founding member of the Broad and the director of the Broad um, currently. He is a renowned cancer biologist and and I think when we think about sort of biology at scale, I think really he and his team from very early days uh, put on the map what it means to do biology at scale uh, in the context of cancer biology. And I think in many ways, a lot of what we're talking about and a lot of the tools think that map, for example. You know, a lot of the tools have been built uh, by that community and we can now learn from them and build on that success, uh, hopefully to have an impact in another area in, in rare genetic diseases. So I think it's entirely appropriate that uh, such a remarkable scientist and, and, and incredible leader is here with us today to give some opening remarks. And Todd, thank you so much for doing that. Thanks, Anna. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to see you all here. It's my great pleasure to help open this symposium that, as, as Anna said, really marks the, the launch of this new initiative that I just couldn't be more um, excited about. Um, just, I, I wanted to start with sort of an interesting question, which is, you know, we're, we're here to talk about rare disease, and yet 
we've got 600 people registered for this symposium. This auditorium is, is almost full, and we have hundreds of people um, watching online. How could that be? Um, these are rare diseases, and yet there's this huge community of, of interested people. I think an obvious answer to that is that, well, yeah, it's a rare disease, but there are a lot of them, and so collectively, that touches a lot of people. That's true, and so there's lots of interest, but I think it, it maybe a less obvious um, answer to that is that I think there's a growing recognition that rare genetic diseases are windows into the biology of common disease, and that there's enormous amount we can learn from studying patients with, with rare genetic diseases. I'll re reflect on just my own experience as a, as a pediatric oncologist. Um, you know, one of the biggest discoveries really in, in cancer genetics and cancer biology was uh, made by colleague Stephen Friend when he was a pediatric oncology fellow at Dana-Farber and was next door at the Whitehead Institute in Bob Weinberg's lab studying a super rare childhood uh, cancer called retinoblastoma. Uh, an, uh, an eye, very rare eye tumor, where it was clear that there was genetic predisposition to retinoblastoma, but the gene causing this was not known. Stephen and Bob cloned that gene, now known as the RB gene, um, that is responsible for the development of, of retinoblastoma. It was the first tumor suppressor gene ever to be identified that then gave way to the uh, cloning and isolation, isolation cloning and detection of, of many, many tumor suppressor genes. But even more importantly, RB became a focal point for understanding cell cycle control and dysregulation of cell cycle in cancer more generally, and is just fundamental to some of the most common uh, cancers um, that we think about. Just from my own experience, when I was a postdoc, um, I studied one of my own patients who had leukemia. There were five other patients reported in the world literature that had this same chromosome abnormality. I set out to identify the genes involved there, really thinking about it as just a, an interesting, rare, very rare uh, form of leukemia, which it was. Um, but the mechanism that, under, that, that followed from that genetic discovery turns out to be a super common mechanism across childhood and adult cancers, uh, rare and common. So I think, you know, I, Anna mentioned the, 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 what we've learned from oncology. Rare cancers have cracked open a lot of our understanding for common cancers, and I think there's no reason to believe that that's not going to extend um, more generally. I think the other reason that there's so much interest in rare disease is that I think we all feel a kind of moral imperative to do more and to make more progress. Uh, for patients and their families that are affected by rare disease, it's super frustrating. They feel often alone that the world's not paying enough attention, that it's hard just to get good care um, because there aren't centers for, uh, of expertise in their, um, for their disease locally, and it's hard to get the attention of, of the research community to focus on those diseases in part because while in principle, all of the explosion of new tools and approaches that, that Anna referred to are in principle acceptable to, to rare disease researchers focused on a rare disease, in practice, they're really tough to actually access and utilize and leverage. And so part of what I'm really excited about for this Ladders to Cures initiative is the idea that maybe we could do something to make these tools and approaches and technologies and ways of thinking about disease more accessible to the research community, at least in Boston, if not, if not beyond. And that could have a real catalytic effect to accelerate the work of um, everyone in the community that cares about these rare diseases. And then the last reason that we're all here is because of Anna Greca, because she's done an amazing job of galvanizing the community to come together, not to own this thing um, at the Broad Institute, um, but to be a focal point for uh, bringing the Boston uh, community interested in rare disease and think about what could we do together that we couldn't uh, do uh, alone. And that's really exciting and that's a really Brody kind of concept to do that. So I'm, I'm fully behind it and um, excited to see it flourish. So thank you, uh, Anna, for making this happen and for Jillian for organizing uh, this symposium. Looks like a great day and uh, look forward to a great symposium.
Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm Heidi Rehm, and I get the distinct pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker, Elizabeth Engel. Uh, Elizabeth is a professor of neurology and ophthalmology at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, and she's really been a pioneering um, researcher and clinician working on cranial distant innervation disorders and really defining those disorders and discovering the underlying genetic basis of that, of those disorders. And we've just been delighted to work with her and her, or her team over the years in our rare disease program. So I've been in awe of her work for many years and I'm delighted to hear about her research uh, that she'll tell you about in a second. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. And, um, there we go, and, and, and thank you, Anna, and all who've organized the day. I'm really looking forward to all the talks, and I also want to highlight, take this opportunity to highlight this afternoon talks from other Boston children's investigators, Alan Begg, Mustafa Sahin, and Tim Yu. Um, they um, have, uh, I think, done a lot of work towards the goals of Ladder Secures, and in particular, I think Mustafa will highlight some of the infrastructure that we've built up at Children's over the decades um, towards some of these goals. And how do I move my slides forward? There, good. So. Um, to start the morning, I thought I'd describe my work, which I think is in uh, really interesting contrast to the next talk, because I use very, we, my lab uses very traditional approaches to study rare Mendelian disorders. Um, we study disorders, as Heidi mentioned, of cranial motor neuron development, particularly those that result in abnormal eye and face movement. Um, and in the context of the ladders to cures goals, indeed we do mechanism-focused research, but we are very far from achieving escape velocity. Um, and you, as I'm going to show you and demonstrate, our work is really a sequential slog of one followed by one followed by one. So we study these particular neurons because they are a very simple and beautiful system. They are a really powerful way to investigate both genetics but also neuro, neurodevelopment. And they're particularly beautiful because they exist as these nuclei of motor neurons in the brainstem. Um, each nucleus contains only hundreds to thousands of motor neurons, and each of these motor neurons must be born, acquire the correct identity, migrate to the correct location, and then send its axons out over these really beautiful, stereotypic, and uh, visible, tractable projections to innervate their target muscles. And despite this being a very simple system in the brain, indeed, you can imagine that this requires a series of unique genetic programs during early development. And we have found that Mendelian disorders can perturb the development of these cranial motor neurons, resulting in these phenotypes we call congenital cranial disinnervation disorders. These are congenital, they're stereotypic, they're lifelong, and they're visible to the examiner, such that we can walk into an exam room and not only predict the cranial nerve, but the branch of the cranial nerve that's failed to develop correctly. And that's a real strength of this system. Um, over time, we've defined a lot of these, and we've studied their mechanism, and the mechanisms fall into two groups. The first group are um, uh, disorders that result from uh, variants that alter cranial motor neuron identity or differentiation, and these tend to be transcription factor defects, while the second are disorders that affect the ability of the axons to either grow or to target the correct muscle, and in this case, the axon that's affected dies back, and then there's, again, secondary cell death of the cranial motor neuron. So in either case, you fail to innervate the target muscles. So with regard to the goals of, the, of, the, of this program, I just wanted to highlight some of the pitfalls of my system, which is that these are um, motor neurons that are born very early in development, around five to six weeks human gestation, and we cannot yet treat them beyond surgical management. Second, these are very rare cell types, and they need to be specifically produced. And we do not yet have IES or IPS protocols that allow us to make these very specific motor neurons. We make more of a generic motor neuron. So that's, that's a, a disadvantage. One of the advantages, though, is that these are really old motor neurons. All vertebrates have them. And so as a result, these disorders translate beautifully, going from human to mouse, allowing us to look at mechanisms that way. Here's a list of some of the disorders that we've defined over time and some of the genes that are all coding variants after doing all this and doing mechanism. We were left with a lot of unsolved cases. And so for that, just like many people, we turned to whole genome sequencing. And today, what I'd like to describe to you is a new story out of our lab in which we uh, described non-coding variants that result in the very bottom disorder, congenital facial weakness. 
so as a clinician scientist, I found it was really interesting that the work of many of you in the audience have, have, have defined the fact that only about 50% of Mendelian disorders are solved by protein coding genes. And for, to solve the other 50%, people often turn to the non-coding genome. Um, and they have particular interest in variants that fall in introns or in conserved non-coding elements. Despite these attempts, though, the list of non-coding Mendelian disorders is quite short, and those with solved mechanism are even shorter. So the conserved non-coding space that you're all familiar with includes these cis-acting regulatory elements, or CREs. These include enhancers that increase gene expression and silencers that decrease target gene expression. And what I want to emphasize is that these CREs are extremely important for control of developmental gene expression in particular. They regulate gene transcription in specific cell types at very specific times. That said, it's been very challenging to define their function and prove variant pathogenicity in Mendelian disorders. You have to identify a credible set of, um, of regulatory variants. You have to study the variants in the right cell type at the right time. And then you have to um, model the non-coding disorder in vivo, which typically fails. So I'd like to show you how we work through these challenges for one non-coding CCDD, just a demonstrative, the slog of one by one. So I'm going to take you through the arc of phenotyping, genetics, modeling, and mechanism to demonstrate how we've identified specific enhancer activity that's necessary to make a neuronal cell type called an inner ear efferent, and then how subsequent activation of a cell type silencer switches cell fate from inner ear efferents to facial motor neurons. We found that non-coding variants can reduce the silencing activity or enhance the enhancement activity, and as a result, shift uh, attenuate the cell shift, cell identity shift, resulting in making the making of more inner ear efferents at the expense of facial motor neurons and resulting in facial weakness. So a very simple model. So this, the disorder I'm going to describe is HCFP1, or it's an autosomal dominant form of facial palsy. It was mapped in the 1990s and simply not solved. We had accumulated several families in our cohort that map, were consistent with mapping to the locus, also unsolved by exome sequencing. So these were some of the families we turned to for genome sequencing. What I want to emphasize is quite remarkably, we solved every single isolated congenital facial palsy family in our cohort um, by variants at this locus. And we collaborated with a Dutch group who described the locus and solved five of their six families. And I would guess the sixth family is actually something different, but they didn't have deep phenotyping. So this is a remarkably um, a remarkable disorder for having very little heterogeneity genetically. The affected individuals have um, that you're, you see circled in red and you see uh, in higher pictures on the right, they have congenital, importantly, non-syndromic, isolated facial weakness. They have nothing else. It's often asymmetrical. It can be quite mild. This is not a life-threatening disorder. It's characterized by hypoplasia of the facial nucleus and facial nerve, and so this allowed us to confidently focus on facial motor neurons as the cell type of interest. This slide is going to summarize the genetics of this disorder. And what you see is, is uh, zooming in on a small region within the linkage region, we've identified five families that harbor overlapping tandem duplication. They share a 13 KB common region of duplication. And within that region, there is just one gene, DNA JB8, that we looked at extensively. It's not expressed in the brain. It's not expressed in the brain stem. And um, there's no evidence that it's involved in human disease. This minimum region, however, is about 20 kb downstream of the transcription factor GATA2. For the hematologists and the audience, people like that, it's a very familiar gene. In that duplication region are three conserved regulatory elements, CRE1, 2, and 3. We just named them along sequentially along the chromosome. And then we looked at the whole genome sequencing for the rest of our families in this, in this um, 13 kb critical region. And indeed, what we found in the families were a series of single nucleotide variants that altered highly conserved nucleotides, all non-coding. Not only at that, they cluster in two clusters, cluster A and cluster B, and they are all in CRE2, that middle conserved region. So what was known about these regions? When we started, there was some data to suggest that CRE1 and CRE3 were enhancers and that they specifically enhanced GATA2. That led us to hypothesize that maybe CRE2 was a silencer. We hypothesized that because of what the genetics was teaching us. If, if GATA2 is a silencer, then the SNVs would reduce silencing, 
while the duplications would enhance or shift the balance towards the enhancers. And we were predict that either of these would increase GATA2 expression. And this was important because many of you know that GATA2 haploinsufficiency in humans causes blood and immune disorders, but no abnormality of facial movement. So this was not a, a loss of function variant. To test our hypothesis, we needed to determine where GATA2 was expressed in uh, relative to facial motor neuron development. And to do that, I'm going to turn to some very basic uh, developmental neurobiology here. So the developing hybrid is divided transiently into rhombomeres. These are transient compartments. And facial motor neuron progenitors are in rhombomere 4. And then those motor neurons migrate down to their home in rhombomere 6. Interestingly, that cell type I mentioned earlier, the inner ear efferent neurons are also born in the same progenitor pool, and then they migrate laterally within R4. We looked at birth dating of these cells, and indeed, the inner ear efferents are born first, and the facial motor neurons are born second. So islet 1 is a marker of motor neurons, and so this is just a, an, an in situ of islet 1. Again, Using the schematic above, these are the R4 motor neurons and or the R4 progenitors, and these are those migrating facial motor neurons. And what I want to highlight here in this GATA2 and C2 is the following. There is expression in those R4 progenitors. There's expression in parasagittal interneurons, but there is not expression in those migrating facial motor neurons. We um, know that GATA2 works um, downstream of HOXB1 and FOX2A in the hindbrain and works upstream of its effector GATA3. And so the next thing we did was look at protein expression of islet 1, GATA2, and GATA3. And I'm going to show you data for E14 and a half. This is the age when most of these progenitors have reached their, these neurons have reached their destination, but these uh, genes are still expressed. So if you look here, this is a cross section of the hindbrain in R4. You can see that these kind of uh, mixed color whitish cells are the IEEs, and they're expressing islet 1, GATA2, and GATA3. This is a cross-section at the level of R6. And you can see these blue cells define the facial motor, nu motor nuclei. They're expressing islet 1, but they are not expressing GATA2 and GATA3, very consistent with the immuno that I showed you. So one of the first questions that Alan asked when he was working on this project was um, whether GATA2 and GATA3 are critical for IEE and, facial, and or facial motor neuron development. And there was some debate in the literature about that. So this is, again, the wild type. And then what he did was he knocked out um, GATA2 and GATA3 conditionally using a FOX2B Cree that removed it just from the hindbrain. And what you see is that indeed the IEs are absent in the GATA2 and GATA3 conditional knockouts, while the facial motor neurons look completely normal. In mice, the facial motor neurons control whisker movement, and so Alan developed a semi quantitative assay of whisker movement by reporting adult mice running on a treadmill and then looking at the movements in slow motion. And here you can see what is a normal whisker movement at slow motion. We score it 3 and 3 in a wild-type mouse. And indeed, in the GATA2 and GATA3 mice, we blindly scored them also 3-3. Three, three. So this is consistent with GATA2 and GATA3 not being important to facial motor neuron development, but being master regulators of IEE cell fate. So this led to the schematic hypothesis that IEEs and facial motor neurons are born from the same R4 progenitor pool. Early on, GATA2 and GATA3 are expressed to make mature IEEs. They are then subsequently turned off, expressing only islet 1 to make facial motor neurons. In HCFP1, we proposed that the variants alter the timing of the transition between these two cell types. The SNVs alter CRE2 such that it can't bind a transcription factor to silence the GATA2, while the duplications would shift the balance again towards enhancers. And either of these would postpone the cell fate switch and make more IEEs and fewer facial motor neurons. So one of the questions we wanted to know is, does CRE2 actually act as a silencer in a subset of R4 motor neurons specifically? And to do this, we collaborated with Len Pinocchio's group and used their in vivo Lexi enhancer screen, which provides spatial data of enhancer activity. Um, and they look specifically at E11 and a half, so that worked out really well for us. It's a great date for us. They tested multiple constructs, but I just want to show you a snapshot of data from CRE1 and CRE2. And I want you to look in particular um, at the beta gal expression in migrating facial motor neurons, because GATA2 should not be expressed there, right? So in this top-down view of the hindbrain showing the beta gal expression, this is homologous recombination of CRE1. And you see expression in the R4 motor neurons, but you also see expression of this, uh, this enhancer in those migrating facial motor neurons. 
By contrast, Siri 2 is blank, consistent with being a silencer. And so then we combine Siri, they combine Siri 1 and Siri 2. And indeed, what they found was there's still expression in those R4 motor neurons, but now the GATA2 expression in those migrating facial motor neurons has been silenced. If you do the same experiment when, um, with a construct harboring the mutations in the CRE2, you see now that that expression has returned. So this is consistent with wild type CRE2, but not mutant CRE2, silencing this enhancer activity, specifically in facial motor neurons. So we wanted to know what repressive transcription factor might bind a CRE2 and whether if it did bind there, if the SNVs disrupted that binding. We did this in a couple different ways through in silico and RNA expression studies. We found that the, there's a conserved binding motif for the uh, transcription factor NR2F1, specifically in CRE2 cluster A. By EMSA, NR2F1 bound to the sequence and the SNVs disrupted it. That's all cool, but you really want to know in vivo, does it bind specifically to developing R4 motor neurons? It's again, right cell type, right time. So to do this, we developed a cluster A SNV mouse model. For reasons I can tell you about later if you're interested, this is a phenotypically normal mouse, but that sequence is conserved. So we could still use that mouse to ask whether or not NR2F1 bound there and if it was disrupted in this mouse. And so to do this, we isolated um, facial motor neurons, in fact, sorted them from a reporter mouse. And then um, we used in situ cut and tag of a, a, using an NR2F1 antibody um, to ask if there is binding. So with a single cell pseudo bulk analysis here, you can see two wild type replicates and uh, as two mutant replicates and looking specifically at CRE2, you can see indeed NR2F1 sequence pile up at this location and a reduction in sequence pile up in the mutant. So this suggests that indeed, despite lacking a phenotype, the mouse provides in vivo support for NR2F1 as a candidate transcription factor whose binding is attenuated in this disease state. We next wanted to model the duplication to see if we could get a phenotype. And to do this, we actually inserted tandem copies of the human Siri 1 sequence between mouse Siri 1 and Siri 2. And we were very pleased that these mice have no whisker movement and have a congenital facial weakness phenotype. This permitted us to examine a lot of different things, but one question we asked first was what genes were regulated by these elements through single cell RNA sequencing? Of the 16 clusters that we classified on a UMAP plot here, clusters one through six define the developmental trajectory of those R4 motor neurons from the progenitors and precursors to the bipotent R4 motor neurons to the IEEs in cluster five and the facial motor neurons in cluster six. If you now look at the wild type and the Siri 1 dupe data separately, the clustering is quite similar, but do note that the IEEs have increased cell density in the mutant and fewer facial motor neurons. We also did differential expression analysis of clusters one through six, and this, to our delight, showed that the most enriched genes in the uh, duplication mouse were GATA2 and GATA3, and the most enriched, or one of the most enriched in the wild type was NR2F1. I also want to highlight that in wild type embryos, GATA2 expression becomes restricted over time. So this is a pseudo time trajectory now. And you can see that at E9 and a half, GATA2 is expressed in the progenitors as well as in the IEEs that are coming down to the right. Whereas by E10 and a half, GATA2 is only in those mature IEEs. When you look at the mutant, there is a higher level of GATA2 expression overall. And what's remarkable is when you look at 10 and a half, you see the persistent expression of GATA2 in the um, progenitors as well as in the IE, suggesting they continue to be born. Um, NR2F1 is expressed as expected in the progenitors and the facial motor neurons. So this provided evidence that these elements do control GATA2 expression. Um, but we also did EDU birth dating, and we were able to show that in E10.5 and wild type embryos, only facial motor neurons are generated, whereas by birth dating um, in the mutants, they're still generating 40% IEEs. So finally, we examined the histology to visualize the sequelae of this extended IEE formation. And here again are wild type embryos, what you saw before on the left and on the right now showing NR2F1 staining as well. And these are the duplication embryos. Um, note this incredible increase in cellularity in R4 that looked like ectopic IEEs. They're GATA2, GATA3, islet positive. 
Then when you look down at the level of R6, compared to the wild type nucle nucleus, you see that the, the facial motor nucleus is markedly hypoplastic. So we also counted all these cells in a only semi-automated way. Um, and we found that there's no change in total number of motor neurons, but a 75% decrease in the number of facial motor neurons that make it down to the nucleus. So lastly, we need to really prove that GATA2, GATA3 pathway is the target of these variants. And so to do that, we tried to rescue this phenotype. And we did that by crossing the duplication to the conditional GATA3 knockout mouse because of linkage disequilibrium with the GATA2 knockout. And then we looked for rescue. So here is the wild type embryo. This is the Siri1 duplication embryo. And this is the rescue. And the first thing to note is that indeed the eyes, EEs are missing from the rescue because of the GATA3 conditional knockout. But more importantly, look at the rescue of that hypercellularity in R4. And then when you look at the facial motor neurons in the wild type, I hope, there we go, in the wild type versus the duplication versus the rescue, sorry, I clicked that one time too many, you see, an, you see a, a recovery or an intermediate size of the nucleus. And then when you look at the adults, we were able to rescue the phenotype in six of seven of the animals that we examined. So this shows us that, this is, that the phenotype is at least partially rescued by GATA2, GATA3, and that there's very strong evidence that indeed this is the target gene. So I hope I've convinced you that over 90% of dominant congenital facial weakness result from these very interesting non-coding variants at this HCFP1 locus. And by introducing these variants into mouse, um, we were able to uh, get at mechanism. We found that the initial expression of GATA2 and Rhombomere 4 progenitors generates IEs in both the wild type on the left and the mutant on the right. And in the normal stage two, NR2F1 or possibly a different transcription factor binds to CRE2 to decrease GATA2 and shift the cell identity, while in the mutants, GATA2 expression remains high, and as a result, you lose facial motor neurons at the cost of IEEs. So I hope that this shows you just the complexity of trying to address the non-coding variation in Mendelian disorder for one simple non-life-threatening disorder. Um, and it'll be really fun to talk to the group about how we can begin scaling some of this up to achieve more of an escape velocity in the future. We have lots of others of these sitting around waiting to be worked on. Um, and I just want to say who we are, because we was not me, but uh, the co-first authors on this paper are Alan Tenney on the top left, Ali DeJoy on the bottom left, and Bryn Reb on the upper right. And then Joe Chen also made huge contributions to it, and um, many other collaborators and um, our funding sources. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we have designed a Q&A at the end of this session, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker. I wanted to say that we are uh, purposely uh, demonstrating a juxtaposition that you're about to hear. Um, oh, and this has to do with the idea of, uh, you know, us trying to illustrate just the tremendous amount of fundamental basic science work that needs to take place from the initial observation in a human to finally unraveling a mechanism, right? And you know, sit with that tension, that difficulty of all of that work, all those years of work that are needed to get to that point, and now how one might take that information and translate it into something that can be a real treatment um, for patients. And so this is kind of the, the theme of this first morning session to really uh, demonstrate that uh, long arc uh, that is required, and then to consider ways that we might be able to accelerate it if possible and how. Um, so Ted Love is our next uh, keynote speaker. He currently serves as the chair of the board of directors for the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, known as BIO or BIO. It is actually the world's largest advocacy association, representing member companies, state biotechnology groups, academic and research institutions, and related organizations across the United States and 30 plus countries. Uh, prior to this role, um, Ted served as the chief executive officer at Global Blood Therapeutics, and I think we're gonna hear a little bit about that story, which is really a tremendous story um, in sickle cell disease until uh, he was served in this role until the company's acquisition by Pfizer uh, last year in October of 22. 
Um, I think few can uh, demonstrate this incredible uh, career that, that Ted has had, um, long and successful career, both in uh, small biotech as well as bigger uh, pharma companies. Uh, he has served in uh, leadership roles at Onyx Pharmaceuticals. Um, he was um, prior to that at Novello and TheraVance and also spent uh, some of his earlier time at uh, Genentech as part of the senior management uh, and was responsible for some of the treatments that are now, I would think, um, household names names like um, rituximab, uh, for example, and uh, Herceptin. So um, Ted is actually part of our community uh, in some ways. Uh, he um, received his BA in molecular biology at Haverford College and his MD at Yale Medical School, but he completed his residency and fellowship in internal medicine at uh, Mass General Hospital and then uh, went on to cardiology uh, training there. So um, as, a, as a fellow MGH Blue Blood, you know, I am very delighted to welcome Ted Love to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anna, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I should start with a disclaimer and say that uh, I'm speaking really as an independent person. I don't work for Pfizer, and as Anna pointed out, GBT no longer exists. Um, also, by way of background, I want to tell you that sickle cell is a very unusual disease. It is a rare disease in the US, there are about 100,000 people. But there are literally millions of people in the world, probably in the range of 12 to 15 million people in the world who are suffering and dying from sickle cell disease. Uh, and as Anna mentioned, I had had uh, a really good career, had actually retired to the wine country with my wife when I got a call from uh, a group of friends who had started a venture fund called Third Rock Ventures that's here in Boston. And they said, Ted, we're going to start a company to focus on sickle cell disease. We'd like for you to exit retirement and build this company. And of course, I was not excited about doing that. But uh, I ultimately realized, and my family actually said to me, this is a moral imperative for you to do this. And the reason I felt it was a moral imperative is not only because this disease kills so many people around the world, is because it had been tremendously underinvested in all around the world, in the United States. And most people think that's because it's a disease that primarily affected African Americans, people of color. So I came out of retirement to do this for many different reasons, some of which uh, really relate to the historical neglect for these patients, both scientifically as well as in the clinic, which I saw when I was a practicing physician. So the story I'm going to talk about really is a story, as Anna said, about rational drug design to try to solve a problem uh, in many ways exploiting some of the kind of intuitive mechanisms that drive the disease. So when I was a physician seeing sickle cell patients, you know, I really thought about sickle cell disease as the things on the right. These people were coming in they were dying prematurely in their 20s and 30s and 40s, generally due to multi-organ fail, failure. Uh, but they were also coming in with acute problems like stroke, acute uh, chest syndrome, and pain episodes. I think most people, when they think of sickle cell disease, think about pain episodes. But if you really want to think about solving a disease, of course, you don't think about the way the patient presents. I mean. I remember when I was a young medical student at Yale, all these patients were coming in with something that we used to call gay bowel syndrome, believe it or not. It ended up being HIV. And the solution for that disease ended up being you know, to kill the virus, even though the way the, the disease presented was extraordinarily uh, 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 protean in its manifestations, very similar to sickle cell disease. So sickle cell disease, is actually nature's creation to fight against malaria. And it is transmitted through simple Mendelian genetics. Uh, and if you're born with one gene, you have sickle trait and you're perfectly healthy. If you are unfortunate enough to get two bad copies, you have sickle cell disease. And the reason you have sickle cell disease is that when 100% of the hemoglobin in the red cell has this single 
point mutation on it, the hemoglobin polymerizes into rods. And those rods deform, deform the red blood cell, uh, kind of like putting a sword inside of a balloon. It will take on the shape of the rod of the sword inside. So this polymerization leads to the deformity, makes the blood more viscous, leads to injury, and of course, these patients are profoundly anemic, typically starting at about six months old. Uh, so they're living with half of the oxygen transport that you and I get, you and I have. So it's not surprising that over years, these individuals develop uh, the protein manifestations, not only of these processes, but the chronic uh, uh, lack of adequate delivery to every organ in their body. So I apologize, a few of the slides didn't quite come out, but it won't really bother us very much. This slide is really to point out that we tried to think very holistically about if polymerization of the sickle hemoglobin is the problem, how could you stop that? And if you could really stop that efficiently, in theory, you should be able to make the disease go away. A little bit like killing an HIV virus, you make capacities, all these other problems that people have, go away if you could just kill the virus. So we thought a lot about the various ways to stop the polymerization. One way to do it is to induce hemoglobin F, which does not have the mutation on it. And if you could get enough hemoglobin F inside of every red cell, the disease goes away. And there's actually a genetic condition called persistent expression of hemo fetal hemoglobin where people with sickle cell disease don't get sick because they have typically around 30, 40% of the hemoglobin in every red cell has hemoglobin F. So just diluting the sickle hemoglobin from 100% down to something less than 100% has a positive impact on the, on the disease. You could also think about just introducing water into the red cell that would dilute the hemoglobin. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'll point out, we've decided to focus on stabilizing the oxygen on the hemoglobin. And, and in part, the reason we did this is because the way the sickle cell was a wonderful thing for malaria is that if you have one copy of the gene, you have sickle trait, half of your hemoglobin is sickle hemoglobin. And under normal conditions, you're perfectly healthy. But if you become infected with the falciparum, the falciparum is using energy and using oxygen inside of your red cells, and that's creating a hypoxic environment. And that makes even only 50% of the hemoglobin polymerize so efficiently that it kills the red cell with the rods. And by killing the red cell, you kill the falciparum, and you have this wonderful advantage. So we decided, what if we could do the opposite? What if we could do something to the sickle hemoglobin that made the oxygen stay on. Because we know that sickle hemoglobin with oxygen attached to it will not polymerize. So our approach really focused on the bottom <clears throat> strategy. And the way to think about this is that if you take sickle hemoglobin and you put it into uh, um, a cuvette and you deoxygenate it, it will begin to polymerize. But initially, there's this delay time before it polymerizes. And we also realized that we didn't need to stop polymerization entirely. We simply needed to stop it for that limited time that the red blood cells are in the hypoxic area of the body. Once the red cell gets back to the lung, it gets lots of oxygen, and the red cells, and, uh, the hemoglobin is oxygenated, and the red cells will not polymerize. So we were very much also aware that we could exploit this phenomena called delay time. The other thing that's very important when you're trying to make a new therapy, and we did this all the time at Genentech, which is where I started my career, is look at all the pre-existing science. Um, many people felt there was so much hemoglobin in the body that attacking hemoglobin, like attacking albumin, is probably just a Herculean impossible task. But there have been a few um, who had actually thought maybe you could attack hemoglobin. And there was a company called Burroughs Welcome many years ago who made two compounds, 
BW12C79 and Ticarasol. Those drugs actually didn't make it, but we went back at the literature and we looked at some of the early data and it looked actually somewhat encouraging. Even with a single IV infusion of these drugs in patients with sickle cell disease. There are also naturally occurring aldehydes on the right, which gave us some clues about if we were going to try to do this chemistry wise, where, where would we start? So we started with the pre existing science uh, that had been done by a company and also by nature. And of course, we had a really nice assay for looking at whether these molecules were binding hemoglobin and making the oxygen uh, bind a bit more tightly. Uh, these are the so-called ODC curves, or oxygen desaturation curves on the left uh, in panel A, looking at purified hemoglobin. And on the right is something that you probably have seen more often, certainly in medicine, is whole blood, this ODC curve. So if you're making a molecule that's making the oxygen bind more tightly, these curves will shift to the left. If you make a molecule which makes the oxygen fall off more readily, the curves will shift uh, to the right. So we had uh, an idea of the chemistry. We had uh, a ready assay uh, to take molecules through. So we began to make a variety of molecules. Um, uh, uh, just one of the things to point about, uh, about you know, building a company like this, uh, over the eight years that I was building the company, I raised and spent about one and a half billion dollars. We actually became the largest investor in sickle cell disease in the world, more than any government had ever invested in these. GBT became the largest investor in the world. The molecule that we made that ultimately became approved is called Voxelator in this slide. And what you're looking at are some of the characteristics of this molecule compared to other molecules that have been made and tested. And I'll just refer you to the one millimeter mercury, uh, one millimeter concentration uh, column where you see six, uh, the, uh, it only takes six millimolar of uh, voxelator to move the P50 curve um, uh, or to, to it only, takes, it only takes that to move the curve to where the P50 is six millimeter. Um, um, I'm sorry, how did I put it? The way, the way to think about this is you're moving the oxygen dissociation curve with all of these molecules. But the simplest way to think about it is the magnitude of movement is, 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 is reflected by the concentration that it takes to move the curve. So you can see the other molecules at about 25 nanomolar are moving the curve, but about four times the potency of these molecules were produced with this, with this molecule voxelator. The other thing you'll see is that these molecules had a very long half-life, and the reason they turned out to have a very long half-life is that these molecules partition in the red cell. In fact, 99.9% .9 of these molecules, when you take them orally or absorb in the blood, get in the red blood cell and they can't be metabolized. And therefore, you can get a very, very long half-life. So a lot of the historical reasons that we felt you couldn't attack hemoglobin, actually hemoglobin being inside the red cell turned out to be a real advantage. The, and this is a little bit of data looking at uh, voxelator. Again, the slides are a little bit uh, uh, disfigured, but you can see the normal curve is being very powerfully moved to the left uh, with increasing concentrations of oxalator. And on this panel, you see the curve and you see the delay of oxygen release, kind of the opposite of the curve. And you can see, even with 100% binding of oxalator to hemoglobin, it still released the oxygen. Uh, this, you can see the perfect curve would be right at the top, the oxygen never comes off. But these molecules are not able to make the oxygen uh, not come off of the hemoglobin. So uh, probably the strength of my career has been working with the Food and Drug Administration and getting the Food and Drug Administration to think creatively about how you develop a drug. And this is particularly a problem, by the way, in rare diseases, 
because the FDA typically wants to approve a drug only if you show you can extend the life of the patient, you can improve the function of the patient, or maybe you can improve how the patient lives, how they are able to get up and dress or go to work. Uh, but in a disease, many, many diseases like sickle cell disease, many of the rare diseases, those endpoints don't really work very well. So I remember going very early on to the FDA and saying, well, we know this disease is caused by polymerization, and everyone agreed to that. So if we could measure the polymer inside the red cell, <clears throat> that would be good evidence that we are solving this disease. And the FDA agreed with that. And I said, well, we can't measure the polymer in the red cell, but we can measure how rapidly the polymer is killing the red cell. That's just measuring the hemoglobin or the red blood cell count. So they agreed to this as an exploratory endpoint. They ultimately agreed to it as an approvable endpoint, but initially they only agreed as an exploratory endpoint. So what you're looking at <clears throat> in the panel on the left is <clears throat> patients being treated initially with placebo in red, being treated with 900 milligrams of this drug uh, once a day in light blue, or being treated with 1,500 milligrams in dark blue. And we're showing you the data at week 24, which is about six months. But if you look at the data at two weeks, the curve already essentially looks like it looks at week 24. <clears throat> you get this very uh, prominent increase uh, in the hemoglobin count. And it's a dose response, as you can see. And in these patients, the placebo patients were crossed over to active therapy. Uh, you can see later on, and you can see their response completely mimics uh, that of the treatment group. So this was very good evidence that we are, in fact, interrupting the polymerization. And literally within days, the hemoglobin goes up. We've actually had patients <clears throat> who've been in hospital <clears throat> with hemoglobins of two, which personally I didn't think would be compatible with life. Uh, these patients are very sick. <clears throat> But um, uh, we've had patients discharged from hospitals with hemoglobin of eight after being in that situation where they're uh, in the ICU. So this, this works very quickly. This is some of the uh, data that we've generated in longer term follow-up where we see that simply by interrupting the polymerization, we've been able, able to cut transfusions in half uh, and reduce these pain episodes that patients get by a quarter. Uh, reduce the use of iron chelation therapy, which is very difficult for patients and also very expensive. So the long-term outcome of interrupting the polymerization, which drives the disease, is as predicted. So um, we um, started out really with a goal to cure sickle cell disease. The, the goal really was to convert people with sickle disease into their parents who typically have sickle trait. And we thought what we need to do is to get about half of the hemoglobin into this non-polymerizing state. And even with a gram and a half of oxalator, we could only get about a quarter of the hemoglobin into this state. So if you look at our data, it says that the more, the more of oxalator we get, the better uh, the outcomes. Uh, and we thought a lot about what, are, what would be the advantages and what would be the requirements of getting half of the hemoglobin into this non-polymerizing state? And for the sake of time, I'll just skip ahead and say that we did uh, make another molecule, and it wasn't easy. This molecule is called uh, 601. Um, um, it's actually, um, uh, in, in, in our real system, it's, it's 24,601. We number the molecules in the order that we made them. So we had actually made uh, almost 25,000 molecules and tested them. You can see why we spent a billion dollars um, uh, to get to this. But this molecule had some characteristics that were actually a step function superior. So you saw Voxelator was almost an order of magnitude more potent than anything made before. This molecule ended up being about 15 times as potent as Voxelator. Um, so we wanted to see <clears throat> very quickly in humans, uh, could we essentially cure sickle cell disease with this? And 
this, not, this experiment is not going to prove it, but it's a very interesting experiment. It's the first in-man experience where we gave patients <clears throat> a single dose. Uh, we let uh, the therapy watch it, wash out just to make sure it was safe. And then we brought the patients back in and we gave them um, uh, a higher dose uh, repeated. And then finally, we gave them an even higher dose repeated uh, for three weeks. And again, we were looking at whether or not we could get at least a third of the hemoglobin into this non-polymerizing state, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe up to half of the hemoglobin into that state. And we wanted to do it with less than 500 milligrams, because 500 milligrams would be one tablet. Uh, one relatively large tablet, but it would be one tablet. So this is what we saw. These patients received only 100 milligrams a day. Uh, so it's a very small uh, daily tablet. And the, the line, um, the dash line, is the historical experience of how much occupancy of hemoglobin we get with Oxprida at 1,500 milligrams, around 25%. And you can see these individual patients had uh, uh, occupancies that were uh, very uh, consistently in that range or above that range. And again, this is only 100 milligrams. Now, we looked also at their hemoglobin response. How, what impact were we having on red cell destruction? Uh, and you can see these very substantial increase in hemoglobin. For many of these patients, uh, their hemoglobins weren't going to go any, high, any higher because their hemoglobins were normal. Uh, and obviously, the drug uh, should not be stimulating their hemoglobin uh, to go above normal. This is um, an assay that wasn't developed by our company. It was developed by a partner company that we work with in Europe. And uh, it's actually getting more at looking at the polymerization inside the hemoglobin. What um, this data would be looking at is essentially taking a sickle red cell and stretching it uh, or seeing how stiff it is uh, or introducing hypoxemia and watching it sickle. That's what we call the point of sickling. And by measuring those parameters, we could very elegantly measure how much drug it would require to get these patients to normal. And one of the things that we had on this slide was a person with sickle trait. And the goal was to move all of these parameters in sickle cell patients to overlap the behavior of the red cell with sickle trait. And we felt that would be good evidence that these patients were at least biochemically cured, and we would expect long-term clinically to manifest being cured. This is a slide I used to love to show. I remember when uh, I was doing the initial public offering for the company, uh, I had all these slides that would tell the story. And my last slide was usually a micrograph of the blood. And most of the investors were saying, why, why, why didn't you just show me this slide at the end? Uh, so this is a slide of two patients uh, with sickle cell disease before they were treated at the top. And I think you can see that there are fewer red cells. And you can also see there are quite a few sickled or distorted red blood cells. So after about three months of treatment, the same patient's blood looks very different. It starts to look actually pretty close uh, to normal. So I'll stop here. Uh, and uh, tell you that we do think, and now Pfizer owns all of this, uh, we do think that GBT-601 uh, could represent a pharmacologic cure for sickle cell disease. Uh, it appears, and now we've dosed, dosed many more patients. I'm not working for Pfizer, so I don't have uh, the latest data. But with a single dose, we're able to get uh, 60 70 percent of the hemoglobin into the non-polymerizing state. Uh, the majority of patients are manifesting normal hemoglobins. And I'm told, uh, I don't have access to all the data, that patients uh, are stopped. Uh, their crises and other manifestations are correcting. Uh, one very recent patient came, had very severe pulmonary hypertension, uh, very advanced kidney disease. And both of those things are completely reversing in this patient. So uh, this is. Uh, a nice example of what an MGH education might be like. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> We'll do a QA. and a yep. Um, are we and I apologize, I've got to run. I'm, right I agreed to do a yes. talk in San Diego okay. tomorrow morning, so I've got to Maybe get to Maybe we'll San just Diego. stand on the edges of the room. Any burning questions uh, from the room to start with? Oh, yes, Dr. Sampson. Would you mind coming up to the? Hi there, um, Matt Sampson, Boston Children's Hospital, Peds Nephrology. Um, I, I love both y'all's talks. Um, as someone who, you know, uh, I'm thinking about developmental anomalies and how to achieve escape velocity in part is in terms of funding investment. We just heard it takes more than a billion dollars to, to move needles. But, you know, in our world, you know, the most common cause of chronic kidney disease in children is developmental anomalies. And the funding environment to uh, invest in fundamental observations and discoveries that, in my opinion, I think most of the room's opinion, they matter in and of themselves. It's been a bit challenging with the argument perhaps being developmental disorders, it's already happened, what can we do? Um, and I would think of the thousands of rare Mendelian disorders, many of them are developmental. So I was just wondering if you have any perspectives from your experience funding or talking about in general, how is it that we can create a compelling argument to get these initial funding and investments to study some fundamental aspects in of them as, you know, uh, Todd alluded to in and of themselves it matters for the rare disease patients, but maybe more generally for common diseases. So how, how do we fund this kind of stuff? Um, gosh, I, I think that there's been no question that the pendulum has swung away, well, it probably in the last 10 years swung away from developmental disorders a little bit, and, yeah. and particularly, for, I think, away from neurodevelopment. I think it's a pendulum, so I think it swings back and forth. Hopefully, other things in the world do as well, um, <laughs> and um, and and so I, I think that a lot of it. Well, part of it is petitioning NIH, I suppose, big you know big initiatives, things like this, where we can can suggest that by doing higher throughput assays, by you know doing what people are doing for common disease, for rare disease, where we have a lot more epigenetic information for the right cell types. We have it available, so it doesn't have to be recreated the way we have to recreate it every time. We'll make it easier to do one-by-one -one studies. Um, but then I think it's also an individual ability to sell that exact concept in your grant proposals. Like, why is this important? I mean, I run into this all the time. Right. Oh my god, you know, like, you can't do anything about your disorders. I suffer at night thinking, oh my god, I'm doing something worthless. But but I, but I do, I do think that we can use these, sell these as examples of mechanisms, not the breakthroughs Todd's made, obviously, and 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 for sickle cell where it's moved to therapy. But but you just simply have to um, uh, write a convincing grant that suggests that these are feasible, and then hope you go to the right study section yeah. that's going to. I wonder if our private partners also like how to talk to private partners about this yeah. kind of thing as well. I, I think we have anything. some in the audience, so we exactly. can. Um, <laughs> Ask them. Yeah, I, I was. I was just going to ask. I, mean, I haven't written a grant in thirty-five years, so, but, so I couldn't talk about writing grants. But, um, you know, individuals who who who've been affected by diseases uh, are, I've found the most wonderful advocates for that disease. So, if you can find individuals who are affected by the disease, many of those individuals will put their personal resources into the disease. They're also very powerful advocates to take to the NIH or take uh, to the federal government. Uh, and BIO is very involved with NORD and other groups that advocate. So there are resources out there. I'm happy to talk to you offline about how to plug into some of those. But uh, I, people who've been affected by the disease are by far and away the most powerful advocates for bringing resources to solve the disease. Actually, on the equity side, you mentioned that it was a moral imperative to really pursue some of the comeback from retirement plans. You know, one of the things I've observed is the rate of diagnosis of individuals of more diverse backgrounds is much lower. They're less likely to get genetic testing, enter research studies, and therefore ultimately benefit from, you know, treatments that are developed and even getting the diagnoses that might be prevalent in those populations actually studied. Do you have thoughts on how we, from the very start, in terms of you know, enrollment in research studies and equitable access to healthcare, how, how we can really start to address this in a broader way? 
both yeah, of you? I, I do, and what I would say is that I think most of it's relatively simple stuff, but <clears throat> you know, we do start out with a historical um, <clears throat> distrust of the healthcare system uh, in certain communities, particularly the African American community. So when we were starting our company, even before we put anything into the clinic, I would physically go and attend sickle cell meetings. We would buy uh, water bottles. Sickle cell patients really need to be careful about their hydration. We'd buy water bottles with a little GBT name on them. We'd buy blankets because these patients uh, often get cold and that can send them into crises. Uh, we, were, we were there. In fact, I still do a number of talks in the sickle cell community and I donate my personal money uh, in the sickle cell community. So um, I think that it really does start with building trust. That's very fundamental, but it's not easy to do. Uh, but it does require going where the patients are and spending time and <clears throat> really showing that you care about them. And in our case, it was important to do it before we started our clinical study. We invited them to actually talk about what did they want to see from the clinical study to be proof that the, the, the drug was helping them. And we put that in our protocols. And then, of course, as we were doing our studies, we provided all sorts of resources. Now it's becoming more common, but we would provide rides. We'd also um, make um, our centers where patients are being evaluated open at odd hours, because these patients have a very hard time keeping a job. So having them come to a clinic uh, during the middle of the day, taking time off from their job at McDonald's, it just isn't, doesn't work for them. So we had to do a lot of things, but I would say it started with going and talking to them and actually listening to what they had to say and then acting upon it. Hi, um, I'm Sonia Vallev. I do prion disease drug development here at the Broad, and uh, it's incredibly moving, Dr. Love, to hear the story of drug development um, that you told um, as such a complete arc. Um, that's just a really beautiful thing. Um, I have to imagine that while you were in it, there were moments when um, you felt the way I feel every day, which is, oh my God, how can this be taking so long? Um, so I was just curious to hear, as you look back on that story, where do you feel that you lost time? Um, and that, you know, there are the worthy reasons and there are what I might classify as the unworthy reasons. Sometimes yeah. the science is just that hard. And sometimes you think this isn't science actually that's in my way right now. So I'd just be curious to hear your reflections on that. Well, <clears throat> so we went from the idea to Pfizer buying the company for $6 billion in eight years. Uh, so it was pretty fast. Uh, so we didn't waste a lot of time. But people in the company would tell you that I complained that we enrolled our trials too slowly. Uh, and one of the things that we did learn is that if you really want to enroll studies, you need to go where the disease is most prevalent. And of course, it's not a prevalent disease in the United States. So we ended up building a significant clinical trial infrastructure in several of the African countries and we would enroll these trials very rapidly once we got there. So it took us a while to get through um, some of the regulatory and some of the government issues, not only with the FDA <clears throat> and the US, but with governments all around the world, particularly governments that aren't accustomed to doing studies. So we found ourselves really being the first ever many times, first people trying to do a clinical study of this type uh, in Ghana, in Uganda, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, so I think we, we've become very good at that, but um, that's really where we needed to always make sure that we were figuring out the fastest path um, and getting on that path as quickly as possible rather than losing time getting on that path, which is where I think we occasionally did lose time. Um. On that theme of uh, partnering with patients, I think you know there's a, a 
later in the day, we're going to be talking a lot more about that. And I think we're bringing out this theme both in um, identifying patients for, to start the work uh, to identify the mechanisms and then ultimately to test our therapeutic um, strategies in patients. And of course, the regulators who will also be here later today, I think, is an important component of our um, ecosystem. So it's uh, very valuable points. I wanted to come back to um, Dr. Engel's talk um, a little bit. And, um, you know, it's interesting to note how when you started out your work, maybe the tools were more like in situ, for example, you know, to try to sort of figure out which genes are expressed where in the mouse tissue. But then, you know, you showed the beautiful work about single cell and, you know, uh, the trajectories that allow you to now maybe more comprehensively map, you know, how things work in that part of the brain. And so I'm thinking as we kind of build on these technologies where we can kind of use more scalable tools to accelerate our research, do you foresee that in any way helping accelerate some of our mechanistic understanding, which of course will always require the mouse and going back and doing all this mechanistic work. And perhaps that also applies to your work in terms of, you know, the assays that you showed us, you know, in terms of being able to show the shifting in the binding um, to hemoglobin, you know, can it be accelerated with modern tools? Is that something that you took advantage of to screen all these, you know, thousands of molecules that you generated? I'm just curious about your experience throughout your, you know, your careers and, and your projects as to whether, you know, um, Change, changes in scale mattered at all in the progress that was being made um, in the project? Well, for us, absolutely. And that's, I think that's where each of us as experts on some very rare cell type or some very rare disorder contribute because obviously all of our genomic data, our single cell data, our epigenetic data goes into open databases. And so next time we and others don't have to regenerate those data. Of course, you have to trust the data. You have to. There's always this question of the quality of the data you're looking at, and that's always a little concerning. So, doing that in a standardized fashion, making sure that people provide um, the uh, their full pipelines and provide all the information needed to reinterpret the data, will make things go much faster. Um, and then each of us contributing our part to make the whole. I mean, the uh, the Broad and other places have done incredible jobs of doing this for common tissues, common common, more common cell types, but then all of us have to come in and fill in all the gaps and the holes so that we have a, a, a full compendium, which I think will happen. And that will obviously make things go much faster. Could there be, I mean, and the work that you're, one last question, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the work that you're doing, could there ever be application for people who don't have a genetic basis to a facial paralysis or other issues that I'm wondering, there are many people, many, many, many people who have those issues, but they may not be genetic. Right. right. So we've thought about that a lot. There's a lot of common forms of acquired facial weakness as well as congenital uh, or earlier onset you know, neonatal facial weakness. Um, and so we've done quite a, we've done, we've done some pilot experiments looking at whether or not some of the critical guidance factors are conserved between mm -hmm. development and adulthood. And of course, that's a big question. These are uh, to, to treat. To, to try and, and treat these disorders using our developmental data suggests that pathways are reused mm -hmm. and think about the differences in the distance things are traveling and the bony formations and where they're going. And I, I, I'm one to be a little skeptical about it, but we, mm -hmm. we have absolutely looked at that. We also look at this with ALS because these are the, for the, we do a huge amount of ocular work and, you know, for individuals with ALS, the last motor neuron cell types to die are those that, that move the eyes. And so we've worked a lot with ALS groups to ask, what protects those motor neurons? What data yeah. do we have that may provide insights that we can just give to these people to mine to help us understand more common rare disorders too? So yeah. um, that may or may not be genetic. Got it. I, mean, I will tell you that one of the things that we're actually thinking about is using these molecules that we make to treat patients who are hypoxemic. Yeah. Because yeah. if you think about what we do in the hospital, we intubate patients and what we're doing is we're trying to we're push saying. oxygen in. But if you could make hemoglobin have a higher affinity for oxygen, you could, in theory, pull more oxygen in. Now, this is a little bit of an advertisement in my role <laughs> as chairman of bio. The Inflation Reduction Act has basically told Pfizer, don't do that, because they have a lot of protection around these molecules as long as they stay in sickle cell disease. But if they go after another indication, they'll lose all the protections that they've got. So I think it'd be very unlikely that Pfizer would pursue uh, this, even though GBT was actually pursuing it, we were pursuing whether or not we could get people off intubation uh, using these molecules. And some of the early data was very encouraging. 
actually. So I would call that the law of unintended consequences. Yeah. But uh, there are a lot of them. We'll see how that like develops. Yeah. Uh, any? I was just going to say, Elizabeth, you you know identified the CRE element that was regulating, and you know part of the benefit of that is you had a number of families with linkage to narrow down in that locus, and then multiple families with point mutations to really help identify, but. All of us believe that there's a lot of non-coding cause of disease that we are unable to identify easily. Do you have strategies to look for, you know, enhancers and silencer regulatory elements that don't require both linkage and a lot of families because we deal with such rare diseases? Yeah, so we were, we we are approaching that in the lab. Um, talk about advocacy. You know, there was a. Um, a lot of us have genomes through the Gabriella Miller program, which was a little girl who passed away from a. A brain tumor um, and advocated Congress for funds to study rare genetic disorders and, and cancer and the overlap. Um, and that's has gone back and back to Congress and gotten more and more money. So, so we have a lot of genomes through that program. Um, and so what we have done is used a tax seek of specific, again, going into these cranial motor neurons at very specific ages, defining open um, CREs. And, um, and looking at histone modifications and things like that, and then looking at our genomes and mapping them back in and figuring out what variants fall within potentially meaningful CREs at the right age, at the right cell type. And it's been a slog. Um, it's been really interesting. Have we found new coding or non-coding variants for disease doing that? We have a lot of candidates, but again, our ends are low every time. So you come back to the same problem. Then you have to take these two families or these two de novo changes and model them. And so that's where, that's where it slows down again. So we're at the state where we have all these great candidates having done it that way, but we still don't know if any of them are truly pathogenic. That's actually an interesting bottleneck that I think we will be discussing in the next session as well about how do we work through some of this, you know, what is the variant doing? How can we quickly run through multiple right. candidate variants to come to answers? And there are no easy answers, but I think we have a lot of um, uh, discussions that will follow today. So I think um, I want to thank you both very much uh, for your excellent uh, keynote lectures and to thank the audience for their engagement and their questions. And uh, we'll take a short break. Um, I will ask the speakers for the next session to please come up to work with our AV team to get um, ready for the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am uh, Paul Blaney, faculty member here at the Broad and MIT, and it's my pleasure to moderate the Biology at Scale session uh, that we're entering in now. Biology at Scale is a topic that's important to me, and so I've been looking forward to this, and we've got a really wonderful uh, set of speakers uh, for everyone. Uh, the first is Sumaya Iqbal, who's going to present on in silico assessment of drug ability of target uh, disease pairs. Sumaya is a group leader of the Bioinformatics and Computational Biology Group within CDOT, the Center for uh, Development of Therapeutics here at the Broad. She's a computer scientist by training, uh, but a life science researcher by determination. She uses data science and machine learning to bridge genetics, proteomics, and therapeutics. The focus of her group is twofold, to develop AI-driven innovative technology for small molecule hit identification using data uh, from DNA encoded library screening, and drug target analysis by rationalizing functional consequences of genetic variants on protein structure and function. Sumaya joined the Broad in 2017 as a postdoc while conducting her research at the Analytic and Translational Genetics Unit of Mass General and HMS. During her postdoctoral research in Mark Daly's group, she developed a statistical method for protein function specific interpretation of genetic variants of 1,300, more than 1,300 Mendelian <laughs> disease genes. Following this work, she developed the Genomics to Proteins pro Portal, a discovery tool for linking genetic screening outputs to protein sequence and structure for the full human proteome. Uh, so with that, I'll welcome Sumaya to the front, uh, uh, and we'll uh, enjoy her talk. So I wanted to point out something on my title slide that the word rare was dropped off somehow from the program um, printout, but um, we, I will be talking about rare disease and rare coding mutation. And I wanted to ask everyone that, is everybody ready for something different? Because I will be showing protein structures, which we talk very less about, but protein structures are beautiful and they are important for biology. 
All right, so that, that is why the rare is underlined. There is no other reason because it got dropped off. <laughs> All right, so uh, given this audience, I'll be rushing over the background. But before I dive in, let me thank Paul for that very long and kind of introduction and for the organizers for having me here today. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So rare diseases impact less than 200,000 people in the US, but collectively they are common. And uh, in, as opposed to non-genetic inheritance diseases, rare genetic disease is caused by mutations affecting genes. And when we are talking about monogenic and rare single gene diseases, they are caused by mutation in a single gene. And one key difference between common polygenic disease and rare monogenic disease is the mutation that is responsible for rare disease usually has a profoundly big effect size. And that mutation can be also of different types. A nonsense mutation causing complete protein loss, a friendship mutation leading to aberrant protein, or a missense mutation leading to a single amino acid change. And in the context of rare disease and missense mutation, this is a case that we often see. Assume we have five individuals with five different mutations in a single gene causing a specific rare disease. When we map these mutations onto protein structures, then they kind of cluster in one particular region of the protein, skipping the other parts. This is the case of DDX6 gene causing neurodevelopmental disorders, but we also see this case for many other rare diseases and targets, such as UMOD and rare kidney disease, Mark II Shakomari tooth, protocadherin and epilepsy, and in fact, for some targets like GABA receptor, mutations leading to distinct phenotypic severity co-localizes in distinct part of the protein structure. So we can hypothesize that that particular region of the protein is important for the function that is affected by those mutations. And that is exactly the case here because I had the opportunity to work in this project. And when I was studying this mutation on protein structures, what we found is that groove where all the mutations are is the RNA binding groove of this RNA helicase. And RNA dice regulation is associated with the disease mechanism here. So at this point, I wanted to ask a question to all the audience. Has anyone here tried to map a genetic mutation on proteins and protein structure and wanted to understand the effect, the molecular effect, and found that it's not really straightforward to do that? And there are varieties of reasons. Yes. Yeah, I saw many hands. Great. And I found that too. And the reasons are multifold because protein structures can have gaps and protein structures cover fractions of proteins, and there is no easy tool to do that. So I'll keep that question here on the table, and we'll come back to that, to, to that same question. But we can undoubtedly make the case that characterizing and modeling rare disease mutations using protein structure is a scalable way to hint at the molecular effect of the mutation. And this also has many applications that would fall un under the umbrella of biology at scale problems, such as rare missense variant characterization and classification, grouping genes and disease based on shared molecular effect, and in silico assessment of therapeutic relevance of target disease pair. And in next couple of minutes, I'm going to show you how I and my group have been thinking of making a contribution in each of these fields. So let's begin with rare variant classification. So the problem is well known to this community. About 50% of all genetic mutation in the protein coding genome is missense mutation, and of that 80% is variance of uncertain significance, meaning that we cannot conclusively determine whether these variants are benign or pathogenic. And that problem is also significant for missense mutation. We hypothesize that by integrating genomics with structural biology, which is again not easy to do that, we can interpret missense mutation using structural biology features. Before diving into this problem, we of course checked the current guidelines and we found the importance of a mutation being present in protein domain, which is, rightly, which is right to do. But we also found out that about 30% of clean var pathogenic mutations 
do not located in any protein domain. So there must be other characteristic structural features that we were missing and we are not using currently for variant interpretation. So we attempted to characterize rare missense variants using a comprehensive set of structural biology features, not including protein domain only, but also using protein-protein interaction and post-translational modifications, which are important regulator of protein function. And what we found is it is certain type of protein-protein interaction and post-translational modifications that had the highest enrichment of clean bar pathogenic missense mutations compared to the nomad mutations. And we performed this study before alpha fold era, so we performed this study only on experimental structures. But I want to stress that the value of this study was not to only classify a variant, but in, to be able to interpret those classification using a biologically interpretable features. For example, this particular mutation, cysteine 287 to arginine in UMAR gene, has been listed as variants of uncertain significance in clean bar. And when we map this mutation onto structure and investigate it, it shows that it's going to break an intramolecular disulfide bond, which has a higher probability of leading to a misfolded protein. So we want to be able to interpret using biological features, not only classify the variants. A very nice, uh, okay, no, one more slide before the segue. Uh, and then post in the post-alpha fold era, using both alpha fold structure and experimental structure, we performed two other large scale study where we showed the value of using structural biology in variant interpretation. One was on 242 neurodevelopmental disorder genes, and another was 34 amyotrophic lateral sclerosis genes. And the second application, we are collecting this massive set of important proteomic features per variance. What we can ask out of this is, are there shared pattern of protein features across gene variants that will allow us to pick another target of shared molecular mechanism. So here what you can see is a clustering of 33,000 rare pathogenic variants. And to make a case, I'm going to draw your attention to that particular cluster here where one of the interesting gene is present, and that is UMOD associated with rare kidney disease. And looking at this cluster, we also found LAM2 variants causing another kidney disease. And when we look back into the molecular effect, all these variants from LAM2 and also UMOD affect the intramolecular disulfide bond leading to misfolded protein. So Silky from my group is going to be presenting a poster, more details on it, uh, feel free to check that out. Last application. By integrating genomics and structural biology, we also can perform therapeutic relevance of a target disease pair in silico. And that is, I like to say, as a scalable discovery and de-risking step before drug discovery. So targets come in thousands, but thousands of targets cannot be pursued therapeutically, but they can all be assessed in silico for their drugability using multiple line of evidence connecting genetics to phenotypic data to structural and functional data. How can we do that? Essentially by performing a survey. A survey that is going to answer a couple of important questions for every target disease pair, such as, is this gene reportedly the genetic cause of this disease? Where are the mutations? What is the disease inheritance, et cetera? And on the protein structure and functional side, we can ask whether these genetic mutations pinpoint to a mutational hotspot, whether the mutational hotspots pinpoint to a functional hotspot, where are the druggable pockets? Where are the protein-protein interactions? Can we obtain selectivity against paralogs? Where are the gain of function and loss of function sites that we can use to develop our assay, and et cetera? And these are very standard set of questions that we want to answer before every drug discovery project. And the results are also available, or at least computable using efficient tools. But what we need to do is we need to take that data that are aggregated in varieties of databases, connect them to connect genetic cause with molecular effect, and we can put this together 
into a data report or a data-driven survey report to inform the therapeutic relevance and prioritize target rare disease pair for drug discovery. And this, I think, is particularly important for rare diseases because rare disease mutation will have a profound impact on protein structure function relationship. Let's see now what we can achieve out of this survey for an example, Mark II Shakomori tooth. Mark II mutation is genetically established as the cause for Shakomori tooth disease type 2Z. And when we take those mutations onto protein structure, we can clearly see a mutational hotspots in the dimeric interface of two copies of the protein. And that mutational hotspots pinpoint to a functional effect, and that is it is structurally coupled with the ATP binding region, which is the important catalytic function of this ATPase. And by running tools, we can also identify the protein-protein interactions and the druggable pockets that we can target. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to showcase the other line of evidences on the selectivity and gain of function, loss of function sites, but we can put together these results as a survey report and make it accessible to the community for every rare disease and um, target pair. But probably you have noticed that each of these applications that I was showcasing require an efficient integrative tool for linking genomics with structural biology. So bringing back to, coming back to that question, and it's not easy to do that because it requires transferring of data from genomic space to the correct transcript and then to the correct protein sequence and structure. And to seamlessly do that, we have developed this tool called Genomics to Proteins Portal. Right. And using this tool, so far we have mapped over 18 million variants from all human uh, protein coding genome to their correct protein sequence and structure space. But I want to highlight that the value of this tool is not only aggregating data from multiple databases and connecting, but the value comes from the fact that you can upload your own set of mutations here and, connect, and can connect them to the protein structure. And in the same way, a structural biologist can come to that tool and can upload their own structure and, to be able, and will be able to connect it to the genomics. And this tool is interactive, accurate, and fast. So feel free to explore that tool and report us for any bug. That's very helpful. <laughs> and it is also important to realize that this tool does not allow you to do variation mapping only or mutation mapping only but it also aggregates that vast set of protein functional and structural features that I was just pinpointing and allow you to map that onto the protein structures too. And that includes continuous data such as mutagenesis scores and also discrete data such as protein domain or post-translational modifications. So what we hope to do with this tool is to develop a bridge between biologist, molecular biologist, and geneticist to the structural biologist community. And Jordan Safer from group is going to be presenting this tool as a poster in the evening. So please stop by if you want to learn more. So the feature direction of the group in the rare disease field of research is to continue building data tools and methods using bioinformatics and machine learning to accelerate the field of research. And what we hope to do is to interpret every variance using biologically interpretable features, group every rare disease genes based on their shared molecular effect, and do the therapeutic relevance assessment for every rare disease target pair and make it accessible to the community. So with that, um, a huge shout out to my group, which is a group of computer scientists, structural biologists, um, computational biologists, and protein bioinformaticians. Uh, in the Center for Development of Therapeutics. We already do um, collaborate with some fantastic experimental scientists, but we always look out for more. Uh, I, I really do believe that when computer scientists and experimental scientists will work hand in hand, we can solve many problems in biology faster and efficient. Thanks to a very special friend, Vanush Hajian, who is the science illustrator for the Genomics to Proteins portal. Thanks to my advisors who have shaped my thoughts at every step of the way. Big thanks to my funders, 
and feel free to explore the tool and give us feedback. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sumaya. We're going to do questions at the end of the session again. Uh, so uh, uh, hang on to those questions. And I believe we'll also be able to take uh, questions from online for those of you listening from afar. Next up, uh, we have Matt Brown. Uh, so I'll invite Matt up. He's going to speak to us about multiplexed imaging for subcellular interrogation of rare kidney disease. Uh, Matt is a KOH KOO postdoctoral associate in Ana Greca's uh, group, where he utilizes this multiplexed imaging to understand kidney disease biology. He obtained a BS in biomedical engineering from Wayne State University, where he was honored with the Robert G. Wingerter Award as the top graduating senior. He was uh, subsequently pursuing a PhD in physiology and biomedical engineering at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine, where he studied the epigenetic mechanisms of pancreatic beta cell failure in uh, T2D. During his PhD, uh, Matt was recognized for his excellence in research and service uh, by the American Physiological Society, the American Diabetes Associated, and the Biomedical Engineering Society. Since joining the Broad, uh, he's also been awarded a Broad Ignite grant to pursue work uh, on uh, this uh, multiplexed imaging application, which we're about to hear more about. So thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Paul, for the kind introduction, and thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to share some of my work today on uh, multiplex imaging for subcellular interrogation over kidney diseases. Um, so as many of you uh, are well aware, uh, Conventional cell and tissue imaging permits us to monitor between two and six uh, proteins uh, at a single time, uh, simultaneously extracting thousands of subcellular features to really understand uh, a cell state. Um, however, disease biology is often more complex and heterogeneous and sometimes can't be summarized by only a few markers. Uh, because of this, uh, there's been quite a push uh, to develop multicellular or multiplex cell and tissue uh, based imaging. Uh, techniques to monitor large numbers of proteins uh, in single cells. Um, there's been developments using fluorophore-labeled uh, techniques as well as DNA-labeled uh, techniques in recent years uh, to try to bridge this gap, essentially using a combination of cyclical staining um, and imaging-based approaches. We're now able to monitor dozens up to hundreds of proteins in a single sample, extracting tens of thousands of subcellular features. And these rich uh, morphological data sets uh, can really empower us to really get a deeper understanding of the biology when performing high content screening and target specificity testing, uh, multimodal genetic function and perturbation assays, uh, biomarker discovery and validation, um, and mechanistic disease biology. So today, I wanted to tell you about a brief anecdote about how we can use multiplex imaging to really empower us to get a deeper understanding of mechanistic disease biology in the context of a rare kidney disease. So Mukwin kidney disease um, is caused by uh, mutations in the mucin-1 gene, uh, namely an insertion of a cytosine into a uh, VNTR subunit that leads to an early stop codon and a truncated uh, protein. Expression of this frame-shifted protein uh, leads to tubular cell dilation and eventually progression uh, to kidney disease. <clears throat> uh, mechanistically, our group has uh, previously shown uh, that the frame-shifted protein is trapped early in the secretory pathway um, in compartments such as the endoplasmic reticulum, the cis Golgi, um, and in COP1 vesicles, um, instead of being trafficked to the later secretory pathway in endosomal and lysosomal part compartments uh, where it would normally be degraded. However, the link between our histological findings and this mechanistic, uh, basically, etiology of the disease um, is really largely unstudied and unknown. So to try to accomplish and kind of take a deeper look at this uh, connection, uh, we utilized a multiplex imaging-based approach of kidney and secretory cell markers um, in uh, kidneys expressing either wild type or the frame shift to uh, Mach1 protein. We used a combination of image registration, cell segmentation, and feature extraction algorithms to quantitatively kind of characterize this multiplex data set. And then we used downstream analyses tool borrowed from single cell transcriptomics analysis, as well as uh, integrated this with a, basically a paired single cell RNA-seq data set uh, to integrate this imaging data set with a transcriptomic signature. Um, so from 
basically this analysis, we were able to uh, segment uh, and isolate over a, a million uh, individual kidney cells and extract more than 4,000 features from both wild type and uh, kidneys expressing both wild type and frame shifted MUC1. Um, using unbiased clustering, we were able to identify the core uh, kidney cell types uh, making up the kidney's functional unit uh, called the nephron, including proximal tubule cells, collecting duct, and distal tubule cells. As a quick example, we can uh, look at SGLT2 protein, uh, protein expression, which is a canonical uh, proximal tubule marker, and we can see that its expression is restricted uh, to the kidney's cortex, or this outer region, uh, where the proximal tubules, uh, early proximal tubule resides. Similarly, uh, we can look at aqua aqua and two expression, uh, which is a canonical collecting duct marker, and we can see that it's uh, restricted to the intermedullary region of um, where, again, collecting ducts reside. When we look at basically these clusters embedded onto the kidney, again, we can, we can uh, kind of appreciate this clear zonation of the cell types throughout the kidney, where we see kind of these unique, these unique clusters in the cortex on the uh, periphery of the kidney, on the outer medullary region, and on the intermedullary region region, really highlighting the robustness of our multiplex uh, approach in identifying um, and segmenting the different parts of the nephron um, that potentially could be uh, relevant to our disease biology. So uh, kind of taking a zoom, zooming back onto uh, MUC1 expression, when we look at MUC1 uh, wild type protein, uh, we can see that its expression um, is fairly restricted to this intermedullary region um, and the distal nephron, including the thick ascending limb, the distal tubule, and the collecting duct. But what's interesting, uh, when we look at the frame shift protein, uh, we observe a more heterogeneous expression of the protein with expression in the distal nephron, but also expression um, in earlier proximal tubule segments as well. So what was really interesting to us when we uh, basically projected this expression and onto, our, onto our UMAP was we saw this very high heterogeneity um, in this late segment of the proximal tubule. So we wondered whether uh, which uh, secretory path, uh, pathway features could explain this high heterogeneity in expression. And what was really interesting for us, uh, we observed that uh, basically the feature that could best ex explain this high heterogeneity was colocalization between MUC1FS um, and the COP1 vesicle, which is basically required for trafficking uh, misfolded protein from the Golgi back to the ER for refolding. And this is where we think MUC1FS um, is getting trapped. Conversely, uh, when we looked at the collecting duct, which also has a broad expression of the frame shifted protein, we see that the feature that would best ex uh, describe this uh, variability was colocalization between MUC1 uh, frame shift and the early endosome, suggesting that essentially we think that potentially MUC1 FS is actively being produced and then subsequently degraded in this segment and may be uh, less vulnerable uh, to its accumulation. When we take a broad look at the different parts of the nephron, um, we can see that colocalization between MUC1 FS. Um, and, and in COP1 vesicles is most important in this third segment of the proximal tubule, suggesting that this may be the area of, of injury. And you can see on histology that indeed we see this uh, clear dilation in this outer medulla section where, we, uh, where these uh, S3 proximal tubule cells are found. So we next wondered whether the morphological state of the S3 segments uh, basically secretory pathway could maybe explain these differences um, and, uh, in uh, phenotype. So we uh, clustered differentially uh, differential secretory pathway features across the nephron. Um, and when we zoomed in on, the, on this S3 segment of the proximal tubule, we were really interested uh, when we found that we saw increased levels of ER, a higher COP2 texture, suggesting these cells basically have a higher capacity to produce and traffic proteins. But what was really interesting was that when we looked at endosomal area, uh, had comparatively, it was comparatively lower in this S3 segment, suggesting that, that these cells are able to produce lots of, lots of protein, but they ha don't have the ability as well to degrade that protein, making them more vulnerable to ectopic expression of a frame shifter or misfolded protein. So this kind of gave us an idea that these cells may be the site of injury. So we wanted to next uh, go back to our single cell uh, transcriptomic data and see whether basically can we see a, a kidney cell injury phenotype um, in this subpopulation of cells. 
So in order to do this, uh, we used an iterative co-embedding technique uh, to integrate our multiplex imaging data with a single cell RNA-seq data set from both wild type and Mach 1 expressing, uh, frameship Mach 1 expressing kidneys. Uh, we can do this using shared feature matching, which essentially allows us to match uh, cells from our uh, transcriptomic data to our imaging data to integrate these two data sets together. And what was really exciting when we looked at our, uh, this subpopulation of proximal tubule cells, uh, where we see this dilation, was that when we, uh, when we looked at uh, kidney cell stress and dedifferentiation markers, a number of them, including the marker ID1, was significantly upregulated in this, in this segment, suggesting that indeed these cells may be the site of kidney injury in Mach 1 kidney disease. And this is consistent with both our uh, morphological data as well as, uh, as well as the histological data you see here. So kind of to conclude and kind of like high level picture, we can use multiplex imaging to simultaneously detect multiple pro proteins in single cells. Uh, the frameshift protein uh, is heterogeneously expressed throughout the kidney and accumulates in the early secretory pathway in a small population of S3 proximal tubule cells. And by integrating multiplex imaging with single cell RNA sequencing, we can reveal that these cells are dedifferentiated and under stress um, and maybe the site of kidney injury in Mach 1 kidney disease. So I just wanted to thank uh, the Greca Lab, my mentor, uh, Anna Greca. Uh, also want to uh, give a, a shout out to Keith Keller and Jason Zavris for their tremendous work on this, uh, tremendous work on this project, as well as our advisors uh, in the group, and, and well as the whole lab, and then our funding sources. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. So we'll welcome up next, Ralda Nim. Thank you. And um, she's going to speak to us today about neurobiological insights uh, from human cellular models. Now, uh, Ralda is a principal investigator in the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Disease Research here at the Broad, uh, where she also directs the stem cell program. Her research is focused on the genetic, cellular, and molecular mechanisms underlying neurodevelopmental and psychiatric diseases. The Name Lab uses human stem cell-based models, genome editing technologies, and image-based electrophysiological and genetics approaches to examine cellular phenotypes linked to human genetic variation. That just sounds like all the things. <laughs> <laughs> through, a collective, through a large collaborative effort, they've established a key resource of human pluripotent stem cells and genetic data from hundreds of donors aimed at expanding the scalability of experimental systems and understanding how specific genetic variants influence cellular phenotypes. Rald has received recognition and funding from uh, many different groups, including the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative, the Maternal and Child Health Research Initiative at Stanford University, and the NIMH. With that, Rald. Thank you, Paul. So it's really uh, my pleasure to be here today and have the opportunity to share insights from our, our work on cellular models, as um, Paul just mentioned. So many human genetic diseases, uh, be it complex or rare disorders, um, are complex and heterogeneous. And so this is true at both the clinical levels and also at the genetic level. And we really want to understand um, what is going on at the cellular level. Um, so we specifically want to understand how human genetic variation acts upon cellular programs, cell behavior and function, but also how it shapes cell-to-cell -cell interaction. And in order to do that, we are leveraging human prepotent stem cell models to be able to examine such cellular phenotypes at many different levels, spanning from gene expression to chromatin accessibility and gene regulation, but also morphology and physiology. And we also are doing this in many different donor cell lines because um, human genetic backgrounds matter for a lot of diseases. And we also want to be able to capture the common and rare genetic variants that are um, harbored within these individuals. So we also study different cell types and we also examine the response of cells um, to perturbation of their biology via either genetic or pharmacological um, manipulations. So today I'm going to share some of the resources and tools that we've recently developed to enable these approaches. And I'll focus on two recent vignettes from our work on um, the 22Q11.2 deletion, which is a rare genetic variant associated with um, psychiatric disorders, but also our work on studying astrocyte and neuron interactions. 
Um, as Paul mentioned, um, during the last few years, we have established a large stem cell resource through a large collaborative effort at the Broad Institute here at the Stanley Center. And this resource currently consists of over um, 800 stem cell lines, induced prepotent stem cell lines, that are um, um, derived from um, unique donors. And, and not only are these lines deeply QC'd and banked, but also for each cell line, we generate 30x whole genome sequencing data, as well as um, genotyping or SNP array data. And we've also, over the last few years, um, have developed many um, or optimized different approaches to be able to differentiate human prepotent stem cells to many different cell types. And I'm showing here a few cell types that we use um, routinely in the lab, um, such as neuronal progenitor cells, neurons, and um, excitatory neurons and astrocytes, and the astrocytes being the latest cell type that we've recently um, developed um, and optimized to be able to um, scalably produce in collaboration with Lindsay Barrett's lab. Um, we have also developed precise and scalable cellular assays to be able to examine a large number of cell lines from different people. And so we can do that by either examining cells from each individual donor separately, so each, uh, each cell line in its own dish, but also with the collaboration with um, Steve McCarran Lab, we have developed what we call cell village experimental systems, whereby we can mix different cells from different donors all together in one dish, and then grow them together and score them for phenotypes all at once. And then we can use each um, person's unique genetic um, barcode as basically an endogenous barcode to then deconvolve um, the donor identity of each individual cell um, downstream. Um, however, in early iteration of such cell village systems, we could only mix together um, cell types that were very slow proliferative or post mitotic. If we attempted to mix together or make a, a large cell village of um, proliferative cells, such as stem cells, we uh, would notice that one or two cell lines would take over the, the um, cultures in a few passages. However, uh, more recently, and owing to the uh, work of many, uh, of a lot of people, but uh, particularly Matt Techmeyer, who's a fantastic grad student in the lab, we are now able to mix together um, cell lines from many different donors. We routinely mix together 40, 50 donors in one experiment, and we can do so even at the prolifer proliferative stage. So what we did is that we kind of, in addition, because we have deeply QC'd all the cell lines, that enabled us to exclude from our analysis cell lines that have acquired karyotypic abnormalities that might confer growth advantages. But also what Matt has observed is that with minimal physical manipulation, such as minimal passaging, then this really can help a lot to maintain a stable composition of donors in the village. So um, again, we can make a village of many different stem cell lines, differentiate them to neural progenitors or excitatory neurons, for example, all the while maintaining a stable representation of donors. And we can even freeze and thaw these um, villages, really the, lowering the bar for what it takes to um, scale up um, our experiments. We've also, uh, over the last few years, been able to use these resources to study genetic influences in cell morphology. So in collaboration with um, the uh, Carpenter Singh Lab and also the Richard Dury's lab, we've been able to um, establish cell painting in many different cell types from many different people. So for induced prepotent stem cells, but also neuronal progenitor cells, excitatory neurons, and astrocytes. We've even um, applied this approach to discover what we term cell morphological quantitative trait loci, whereby we've been able to link specific genetic variants, um, most commonly rare variants, we've been more successful in this um, space, with specific cellular features. And we've now expanded this approach to also um, perform morphological profiling in a cell village setting. And this is a collaboration with Sami Farhi's lab where we're using different tricks, for example, um, protein barcodes or procodes to label cells from each donor um, separately and then um, combine this approach with multiplex immunofluorescence. And so um, how are we using these tools in order to, to better understand the link between genetic variant and their effect on, on cellular phenotypes and, and disease? So I'll, I'll first speak about our work on the 22q11.2 deletion, which is actually the most common human chromosomal deletion. It occurs at a frequency of once in every um, 2,000 live births. And what's really kind of striking about this deletion is that how variable the phenotypes are, even though most people, you know, people carrying this deletion, they all are missing the same um, like base pair numbers, so which is typically three megabases. 
but their phenotypic manifestations are, are dramatically different. For example, individuals might be diagnosed with autism and ADHD and, and during childhood, and then separate patients are diagnosed with schizophrenia and mood disorders as, as adults, and they have also many other um, somatic <coughs> manifestations. So um, this really caught our interest, and we wondered how a stereotypic deletion could result in different diagnoses and different ages of onset in different people. And I want to highlight here that this deletion has been studied for many decades because of um, the, the prevalence and the, the impact um, on, on human health. However, and, uh, however, the efforts to map the neuropsychiatric phenotypes to a specific gene in the deleted region have failed, actually to identify a single gene, and, and a lot of the earlier approaches have used um, rodent models to ask these questions. So instead, we wanted to ask, how does the deletion um, affect gene expression and gene regulation in a more unbiased way during human neural development? And to do that, we assembled a cohort of individuals, either with or without the deletion. We generated induced prepotent stem cell lines from all of these people and then differentiated them into um, neuronal progenitor cells and astrocytes, but also at the same time, um, deleted the, this um, Q11.2 region on chromosome 22 using CRISPR-Cas9, perform an array of um, transcriptional profiling, proteomics, and, and functional um, uh, measurements to um, study the impact of the deletion on all of these cell types. And to make a long story short, what we found is that, not surprisingly, the genes that are deleted um, are reduced in their expression no matter what cell type we look at. However, the surprising finding was that Actually, many genes, many more genes outside of the region, region was, uh, were changed in their expression, and the identity of these genes was different depending on what cell type or cell um, stage we looked at. And then we went on and showed that actually in neuronal progenitor cells, the genes that are changed or that are regulated by this region are genes that are implicated in autism and intellectual disability. However, what, if we look at the more differentiated cell types at neurons, then these genes that are changed are um, synaptic genes that are uh, implicated in schizophrenia. And so now we're really um, focusing on understanding how the mechanism of how this deletion might regulate gene expression um, outside of the deleted interval. And this is a collaboration that we've um, set up with Elise Robinson and Ajay Nadig, um, uh, who's a grad student in, in Elise's lab. And um, by looking at um, chromatin accessibility and genome organization by ATAC-seq and hi -C, we've been able to detect a genome-wide impact of the deletion on, um, on these different levels of regulation. And um, because of time, I'll just come to the conclusion here that we've identified a non-canonical mechanism by, uh, via which this deletion impacts the genome, which we think may link variability in its um, genomic and phenotypic impacts. And um, hope to be able to tell you more about this next time. So moving on to our work on um, studying cell-cell interactions, and specifically what we're interested in is astrocyte and neuron interactions. So it's been known in, for a while uh, in the field that in order for neurons to properly mature and um, differentiate and also develop synapses, um, they needed to be in the presence of another cell type, which is the astrocytes that's uh, very prevalent in the brain. However, so we wanted to more deeply understand the cellular programs that are um, changed with, the, with this interaction and how these might be dysregulated in the context of disease. So we examined um, neurons and astrocytes that were either grown separately in monocultures or grown together in co-cultures. And we've examined cells from 80 different donors. And what we found was that when the two cell types are in physical contact with each other, we found that synaptic gene expression is increased in neurons and prosynaptic or cell adhesion gene expression is increased in the astrocyte cell type. However, the surprising result here was that we also found that cholesterol biosynthesis genes are suppressed in neurons and induced in astrocytes upon um, physical contact. And both programs, we found that they involve genes that are associated with schizophrenia or genes that are near loci that are, um, have been linked to schizophrenia, but also that are underexpressed in the prefrontal cortex of um, schizophrenia patients, which, uh, and I'll show this data in a moment. So here um, you can see that how, again, that was a surprising finding. So we dug a little bit more into these cholesterol biosynthesis genes, and we found that actually, indeed, many of them are located near loci that have been implicated by the genetic studies. 
And um, you know, as we were um, kind of coming to these conclusions from our work in vitro, we also uh, were very surprised to hear that work from the postmortem brain from Steve McCarroll's lab, led by Emmy Ling, the postdoc in Steve's lab, where they looked at um, RNA sequencing data from the prefrontal cortex of almost 200 brain, half of which have schizophrenia. What Steve and Emmy have observed is that the, the um, synaptic gene expression program in neurons seems to be highly correlated with cholesterol synthesis gene expression in astrocytes. So people who have more of um, synaptic gene expression in their neurons also have more cholesterol biosynthesis gene expression in astrocytes. However, both of these programs are jointly reduced in schizophrenia. And because of this, Steve and Emmy coined the term SNAP, or Synaptic Neuron Astrocyte Program. So this led us to conclude that astrocytes and neurons in vitro actually exhibit an interaction that's much like the Synaptic Neuron Astrocyte Program that has been identified in the human brain, and that key astrocyte-neuron interactions can be modeled in vitro and used to study the effects of perturbations on their biology. And this is exactly what we wanted to do next. So we assembled a, a village of 44 different donors, again, starting from one single cryovial of stem cells, and then differentiated these into neuronal progenitor cells, neurons, and astrocytes. And then we exposed these cells to a range of different treatments. And for the sake of time today, I'll focus on antipsychotic medication treatments. So what we found here is that the antipsychotic clozapine actually increases the expression of cholesterol um, synthesis genes. As you can see here, the genes highlighted in red. So the haloperidol is the other antipsychotic we examined. And so this effect was not only true for one single cell line, but as you can see here, all 44 cell lines that we've examined showed the same increase in the expression of cholesterol biosynthesis gene expression. And not only has gene expression increased, but also when we measured total cholesterol inside um, the cells and astrocytes, we saw an increase there. We also saw that there's more um, cholesterol in the supernatant that was um, exported, and also the uh, abundance of the apolipoproteins, APOE and APOJ or clustrin, will, were also increased. And we went on and looked at many different antipsychotic medications and at different um, doses that are all within the range of patient plasma concentrations, as you can see here. And we were able to reproduce this effect like very um, robustly. We see that clozapine regulates the cholesterol biosynthesis gene expression in a dose-dependent fashion. So uh, many here might not be familiar with this, but clozapine is actually an amazingly effective antipsychotic. It, it works really well at, at um, uh, treating symptoms of schizophrenia, unlike many others. However, it is often given as a last um, resource because it's associated with really severe um, uh, like side effects that are debilitating for the patient. So it's usually avoided unless there's an absolute um, kind of, it's, there's no other um, treatment that is working. But the, the superior efficacy of clozapine does not arise from dopamine receptor binding, and it has never been explained. So people don't know why it works better. So this led us to then wonder if some of the therapeutic benefits of clozapine could come from an off-target effect on cholesterol synthesis. And so to try to get to this question, we, um, we kind of took a deep dive in our co-culture data where the um, cells have been exposed to the um, different antipsychotic medications. And we performed latent factor analysis to try to see if we could identify coordinated responses to perturbations between astrocytes and neurons. And uh, this, um, with this latent factor analysis, we were able to identify two factors that were enriched in clozapine-treated samples. And Again, here we could confirm that upon clozapine treatment, we can see upregulation of cholesterol biosynthesis gene expression in astrocytes and correspondingly in neurons, we detected an upregulation of synaptic gene expression. So we are now trying to see if we can reproduce these responses in vivo in the mouse brain. And so this is a collaboration that we have with the labs of Morgan Chang and um, Jen Penn, who are also at the Stanley Center. 
So where do you want to go from this? Well, we want to really um, more deeply understand how clozapine regulates cholesterol biosynthesis gene expression. We also want to understand how the genes and alleles that are implicated in schizophrenia affect neuron astrocyte interaction, and in particular, the um, astrocyte to, nor to neuron cholesterol shuttle activity at synapses. And to get at this um, ongoing work is um, we're, we're, we're performing um, CRISPR screens to knock down cholesterol biosynthesis gene, uh, schizophrenia risk gene expression, and the synaptic neuron astrocyte program genes. And we're also um, building larger cellular villages to capture more um, of the genes and alleles that are implicated in these pathways. And with this, I want to thank um, people in my lab who did the work um, and wonderful collaborators that are highlighted here on the slides uh, at the Broad and, and beyond, and um, the donors and their families and our funding agencies. And I also thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ralda. All right, our last speaker in this wonderful uh, biology at scale session is Adit Radhakrishnan, uh, who's going to be speaking uh, to us about a mechanism of feature learning in neural networks. And you can even have the clicker. <laughs> uh, briefly, Adit recently completed his PhD in electrical engineering and computer science at MIT, at, uh, advised by the Broad's own Carolyn Euler and was a PhD fellow in the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center here at the Broad as well. Along with that honor, uh, he was also named a rising star in data science by the University of Chicago's Data Science Institute. His research focuses on advancing the theoretical foundations of machine learning and developing new methods to tackle biomedical problems. Adi. Thanks, Paul, for the introduction. I hope the mic is OK. Um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to discuss is actually our, I know it's a bit of a context switch for this uh, workshop, but it's uh, our work on understanding the mechanism of feature learning in neural networks. And really what I want to convey is how foundations of machine learning and advancing this part can lead to better methods in biomedical applications. And uh, in particular, I want to show how we can use this mechanism to really take advantage of large scale data sets generated here at the Broad. Um, and this is joint work with many collaborators at UCSD at MIT. So at UCSD, I have Daniel Partha and Misha Belkin. And at MIT, Kathy and my former advisor, Caroline Euler. So just to get started, uh, I wanted to give this motivating problem where understanding features is really important. And this is synthetic lethality screening. And the idea is if we take a data set, like the de dependency map generated here, um, we have this big matrix of all of these different cancer cell lines. And uh, the columns here are going to represent gene knockouts. And each entry of this matrix is basically telling me something about cellular viability. Does this knockout kill off this cancer cell line or not? And how I, how I want to use this matrix is basically I want to build some kind of predictive model which takes features of cancer cell lines, things like which genes are mutated or what's the gene expression, and then predict the cellular viability. But once I have this, what I want to know is, for any given knockout, what are actually the, the features that are most important for indicating low cellular viability? So which genes that are mutated um, in conjunction with this knockout will actually kill off this cell? And so uh, this is kind of a core question in machine learning, understanding which features are always most important from any model. And there's a couple of models for which this is really well known, things like random forests or linear regression. Um, but what I want to talk about today is how do we actually solve this problem for very powerful machine learning models that we use in practice, things like neural networks or kernel methods. And moreover, all of these previous methods, things like random forest, what they do is they try to understand features for a given knockout. Um, so they don't take advantage of the entire data set and then look at features for a specific one. They train on individual columns at a time. And I want to showcase how you can get around that by doing some clever tricks. So, if we want to figure out how to get this feature importance for a neural network, uh, I want to start by understanding what kind of features do neural networks actually learn and what is this mechanism. And so if I look at the literature today, I get this sort of vague definition of neural networks learning features as this change in the internal network representations through training. And really what people are talking about, if I take some standard computer vision problem, like I have these images of celebrities, I want to know whether they're wearing glasses or not. Uh, the features of my neural network are these intermediate layer vector representations. And what people are saying is that these representations are updated through training. 
Um, but of course, this is always going to happen because when I change, when I train my network, the weights change, these representation changes. Um, so what's the benefit of actually doing this? So there's a very simple experiment you can uh, run, and I'm, I'm a big fan of running just very simple basic experiments in machine learning to see what's going on. So what I'm going to do is actually take a two hidden layer, fully connected network, uh, and just train two copies. In the first one, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna train uh, in green all of the layers. I'm just training a network as usual. In the second one, what I'm going to do is I'm just not gonna train the first layer of my network and train all the other layers. And if I do this, what I'll see is that both my models actually perfectly fit the training data. I get 100% training accuracy. But the one where I trained all layers is around 10% better than the one at, at test time than the one where I didn't train the first layer. And this is really confusing. Uh, it's, it's unclear why this first layer is giving you 10% better results. But there's kind of a cool trick that we can do to just visualize why this is happening. So if I'm trying to see what are these features that are picked up by the first layer, well, I see that this weight matrix W1 is multiplying my input. So it's basically scaling and rotating my input in some way. And if I want to understand that, I can actually look at this matrix, which we call this neural feature matrix, which is just the weights transpose themselves. And for this problem of visualizing, uh, you know, predicting whether somebody has glasses or not, I'm just going to visualize this matrix. And so for this curve in red, uh, when I trained, I never updated this weight matrix W1. So if I look at it at initialization, it's going to look like random noise. And as I train, it's going to continue to look like random noise. Nothing is being updated. But for the curve in green, and again, this is classifying whether somebody has glasses, this image starts off as random noise. And as I train, you'll just start to see it looks like a little picture of glasses that appears. And so what this is showing you is that the neural network is literally in the first layer when it does way better. It's taking your image of a face, cutting out all of the pixels except for that little region where it thinks glasses are. And so here you can already kind of get a sense of the network is doing something pretty interesting for this problem. It's picking up data dependent features. And so the question is how is it doing this and how can we make use of this for synthetic lethality? And so if I was to take a step back um, and you, you know, pretend I don't know anything about neural networks and I want to understand for any predictor, how am I going to identify which features are important? Well, what I have is some input. I have a predictor and I have an output. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change in each input a little bit and then see how much the output changes. And so the features that would be important would be the ones where I change them a little bit, the output changes a whole lot. And so if I want to measure that, I can look at the change in output by change in input with respect to any feature. This is a derivative. So if I take my um, function f, what I actually care about for identifying important features is this object called the gradient, average gradient outer product. And this is basically, I take the gradient of my function with respect to the input um, and look at the magnitudes. That's basically what this is telling you. And so this has been around since the 1980s. This is like a well-studied statistical object. But it turns out this is exactly how neural networks learn features. Um, so this is exactly the mechanism at every single layer. This neural network is just computing this mathematical operation perturbing each of the inputs to that layer and seeing how the output changes. And so if I was to show this visually, if I have this deep fully connected network and I want to know what are the features at this first layer, W1, well it turns out the features are just, I take perturbations of X, see how the output changes and I get that. If I want to see how the features at the second layer evolve, I take the inputs to that layer, perturb them a little bit and see how the output changes and I can keep recursing this, and that's how I get all the features in my entire neural network. And so we formulated this as an ansatz, um, and we can actually prove it in some simple cases, but the empirical evidence is uh, pretty compelling, so I wanted to show an example. So uh, here's an example where I train a five hidden layer neural network to classify whether a celebrity image has rosy cheeks or not. And so what you'll see here is that of the five layers, I'm just visualizing these feature matrices, but in the first one, the matrix is too big, so I'm showing you the top eigenvectors. Basically, what is this direction that matters? And so at initialization, what you'll see is that these matrices all kind of look like a random matrix, but layers two through five are kind of like this diagonal matrix. After training, though, you'll see the first layer 
actually learns a prototypical face of what looks like rosy cheeks. Uh, the remaining layers all have some interesting structure. If I just compute this average gradient outer product, you'll see that the second and third columns just match almost exactly. So they're almost numerically the same. And so neural networks are actually learning features using some very simple mathematical principle. Um, but the best part is that once you know this principle, you can now use it with any machine learning model. And so the idea is that this average gradient outer product, this perturbation method that we use, you can use this with any function. So I can take any machine learning model, things like kernels, which could not learn features before, and then use this function to just have them learn features. And so this is an algorithm we made called the recursive feature machine. And just to walk through how this algorithm would work, if I'm given some training data, so again, if I'm trying to predict whether somebody has glasses, uh, what I do is I just pick a machine learning model, I train it on this data, I get some accuracy. Then what I do is I take this average gradient outer product of this predictor, and I get this feature matrix. So here for glasses, it's literally looking at the bridge of whether of someone's nose to see if there's glasses. And what I do is I apply this um, image as a filter, basically, on every one of my images. So I'm transforming it, and then I repeat this process. And if I do that for this specific problem, you'll see a massive jump in accuracy. And so what I wanted to show quickly is uh, any one of these powerful predictors, if you incorporate this mechanism, you'll see that they learn very similar sets of features. And just for these problems here, if I'm looking at glasses, if I do take a neural network and, and use this method, um, and I'm looking at this matrix uh, of features, you'll see that they focus on very similar things. If I look at the eigenvectors of that matrix, you'll see again like some prototypical face of somebody wearing glasses. Um, and one fun example I wanted to show is uh, detecting if someone's smiling. This was pretty terrifying to me, but you'll see uh, some weird, creepy, smiling face. And if you take the eigenvectors, you'll see like a face of somebody smiling. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that there's some universality of this mechanism, which is that you can take many different predictors, and you can actually see that they capture very similar sets of features. And so what I want to do now is return to this problem of synthetic lethality screening. And what I'm going to do to figure out which features are important for killing off a given um, um, cell line for when, when I hit it with a knockout, what I can do is I can just train a kernel to just take these features of each cancer cell line and the feature of a knockout, just a one hop, and predict what the viability is. So I train on all this available data. That's around 17 million data points that I'm training on. Then what I can do is I want to know what are the features for each knockout after taking advantage of the whole data set. So the best part is that while there's no machine learning model that can do this today, if you know how to select features with this average gradient outer product, you just compute this gradient outer product over the data points um, for a given knockout. And this gives you the features for that knockout. And so if you do this, uh, we had this, we found this list of experimentally verified SL pairs. And what I'm showing you here is a table comparing several different methods. The entries in the table are telling you, um, for let's say for SMARCA2, if I knock out SMARCA2, how many genes would I have to look through to find SMARCA4 as the corresponding uh, SL pair? You can see here like uh, the previous method, which is some version of random force with a lot of robustness. Um, it does quite well. It gets almost all of these in rank one. A standard linear method like Pearson correlation uh, this will also do quite well. It, it, it takes a hit on some of these paralog pairs. Um, our method just gets rank one on, on everything here. Um, and again, this is you've trained on everything and you're doing this uh, average gradient outer product for each knockout to find the important features. What I wanted to emphasize is that even though random forest is good, um, this is trained on each knockout separately. And this robustness check takes 45 minutes per knockout. So there's 17,000 knockouts, so unless you have some prior knowledge of which knockouts are good, you'll be there for like several years. Um, our method, on the other hand, takes 450 minutes for all 17,000 knockouts, and you get the feature, you get the, almost the same ranking without having to pay this computational cost. So what I wanted to emphasize in terms of takeaways is that um, here what we did is we identified this mathematical mechanism behind neural feature learning. Uh, we use this to incorporate feature learning into any ML model, 
And now, once you have this understanding, you can actually take advantage of these large-scale data sets and figure out features that are important for subpopulations. So for things like rare diseases, if you have a massive data set um, across many different diseases, you train on everything, compute the average gradient outer product, you get features for a specific disease. But what I wanted to emphasize here is that this type of analysis really shows that building these foundations of machine learning can really give you a way to build this next generation of ML models with improved performance and interpretability, which is what we want for biomedical applications. And with that, I wanted to share a link to the paper. And also, uh, we have a Jupyter notebook for code for how we use kernel um, RFMs. And I wanted to just emphasize neural network code is really complicated, uh, at least when I started out doing it. Um, we packaged this up nicely. So if you have a data set where you have x and y, this is literally the four lines you would need to train a model on x and y, and then get the features out. Um, so with that, uh, I wanted to conclude. So thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Adi. I want to invite all the speakers from the session up, and we'll do a Q&A. So wherever you like, folks, <laughs> any, any seat. And who's got our first question? Yes, Anna. This could be a question for all of you or any of you. Um, but you know, it's interesting, it's elegant how you all describe very different projects in different cell types or tissues or different disease areas. Um, but you know, there were some sort of common principles that arise and it, it, it's beginning to dawn on me that perhaps one of the most catalytic things that we can do is this idea of sharing these data sets that we're all generating in ways that others can then plug in with uh, things like the machine learning algorithms that you described, Adit. So I wanted to, you know, ask each of you to imagine what would be your kind of, uh, you know, your, your greatest wish or your best case scenario for how each of the things that you are working on could be uniquely enabled by, you know, uh, collaborating, opening up the data sets and finding um, colleagues who could do the compute on your data sets, for example, or for the computational person, what is your wish list of data sets that you would need? Because perhaps if we open this up and find ways in which we can share the data more, we can accelerate our progress. So on that theme eager to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I can, I can take that question. So what my wish list would be, I think we are doing good in data generation. What we need is to get out of our own field of study and talk to another person coming from another field of study, but not outside biology, but just Think about like genetics, proteomics, transcriptomics, how many omics we have. Coming out there, talk to another person and assume that the other person will really not understand all the details, but make an effort to make that person understand and think about how we can integrate so that we can establish that arc that we saw in our keynote. I think that would be the wish list that we should be able to get out in a seminar like that, talk to another person, think about how can we integrate to get, get from genetics to follow that curve and go to the drug discovery. Yeah. Um, just to add to that as well, I think like, uh, I, I think getting the end to end, like having multimodal data is, is super important. Um, but I think what's, what's really been uh, difficult, at least coming from a computational side, is um, uh, the standardization of data. That's present right yeah. now. So things like depth map, it's actually pretty easy for me to work with because it's one big, you know, data set just dumped as a matrix. And if I have like an X and a Y, I can go to town. I can do whatever I want. Um, but I think having to look across many different things, like if I wanted to take C map and depth map, that's a whole hassle of like I have to pre-process so many things in a systematic way to actually make sure my models can transfer to these data sets. Um, at least from the the transcriptomic side, I think that's that's been uh, quite the challenge. I know from the imaging side that uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's a whole other story. So um, I know there's like batch effects, things like this that we have to handle. So uh, I think that that 
it, there's tools to address it now, but um, those are still emerging, I think, to, to make it pretty easy. Any other comments on this topic? I would just add that, just to add that standardization of tools, especially among emerging areas. Um, and uh, protocols can really, I think, empower and move things along faster, especially like in the computational space with Im large imaging-based data sets. Um, working together, I think, can really push that faster. Hello. Um, I have a very similar question. Um, and I'm also a patient with a rare disease. So I have like skin, bones, viscera, all in the game. Um, and I also happen to be the uh, uh, product manager for the Teradata repo. And so we've discussed a lot about like what, are, what is minimum like what is the minimum set of metadata that would be useful? What's the minimum amount of harmonization that people could use to put their data into the Teradata repo, but not have that friction be so high that people don't want to use it? Um, and so what I wanted to ask this group is, how can people on my side, um, on the engineering side, partner better with biologists? Um, because one of the great difficulties that I find is that like I have basically like a high school genetics level of uh, comprehension of your talks, but that's enough to get the conversation started. But once we dive even very loosely into the space of biology, many engineers sort of shut down because they're not familiar with this space and there's so much depth and there's so much complexity. How do you think we can be better partners so that we can solve for these uh, bigger problems where we can develop protocols that work well for you know your imaging data, but also for like my data ingest needs? And can I just add before you, can you explain what Terra is? Because not everyone in the room may oh, know yeah. what that is. So Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm new to this department, so I apologize if this is not the spiel I'm supposed to be giving. Um, but the Terra platform is a cloud-based biomedical research platform whose goal is to sort of like bring the researchers to the data. So there are a large number of data sets. There's a wide number of computational tools. You can basically work in your environment of choice. Um, but it basically creates a level of abstraction so that you don't have to become a cloud engineer in order to do your research at scale. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a good point. How can we basically make the data and the resources more accessible to everyone, right? How can we, I mean, it, it's also a balance that we have to strike, right? Because if, if everybody's generating exactly the same data modality in the same format that becomes also very restrictive but i think just having maybe um kind of guidelines around what metadata is important without like too much metadata right that would require a, you know a lot of digging into um yeah and i think i mean again just coming back to the previous question with like um kind of crystallizing um kind of ways to better integrate the different data modalities and the features that are the, the most relevant as we all generate data types with many different cell types, mm -hmm. but also many different genetic variants or like these um, large knockout or knockdown screens. I mean, absolutely, yeah. And um, I'd like to add that, you know, the minimum information and metadata is going to be different for different subfields mm -hmm. within biology. It's gonna be different. The data standardization is gonna be different for genomic data, for imaging data, for transcriptomics data. I think it really needs like one-to-one -one conversation between a group of engineers and group of experts, data experts of that specific field and come with a minimum set of information and metadata that, that is required. And some, so there are some existing alliances just like variant effect alliance, for example. We put together, we, we came together from, varieties of expertise and then we have set up uh, minimum information that is required by, by anyone who wants to submit data set out of the multiplexed assays for variant effect identification. So it requires a one-on-one -on -one conversation and then coming together and it's going to be different. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have time for one more? Hi, uh, Alan Beggs. So I'm in Boston Children's Hospital in the genetics division, and so we think about, you know, patients as, as a whole organism. And I think one of the major problems we face, you know, we work, for example, with Heidi and with the Gregor Consortium identifying mutations and variants. Uh, so Maya, I really like your approach to try and uh, predict changes. Uh, but one of the big problems we have is the phenotyping. So we have a lot of clinical experts who really can look at a patient and come up with a lot of very fine details about how they look, what their onset was, what, and so on. But then we need to encode this in some way. And so there are 
ways. You know, one very crude method would be ICD-10 codes, which are billing codes. Um, and human phenotype ontology, or HPO, is something that we've used frequently. We've dabbled a little bit with NLP, natural language processing, to try and extract this, but it's really difficult. So I'm just curious to, to know what you guys see, you know, on a platform level and from a computer science perspective, how can we actually automate and improve this method? Yeah, I think this has uh, kind of been one of the biggest challenges. I yeah. mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't mean to throw the word around there, but like I know people are probably trying to use large language models for things like this. Um, and I think, but, but I guess this is, this is still quite a difficult task because of the amount of data that's available for training some of these models and the specificity of the type of data. Um, I think, honestly, even more than just the, the doctor notes or any of these or ICD codes, I think just having all of that multimodal data available on top of you know, imaging data or EKG or whatever is available, I think that is kind of the key to leveraging it. I'm not sure. I mean, eventually we may get to a point where you can streamline that whole process and make things better with artificial intelligence tools. But I think right now the tools are more suited for integrating a lot of multimodal data and making a better decision off of that. Um, so I think that's that's what I would. Right, and I would also like to add that, first of all, thank you for asking this question. There is literally an unmet need that, need that has to be done. And I think one initiative we can take actually from this partners with patients portal development initiative that there has to be a starting point. And the starting point is start doing it for one patient. It will become a thousand and then it will become a million. And we can, again, there will be a standardization requirement. So we will record that, OK, these particular sets of. But there has to be a standardization, and there has to be a start. And then it will grow. But this will happen. Thanks for bringing it. Important. OK, well, I want to thank this group again. And please join me in thanking all the speakers from the Biology at Scale session. In the interest of time, we'll move to the next session uh, expeditiously. <laughs> okay, I'll do my best to make this expeditious. <laughs> um, Simon said, I hope that your introduction is not too long. And I said, I do tend to speak quickly when I'm nervous, but I don't want to rush my introduction to Simon because, um, well, you'll see for yourself in a moment. But I had the great honor of meeting him for the first time last year when Alex Souza, a graduate student in our lab, pulled me in to help with grant writing a patient-partnered CZI proposal. And I remember he said, I can't wait for you to meet Simon and Nina. They're just like one-of-a-kind people. And I can't explain it, but you just have to meet them. And I honestly couldn't agree more. And even for a professional writer such as myself, I have had a hard time coming up with the right words to introduce Simon. Um, because, at least in my estimation, Simon is more than a savvy patient advocate or a trained economist. Um, he's more than the sum of his credentials, which of course I now have to tell you about. Um, <laughs> he has bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from Cambridge University in England, bachelor's degree in finance from the University of South Africa. He's the chief financial officer of Green Court Group. On, on the board of directors for various organizations from Global Genes to NIH's National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, and of course, Cure AHC and Hope for Annabelle, two charitable organizations dedicated to finding a cure for AHC, the rare disease with which his second daughter Annabelle was diagnosed. You can feel the butt. But beyond his many credentials and leadership positions, Simon is a true world citizen with a clear vision of what we can achieve so long as we coordinate our efforts and double down on building an integrated, scalable system to benefit as many rare disease patients as possible, which kind of echoes everything we've just been talking about. And we talk about the importance of collaborative approaches and integrative interdisciplinary thinking a lot in the sciences. And there's no one who understands the value of integrating knowledge across communities the way that Simon does. Because for him, it's more than academically motivated. For Simon, who can discuss financial risk and gap junctions and spreading depolarizations in the same breath, interdisciplinary thinking is a necessity. And collaboration between patients, clinicians, researchers, and regulators and biopharma is the only way forward. 
As you'll hear for yourself today, Simon's call to action is compelling and achievable. He reminds us that in the end, regardless of our own unique individual genotype, we are, all of us, hurtling through space on the same pale blue dot and it behooves us to work together to create a world in which every member can share in the gift of health and well-being. Please join me in welcoming Simon. All right, so um, Anahid has given me 20 minutes or so to decode the genome, so I'm gonna give, my, give him my best shot. Um, but Sarah, we, um, I am a layman, as Anahid mentioned. I run a company called Tiber Capital Group, my daughter has a disease called alternating hemiplegia of childhood. Tiber Capital Group, um, that company buys single-family homes. It renovates them, it leases them, aggregates and manages them. And I'm sure you're thinking at the moment, what the hell is this guy doing standing in front of me talking about biology? But my job at that company is really to try to understand commonalities of unique assets. And you know, everyone keeps telling me that single-family homes are unique assets and I, I keep failing to believe them, they all built with a similar blueprint, with similar materials, using similar methods. Very much like humans are built with similar blueprints and, and, and tools and methods. And um, you know, you and I and my daughter Annabelle are 99.6% genetically identical. I think you all know that. It's in the 0.4% that we find the interesting parts. It's in the 0.4% that we find rare diseases, and those rare diseases really give us the opportunity to look at a Rosetta Stone of, of identification of what drives the function and dysfunction amongst us. So rare diseases is really something that I, I have got into wholeheartedly over the last few years. I wear two hats in rare diseases. One is really trying to figure out what therapies we can produce for my daughter Annabelle, and the other is to try to understand what we can do a little bit better as a community to create platform approaches to creating therapies for as many children as possible. And I think those things intersect a lot. One of the things I want to talk about a little bit today is how clinical diagnosis is failing us as a society, but as rare disease community. So that was supposed to be that slide, but we'll skip that one. So that's my daughter, Annabelle. So Annabelle, I want to talk a little bit about her diagnosis and misdiagnosis. This is when she was two years old. So this is when she got diagnosed with alternating hemiplegia of childhood. But it took a long time for us to get diagnosed. It took two years, actually. Um, when she was two months old, she was misdiagnosed with epilepsy. And I don't know if any of you know this, but to get diagnosed with epilepsy, all you have to have is two, two seizures that are unexplained. Right, that's pretty low bar for clinical diagnosis. Now, um, ultimately, she got diagnosed by accident when one of our neurologists at Boston Children's, and we you know, traveled the country visiting different neurologists to try to figure out her disease. But he'd luckily been to a, a conference on alternating hemiplegia the week before and was able to match the, the clinical diagnostic criteria based on that. So she didn't have genetic testing up to that point. She got tested, and lo and behold, she had the gene, gene defect associated with the disease. ATP1A3 is the gene, and um, got diagnosed. Now, what strikes me is that our first line of defense in rare diseases is clinical diagnosis, which you know has been around since Hippocrates and two and a half thousand years old. And we haven't evolved to the things that Samaya and Adi were talking about which is really the tools that we have available to us today to be able to you know, diagnose patients much better and faster. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So these are the folks that I'm currently working with. And really, we all have a common mindset. Um, you'll see Broad is front, front and center here. Um, Anahita described all of the boards that I'm on, which are you know, not by accident. I think all of these folks have a common theory that we can do much better here by creating far better data sets, and we've talked a lot about that today, on um, helping us to really use the tools that we have available. And um, the, Broad in, the Broad Institute is, is really, I'm preaching to the Pope, I guess, um, in this room. 
So we've seen some of these data before, but I really want to highlight them again. Um, I put that question up at the top there for you to think about. But we know that rare diseases affect 30 million people in the United States, one in 10. We know the official number is 350 million worldwide, and that ratio doesn't work very well. It's essentially, you know, we're unable to diagnose these patients or keep them alive in the rest of the world, which is why that number is so different from one in 10. But I want to point you to 6.3 years. That's how long it takes to diagnose the average rare disease patient. And that's from symptom onset. That's not from when they're born. You know, we can do so much better here. It's, you know, if it takes 6.3 years to diagnose a patient clinically, we must be doing something wrong. We must be standing on our heads. Yet 80% of rare diseases are genetic. We have a targetable way to diagnose our patients and we're not using it. And I want to give a couple of examples. This is a paper from April. So this paper took 13,500 clinically undiagnosable patients and ran them through some relatively rudimentary tests, right? Whole exome sequencing, multiple regression analysis. And I can hear Adit laughing about that right now. You know, we, we took these rudimentary things and we, we managed to diagnose 41 percent of the patients in that study, 13,500 undiagnosable patients immediately, using those rudimentary tools. And another 21 percent had variants of uncertain significance in disease-associated parts of the genome. So we gave ourselves really good tools to be able to de develop therapeutics around that immediately. The next study is from last week, actually. So it's one week old. This is 400 patients rapid whole genome sequencing, it took 6.1 days on average to diagnose those patients. 49% of them were diagnosed virtually immediately. This is the last of my examples, but it's from my daughter's disease. And you know, going back to some Maya's structure, structure function discussions, on the right there, have, there are 12 clinically diagnosed diseases within this gene. ATP183. You can see the incidence rates. They're basically one in a million across the board. If, we, if I were to give this cheat sheet to an experienced neurologist, I'm not sure with these overlapping symptoms if they'd be able to identify a patient with one of these diseases, even if they knew it was one of these 12. So I'm not sure how they're supposed to diagnose clinically. But if you look at the left there, we've got the, the gene. It's only 3,039 base pairs long. You know, in terms of cDNA, but we have 220 disease-associated variants, mostly clustering around the transmembrane region, which is the white region over there, and the iron binding sites. This is also a, um, a sodium-potassium pump. So we have ways structurally to be able to identify what's very likely to be disease-associated. And we have spectrums of, of clinical issues associated with those clusterings too. And we were able to create cell lines using those particular mutations, identified from a cellular perspective what the issues were, and we found that those were various. We found, for instance, um, ER amalgamation of proteins, Golgi fragmentation, transporting issues, embedding in the protein issues, embedding in the membrane, and then also transport issue, um, sorry, cycle issues associated with the pump, so the pump not pumping fast enough. Now, all of these, we were able to identify a targetable method for developing therapies around. And we've now created, you know, we're on the path at least to gene editing, ASOs, AAV-mediated gene therapy, hypothesis-based um, drug um, screening and testing. And three of those are working currently. So we've got, you know, AAV-mediated gene therapy that's shown a rescue. We've got um, a knockout that's showing therapeutic effects and also a compensatory mechanism that's producing additional proteins within the cells. And we've got a hypothesis-based drug that is also showing a rescue um, in cells. But we wouldn't be able to do that without creating this type of approach using, as a baseline, genetic information. Now, we know what the burden of, of rare diseases is nationally. It's a billion dollars, a trillion dollars per year in the United States alone. 
And um, I just put up on the right there, that's more than the GDP of 90% of countries in the world. And that's per year. Now, whole genome sequencing costs less than $1,000 per patient routinely, obviously not including the analysis, but we have a lot of ana analysts in the room that would love to get their hands on those data. Um, we, just, we can't afford not to spend money on those type of data collection activities. What I'm working on with a bunch of folks, some in this room, is trying to figure out a way to gather, systematize, organize, and give access to databases that are usable. The most usable, I think we probably all agree, based on the discussions this morning, is whole genome sequencing. Now, if we're not doing it routinely, we should be. We should be as a society, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But we've got omics data we can layer on top of that. We've got persistent identification technology to be able to keep these data private but linked. We can layer on top phenotypic and clinical data. This is something we're doing at, at RareX and at, um, at Global Genes to be able to create that standardized phenotypic data to be able to link to the other uh, more objective data. But building these foundational data sets really needs to start with genetic data. And it's not just data that can be standardized and systematized. We've got these preclinical pre tools that every rare disease really needs to use to be able to get to the point of proof of concept. And all of these essentially can be standardized and systematized. And the same thing with therapies. I think Ted was talking a little bit earlier in his speech about how much it costs to produce a novel drug, you know, billions of dollars. These are really the only approaches that we can take as a rare disease community, at least for my daughter's um, genetic disease. But they work, they're proven therapies, and they cost very little to get to proof of concept. You know, mouse models are relatively inexpensive. Producing AAV vectors are relatively inexpensive. Whole genome sequencing is relatively inexpensive. It's really the toxicology, GMP manufacturing, clinical trials that are more expensive, but if we can reduce the burden, reduce the risk on pharmaceutical companies to start to take on these projects based on proof, proof of concept, I think we can really catalyze um, the production of, of therapies for our diseases. Pre-competitive proof of concept, it really is, you know, we get to the point where Pre-competitive proof of concept is, is something that is a, a natural monopoly. It's something that we can take as a community and produce you know, um, proof of concept stage therapies without spending a whole lot of money. We can help fund you know, folks like you who are doing this in your labs and do that on a much wider scale as long as we're systematizing and organizing, giving access to multiple diseases. This has massive, massive um, positive externalities for society. We've got um, 8,000 rare diseases on a mention this morning. They could all benefit from this. Only about 500 are getting attention of any kind. We have an ability to do much better than that using a relatively small amount of money. So I guess my wish list for us to take action is to gather these foundational data sets, to really centralize these data sets, use them as a community, create a platform approach to treating rare diseases in terms of databases, preclinical tools, research grade therapies, and really de risk therapies so that we can catalyze private therapeutic development. Turn that 6.3 years on average for a clinical diagnosis into 6.1 days that we've seen in the studies that I showed you. And you can do the math, I guess. Um, one in 10 people means that one of your family members are gonna be affected by a rare disease at some point in time. And I think you know, all of you in this room are, um, are already doing a, a lot for society, but you can do a lot for your family, you can do a lot for humanity by taking these data analyzing them, using them, and creating therapies. 
And for that, I, I thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Simon? You can feel free to come down as well. Or I can run the mic to you. Okay, I'll ask a question. <laughs> Unless you have, oh yeah, oh great. Another Simon. Yeah, um, I'm a, hi fellow Simon. <laughs> My name's Simon as well. Um, <laughs> So I guess my question is, um, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm fascinated by sort of approaching solutions to a lot of the big issues we face as a society and in this realm as well, by connecting people across different uh, domains of study, whether that's within biology, whether that's you know creating economic incentives to solve problems. How do you recommend a relatively young person like myself gets involved in this degree of sort of, um, I forgot the word, but sort of cross field work? That's my question. Yeah, thank you, Simon. First of all, you dress a heck of a lot more coolly than I do. So <laughs> nice to meet a much more cool Simon. Um, but yeah, how can you get more involved? And I've been asking myself that question yeah, for a couple of years now, how to be able to take the knowledge that I have to be able to advance rare diseases. One of the the approaches that I have taken um, has been to start talking with like-minded people and folks, especially in the biological realm. At the moment, for instance, I'm getting I'm working with GeneDx, Illumina, ACMG to try to figure out a way to create whole genome sequencing for as many rare disease patients as we can. Um, paid for centrally, um, nationally, and then also create the foundational database to be able to use that I talked about. That's one way. Um, I think you know, participating as an analyst in, in these data to be able to identify targetable therapeutics for as many um, rare diseases as possible, you know, cross-disease analysis on, on diseases that have similar pathways and mechanisms and um, you know, really thinking about the tools that we can use with the low-hanging fruit that's available to us on, on gathering data. I think those are the approaches that I've been trying to take. Hi, Simon, great talk. Uh, I cannot stress enough the importance of tackling rare genetic diseases. So um, I have a question. So like for some, say in someone in your family, has a rare genetic disease, which cannot be diagnosed by any of the hospitals in the country. And you'd go for the whole genome sequencing. So what are the available platforms or, or resources right now, like as a computational biologist, I can do, use to actually try to, you know, diagnose maybe or get a hint of what that person actually like is dealing with? Yeah, so I think, you know, understanding what the, disease effects are comes from essentially two sources from my experience at least and that's you know genetic information that drives those other pieces of information i described and then also phenotypic information but you know phenotyping i want to share a brief um, anecdote i had a parent call me a couple of days ago um, it was last week and she told me that her child had been diagnosed with ahc um, but he didn't have the you know, genetic defect that patients have in the ATP1A3 gene. He had every clinical diagnostic criterion necessary to diagnose him with that disease, but he, um, he had one uh, diagnostic criteria that was not included in those AHC diagnosis um, that was developmental delay, that he, he didn't have any developmental delay, but all of our patients have developmental delay. And it seemed relatively clear that this was, you know, from a clinical diagnosis, very similar to AHC, from a genetic diagnosis, not AHC, and he really didn't look like anybody else except for those qualifying criteria. So I would say, you know, it really is a, a broad set of analysis that needs to be done to be able to really understand a disease. Um, clinical diagnosis is one tool, but frankly, it's a 
an archaic rudimentary tool. <laughs> I know we're running late, but I want to ask one more question of you in particular, and I think for uh, patients and patient advocates who are here, I think this is an important question for us. So as we think about uh, collecting more data, and for all the reasons that you mentioned, um, another um, worry or another um, set of uh, concerns that people have is around privacy. Data privacy, this is a big topic, um, and you know, you represent your daughter and your family. And I think that there's many others who are either patients or advocates who have different views on this subject. So I was curious in all of your discussions, how do you deal with um, securing the data in ways that you know the patient can be protected appropriately, but also facilitating the advancement of, of research, those two um, things that are in tension with one another? Yeah, so I, I thank you for asking that question. That's such an important question. And I'm gonna answer it in a couple of ways. So firstly, we really have the frameworks to be able to do this. Um, we have dynamic consent processes where I, as a parent, can sign up for different levels of consent. So I can allow you know, the general analytical population to have a look at it, or I could allow only clinicians to have a look at my data. And I can change that over time. So it's dynamic, not just in terms of levels, but temporarily. And that's that structure and framework is already set up. So I can change and, and make sure that I you know, I'm comfortable with my data settings at any time. We also have, like here at the Broad, the data use oversight system, where you really are, you know, making sure that you you have strong IRBs in place, that you're able to keep data only to the intended use. And then we have, um, you know, persistent identification technology where we can keep data private using technology, but then link those data in a way that, you know, is not linkable to the particular patient, but it's linkable to the other data sets that we may want to use. So there's, there's that component of it. The framework already exists. But the more important point I think is, and this is, this is from work that I've done with GeneDx, they are currently running a Guardian, a program called Guardian, where they're gathering 100,000 genomes. Now these genomes are random, okay? They, we, they're asking um, patients that go into hospitals, mothers, that are going into hospitals, um, whether or not they would be interested in, in a whole genome for their, their family. And um, the adoption rate is 80%. Now I can tell you as a rare disease parent, the adoption rate is gonna be much higher than that if you, um, if you wanna figure out, not just for your child, but for all rare disease patients, what might be targetable as, a, as therapeutic options how we might be able to create platform approaches and how I might be able to en enroll my child in studies and clinical trials, diagnosis, et cetera. So um, these, you know, first of all, I think that problem's been solved. Second of all, rare disease patients are you know, all for using these data. Thank you so much. Um, we will uh, thank Simon very much for his excellent comments. And I know that you're all aware that we're running a little bit late, but um, we were supposed to come back from lunch at 1. Let's try to come back at 1.15, please, so we can make up a little bit of time, and we'll go from there. Thank you all very much. Great session. So I feel like we've already lived a lot today with the beautiful sessions from this morning. I'm Jillian Shaw. I'm a scientific advisor in Ana Greca's group and spearheading some of the organizational efforts for Ladders to Cures. JT Neal is going to be co-moderating this session with me. Um, and I'd love to kick off today's session. So we're going to be talking a lot about mechanisms of rare diseases. We've talked a lot about the arc of discovery this morning from clinical phenotypes to what it takes to get a drug or a therapeutic modality into patients. Um, and today we're gonna to talk about some of the nodal mechanistic biology and some of the learnings from one rare disease that could be transferred to others. So without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Vamsi Mutha an institute member here at the Broad and co-director of the Metabolism Program. Vamsi is an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor of systems biology and of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And his laboratory is based in the Department of Molecular Biology and Center for Genome Medicine at Mass General. Vamsi is 
a world-renowned expert in bioenergetics and mitochondrial diseases. In addition to his many accolades of training in mathematics and computational science at Stanford, and the MD at Harvard um, in the, and MIT's Division of Health Sciences and Technology. He is widely known throughout the Broad as the person you go to for any question about myo mitochondrial bioenergetics. I'll also add that in addition to being, the, being able to identify dozens of disease genes and discovered the components of the mitochondrial calcium uniporter, um, he also comes up with incredibly clever titles for all of his research papers, um, Metamido being a distinct example. Without further ado, Vamsi, welcome. Thank you, Jillian, for the very, very kind introduction. And thank you, Anna, for uh, organizing this great symposium and for uh, having me participate. And so, okay, great. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here, and today I'm going to be talking to you uh, about some of the challenges that we face when we're working on the ultra-rare mitochondrial disorders. And I'd like to just begin by paying our obeisances to the late Victor Mikusek, who of course is the father. I'd like to begin by just, uh, uh, ooh. can you hear that? Is that okay? So. Uh, it's always nice to begin these types of talks by paying our obeisances to the late Victor Mikusik, who was in many ways the, the father or mother or the parent of modern genetic uh, medicines, uh, genetic medicine. And he wrote very famously about the critical role of lumping and splitting. And this is gonna be a theme that's gonna be very relevant in my talk today. So this is the organelle that we focus on. Uh, it is called the powerhouse of the cell because that machinery in the middle of this image that's literally consuming 500 liters of oxygen a day to help catalyze the formation of ATP from all of the food that we just ate. Um, on the left are these pictures of these mitochondria. They look like bacteria because one and a half billion years ago, they were free swimming bacteria. They still have a tiny little genome that's maternally transmitted. This is a vestige of their bacterial ancestry. And all of these fascinating properties you know, are, are, are half of the reasons that we like to focus on this organelle. The other reason we like to focus on this organelle is because it often breaks down in a number of human conditions. On the one hand, as all of us age, as the panel on the left shows, the number of mitochondria and the activity of mitochondria will decline. And on the opposite end of the extreme are a very large number of ultra rare diseases where children typically are born with a birth defect in this organelle. And there's no doubt that the mitochondrial dysfunction is what is driving the pathology. So we have historically focused on these rare diseases in part, major part, because we don't have any effective medicines for them, but also in part because studying them could impact more common conditions. So today when I'm talking about rare mitochondrial diseases, I'm typically talking about a disorder that impacts this oxidative phosphorylation system this can be due to mutations in the mitochondrial DNA or in the nuclear DNA. And one of the really challenging aspects is that there's so much phenotypic heterogeneity. Some of these patients will only have eye disease. Other patients will have multisystemic disease involving all of the organ systems that are shown here. And we don't understand why. So uh, over the next 10, 12 minutes, I want to share with you our approach to these disorders that sits on this triad of understanding the genes and the biomarkers with an eye towards therapeutics. So prior to 2001, uh, I would say most of the field was actually focused on mitochondrial DNA as the source of mitochondrial disorders. This is a genome that was sequenced by the late Fred Sanger. It's only 16 KB long. It's very easy. It was Easy today, it was easy even 20 years ago to sequence in a patient in whom you suspected mitochondrial disease. But of course that only encodes 13 proteins and so there had to be a lot of business coming in from the nuclear genome as well. And so after 2001, I was fortunate to be able to train with Eric Lander, picked up some of the new skills of modern genomics and when we set up uh, my own laboratory, one of the first things that we did was we tried to figure out all of the nuclear encoded components of the mitochondrion. This was a lot of work that involved at that, at that time 
cutting edge mass spectrometry proteomics, computation, later we used methods in proximity biotinylation. We essentially put together a reference proteome for this organelle. We call it mitocarda. We make it freely available to the world, and it's been used as a resource both by human geneticists as well as by basic scientists for systems and analysis of this organelle. And this has really fueled, this in combination with next generation sequencing has fueled the discovery of disease genes. And so there's 1,100 nuclear encoded proteins that have to operate with those 13 proteins coming from mom's mtDNA. And over the last 20 years, we as a field have now identified almost 300 of these genes as being mutated, typically in a recessive, sometimes in a dominant form of mitochondrial disease. And so our ability to find genes for these disorders is relatively straightforward at present, and often we can secure a genetic diagnosis from the blood. Now, after you've established a genetic diagnosis in one of these rare mitochondrial disorders, the next time that the patient will come to the clinician, the patient is not asking what the diagnosis is. The patient is asking, am I getting better? Am I getting worse? You put me on an experimental therapy, is it working? And so we have decided to invest heavily. We shifted all of our mass spec proteomics work to mass spec metabolomics. We're trying to come up with a blood test, if you will, for mitochondrial dysfunction. And our strategy is to use metabolomics. And the reason we need biomarkers is so that we can monitor disease progression. This can also be super useful in clinical trials for lumping patients together. And also it can be very useful for quantifying therapeutic response in a clinical trial setting. And modern mass spectrometry is pretty cool from a single tube of blood when we analyze plasma. We can profile about 10,000 features. We only know the identity of about 500 of them. So that means that there's a lot of chemistry that still awaits even discovery. I just wanna share with you how we're combining the genetics and the metabolomics. To date, we've done two small focused studies. The first one involved a metabolomic analysis of nine patients with Lee syndrome due to a gene, uh, muta due to mutations in a gene called LRPPRC. Nine patients, nine controls. When we do metabolomics, and, and our controls are controlled for age, gender, BMI, activity status, fasting status. The really cool thing is that the metabolomics perfectly separates in an unbiased way the cases and controls. And when we dig deeper into that principal component one, a lot of those metabolites are basically reading out NADH to NAD. So remember, NADH is gonna send its electrons into the respiratory chain. So when it's broken, NADH builds up and all coupled metabolites are also rising. What's also really neat is that this exact same signature, particularly the metabolite on the right, ends up being the number one marker for insulin resistance and also is the number one marker that drops immediately after weight loss surgery. So connecting some of the rare to the common. We repeated a second metabolomic study. This is gonna be one of the largest probably ever for one of these rare mitochondrial diseases. We worked with our colleagues at Columbia who had a, co who had a cohort of 100 patients with MELOS. And any of you that are clinicians, you probably had MELOS on your board exams at some point. Most clinicians have never seen a MELOS patient, but the Columbia group has a cohort of about 100 of them. Uh, and we also uh, analyzed 30 of their controls or so. And again, we did both a, a discovery analysis using metabolomics and a completely independent validation study using patients from MGH. And again, most metabolites are traceable to this high NADH to NED ratio, which we're calling reductive stress. Now the Columbia cohort is really nice because they had so much annotation of their cohort. We also had information on the disease severity based on questionnaires. So we had things like Karnofsky scores. As it turns out, these markers of reductive stress also correlate quantitatively with disease severity as well. So we've done two of these studies, uh, and there's quite a bit of overlap in, in, in the signatures that we see. And so what Rahul Gupta, an MD-PhD student in my laboratory has done, is he's taken that first cohort, that I, uh, or the second cohort that I just told you about, and he's used a linear regression method to look at the metabolome and come up with a simple predictor consisting of eight metabolites, a simple linear combination of those eight metabolites, and he's able to perfectly separate the cases and controls. This is not surprising, because he trained on that first data. Then he goes into a completely separate cohort, which is shown on the right. This was data that was collected 10 years earlier using different instrumentation. And the same 
uh, predictor, which he calls mitoscore, separates the cases and controls. Now, another one of the greats in our field is Archibald Garrett, who is considered to be the father of inborn errors of metabolism. And uh, he wrote very eloquently on what's called chemical individuality. And in describing inborn errors of metabolism, he actually hypothesized that perhaps if you imagine some sort of a vector, the inborn errors of metabolism, they may represent extremes on a distribution that ordinarily varies in the population. So now Rahul has an eight metabolite signature that also happens to have been typed in the UK Biobank. So we can ask, what does this distribution look like in the population? And what he sees is that, uh, uh, what he sees is that there's a broad distribution uh, in the UK Biobank. And you can see that in these two rare diseases, they are extrema. Now, because this is UK Biobank, we have genome sequences. We can do a GWAS on this mitoscore trait. And when we do that, we get a Manhattan plot, and these peaks closely correspond to NADH biology, which is kind of reassuring, and it shows strong genetic correlation with diabetes. And so um, we're, we're excited about being able to use some of these signatures to relate the rare to each other, as well as to the common. So our vision is that from a single tube of blood, we should be able to establish a genetic diagnosis and biochemically stage a patient. And if we give a novel therapy, we can monitor those biochemicals for therapeutic response. So all that's lacking is a therapy. And uh, the world of mito disorders is a pretty hot area right now. There's numerous biotech companies and academic groups that are developing new therapeutic strat strategies, which is really exciting. I wanna share with you a strategy that we're really excited about. Back in 20, 2016, we reported that hypoxia or low ambient oxygen can actually um, uh, alleviate mitochondrial disease. This is on the basis of a CRISPR screen that our former graduate student Isha Jane had performed in which we were looking for suppressors of mitochondrial dysfunction. And the screen gave rise to a very counterintuitive idea that low O2 may be beneficial. And it's counterintuitive because back then, and maybe even today, a lot of people are of the mindset that if you have mito disease, let's energize by giving more oxygen. The screen said to do the exact opposite, turn down the dial. After doing some cell culture work, we graduated to mice. And I wanna show you what happened. So um, I'm gonna start the video in a second, but these are five mice. They all have a form of a neurological disease called Lee syndrome. For the purposes of the video, all five are in the same cage now, but two of them, since the time of weaning, had been breathing thin air. We diluted the air that they breathe with nitrogen, so they're breathing 11% oxygen instead of 21% oxygen. So see if you can guess, and 11% is the equivalent of 15,000 feet elevation. This is base camp or South America. It's not Everest. So healthy humans should be able to tolerate 11%. So see if you can guess which two mice are breathing thin air. Hopefully it was striking. Uh, it's, it's very, very, very striking. Uh, and so these mice ordinarily die at about two months from their neurological disease. If they're living at 11% oxygen, um, this is at the time of publication, they will survive to about one year median lifespan compared to about two to three years for a normal mouse. So it's a massive improvement in lifespan. They do not develop neuroinflammatory lesions. Uh, this is IBA staining if they're grown in hypoxia. And remember those two markers that I told you about earlier? They're up in the mouse model and they're brought back down again with hypoxia. We've done a lot of work. I don't have time in a 15 minute talk to go over some of the mechanisms, but this is our working model right now. Our mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, but we are literally consuming 500 liters of oxygen every day. When the mitochondria is broken, we believe that there's high unused oxygen. These patients will often have venous hyperoxia. And we think that that high unused oxygen, it can cause signaling anomalies, but it can also directly oxidize factors, including things like iron. And for clarity, we are not invoking reactive oxygen species. This is 
very different than classical reactive oxygen species, we are invoking direct dioxygen toxicity. Okay? So very, very different from, from ROS. Please, if you want to irritate me, ask me about ROS. This is not ROS. Okay? <laughs> and a lot of our ongoing work is related to mechanism. Uh, will this generalize beyond this mouse? The answer is yes in other preclinical models. And importantly, how do we safely, effectively, and practically translate this into the clinic? And so hopefully I've given you a flavor for this triad uh, on which we try to do a lot of our translational research focused on mitochondrial disorders. I want to just end with what I think is the biggest challenge for our field. This is a very, very hot area right now. Lots of folks are trying to develop therapies for rare and common forms of mitochondrial dysfunction. I think the biggest challenge that we have is heterogeneity. We can have mutations in the nuclear genome or in the mtDNA. We have locus heterogeneity, we have allelic heterogeneity. And on the back end, we have so much pleiotropy and phenotypic heterogeneity. So how the heck are we gonna sort of embrace all of this so that we can actually try to get effective medicines that are truly, truly uh, 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 beneficial? Without a doubt, some of these that are common enough, we're gonna have things like gene editing and gene replacement for the more common ones, but there's such a long tail of ultra rare diseases, we're gonna to have to be able to target some of the common nodal pathways, whether it's NADH or oxygen as well. And so uh, with all these challenges before us, what's the path forward? And I'm just gonna end with one slide with what we are calling MetaMito. Okay? This is a bit of an aspirational project right now, but we've already begun it with two of these small focused metabolomics projects. Our vision in the future is to try to recruit maybe a thousand different patients with a variety of different uh, mutations uh, in the nuclear or mitochondrial genomes and have mitochondrial disease. Uh, and already we've done one of these studies for LRPBRC, another study for MELOS. We want to do metabolomics, and the vision is that in this high dimensional space, right, we can now begin to group patients to each other on the basis of the metabolome. So instead of a genetic nosology, or an organ nosology, we're proposing a metabolomics nosology for these rare diseases. And you can imagine that there may be some axes that correspond to specific mechanisms for which there could be interesting medicines and along which we may be able to group patients together. We can bring the rare together, but then we may also be able to bring the rare together with the common as well. And so we believe that with metamito, we'll be able to address many of the challenges that we face for these disorders. And so with that, I just really want to do some shout outs to my entire team. I feel super fortunate to have an amazing, amazing team, as well as collaborators. And a few key shout outs, uh, Rohit Sharma uh, directs uh, translational metabolomics in our lab uh, over at MGH. Dr. Missy Walker directs the Pediatric Mitochondrial Disorders Clinic, is very interested in single cell as well as in direct patient care, and Rahul Gupta is an MD-PhD student that's been doing some of our big data analysis. With that, I will stop. Okay. Thank you, Bomzi. that was wonderful. I really wish we could have a day devoted to each speaker, but um, in the interest of time, um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Beggs. Alan is the director of the Manton Center for Orphan Disease Research at Boston Children's Hospital and the Sir Edwin and Lady Manton Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Alan obtained his PhD in human genetics at Johns Hopkins University with subsequent postdoctoral fellowship training in medical and molecular genetics at Johns Hopkins and Boston Children's Hospital. He is also the core director for the Molecular Genetics Core at the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center at Boston Children's Hospital and a member of the Undiagnosed Disease Network. I'll also mention that Alan is the type of investigator where you send him a list of rare pathogenic variants at a late hour and within hours you have all of his detailed notes in the margins of what he thinks about each disease and what has been discovered. Um, so it is my pleasure to welcome Alan to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you must have caught me on a particularly good day because there's other times people send me emails and they're lucky if they hear back ever. So, all right. So um, I'm going to talk to you in particular about the development of therapy for one particular disease. Um, but just to set that in context, I want to let you know a little bit about the Manton Center for Orphan Disease Research. Because at Children's Hospital, we were, really, we were blessed 
uh, about 15 years ago with a, a donation from a family who didn't have anybody with any particular disease affected, um, but they recognized the value, this is 15 years ago, of leveraging uh, new developments in genetics and molecular biology to study rare diseases. And so they helped us create the center that was focused really on anybody who was undiagnosed. So we were able to develop an IRB protocol that says you or a member of your family has a condition we don't know what it is, uh, which was really kind of revolutionary at the time. It's now obviously a very powerful and much more common approach for enrolling families into genomic testing and molecular studies leading to clinical trials. So uh, within the Manton Center, and, and the numbers up uh, top here, well, that's a little bit slow, so I won't use it so much, but uh, represent um, not just patients enrolled in the Manton Center, but also patients enrolled in my lab study, which is very parallel, a neuromuscular disease. Um, but we have we can kind of break these down into two groups, um, large group uh, N of one patients. And for example, we have three patients enrolled with ATP 1A3 related disorders um, or cohorts. And my personal interest has been congenital myopathies, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And we have several patients enrolled with the several thousand patients. And having these several thousand patients uh, with this group of congenital myopathies has allowed us to assemble groups of several hundred with particular genetic diagnoses. And as I hope I'll explain, this has been really critical in making the transition from understanding the genetics and the pathophysiology to actually bringing potential treatments to the clinic. Um, so the congenital myopathies, I often refer to these as the non-dystrophic myopathies to contrast them with muscular dystrophies, which are progressive diseases associated with cell death and loss. Um, but these are also primary diseases of skeletal muscle associated with um, weakness, um, often presentation early in life or at birth. Often patients have a high arched palate that reflects weakness in utero as their facial muscles are developing. As with a lot of genetic conditions, there is wide variation in clinical severity. Um, but they have unifying genetic features um, and are typically defined by the way the muscle looks under the microscope. So these are four characteristic patterns or characteristic of four different clinical pathological diagnoses. So in the upper left in the Gomori trichrome, these dark bodies are so-called nemaline rods, defines a condition called nemaline rod myopathy. The kind of moth-eaten appearance in the upper right um, on a cytochrome oxidase stain shows the areas lacking mitochondria with so-called mini cores. On the lower right is something a uh, little bit more nonspecific CFTD or congenital fiber type disproportion is a finding where the low type 1 fibers are particularly hypotrophic. Then in the lower left, which I'll be talking about today in more detail, is X-linked myotubular myopathy. This is a muscle biopsy from a newborn or a one-week-old baby. Um, but in fact, these very small myofibers with um, nuclei, the dark blue structures in the center resemble myotubes, which is a normal developmental stage for 23-week-old skeletal muscle in humans, and hence the term myotubular myopathy. So genetically, over the course of my career, we've made good progress uh, in identifying the genetic basis for each of these, and um, shown, for example, in the blue oval are all the genes which can be mutated to form nemaline myopathy. The size of the gene symbol roughly correlates with the proportion of patients whose, muta whose disease is caused by that mutation. So for example, mutations in the nebulin gene are um, responsible for about half of patients with nemaline myopathy. Above that, um, the central nuclear myopathies, you can see that MTM1, or myotubularin, is one of the most common causes of the central nuclear myopathies, which are characterized by a nucleus that's abnormally present in the middle of the myofiber. So having our cohort, actually uh, before we get into the development of therapy, I just want to talk about how this was important for allowing us to actually move to the clinic eventually. Um, we had, over the years, enrolled several hundred patients who were all genetically confirmed with mutations in the MTM1 gene. And this allowed us to um, do extensive genotype-phenotype correlation studies 
uh, to do natural history studies, and essentially to convince potential investors that there was enough information here and a large enough group of patients that if we could develop a potential therapy that this was worth investing in. And as you'll see, um, that is, that's exactly what happened. So the phenotype, the presentation of X-linked MTM, um, it's, uh, as the name implies, the gene is on the X chromosome, and it affects primarily boys, although as Grace Finoy was just telling me a few minutes ago, um, occasionally we have female patients who present. Uh, it has an incidence of about one in 50,000. This is important to know for um, developing interest on the part of investors and startup companies. Patients are typically born severely affected to begin with. So they're quite floppy or hypotonic at birth with severe global muscle weakness. Uh, typically, as many as half of them have died in the first couple of years of life. And the average lifespan is really into early to mid-adolescence with a tale of occasional mild, milder patients who survive um, very rarely into adulthood. Um, but typically, these children often have trouble sitting independently. They require at least half-day invasive, invasive or non-invasive ventilation. Once they're put on a tracheostomy on a vent, they often never come, they never come back. Um, and they typically don't walk. Uh, and as I implied, that it's caused by mutations in the myotubular gene MTM1, which happens to be a lipid phosphatase. So having studied the pathophysiology of this and understanding the genetics, it uh, became clear a number of years ago that this was actually an excellent candidate for gene replacement therapy. So the mutations were all loss of function mutations. There were clearly defined single monogenic uh, cause for this group of conditions. So by definition, the term X-linked myotubular myopathy refers to patients with mutations in the MTM1 gene. Um, it was a fairly uniform uh, condition with early onset and severity. So these were patients who were going to have a high mortality early in life, which allowed us at a time when thinking about gene replacement therapy was kind of a scary concept. And in fact, you'll see there are, is significant risk associated with it. Uh, it was still ethical and appropriate to consider uh, developing this uh, to, the, uh, to the clinic. The encoded protein myotubularin is an enzyme. And so uh, there was evidence, in fact, you don't need a lot of myotubularin in order to have a significant beneficial impact on improving the phenotype. So in other words, a little bit potentially goes a long way. And then finally, we had some excellent animal models. So Anna Bushbello in uh, Strasbourg, when she was there before moving to Genethon, had developed a knockout mouse model. I was fortunate enough to collaborate with a veterinarian who identified a naturally occurring dog mutation. And we were able to start a colony of these dogs. So we had the available, these two animal models. The mice typically die by 9 to about 12 weeks of age, so a very rapid, easily measurable outcome. The dogs also died by about uh, four or five months or had to be put down very unfortunately um, if they weren't treated. So just moving very quickly through this because I want to get to really the uh, arc of how the clinical development has occurred here. Um, in 2014, we published a study where we demonstrated essentially proof of principle and as it turned out, um, ended up inadvertently developing what became a preclinical drug compound. So we demonstrated initially uh, a lot of work done by Anna Bushbello and Jonathan that tail vein administration to MTM1 knockout mice essentially cured them. So instead of dying by three, two months of age, these mice lived as long as a year and a half, two years, never showed any evidence of affection status. Uh, and then we did studies in the dogs. First was the local regional perfusion into one limb of a dog. In fact, that went systemic and had a, a major benefit, a single infusion of AAV. Um, and then um, uh, later on did a series of studies uh, where we showed that systemic correction was possible with an intravenous infusion. And in fact, the two dogs numbers two and three that were treated are 11 years old now and doing wonderfully. So a real success story in that context. Now, what I want to tell you is that at the time we were doing this, uh, the vectors available for 
AAV-based gene therapy, the so-called legacy vectors, were a group of naturally occurring viruses. And you're probably aware that, for example, uh, Zolgensma to treat spinal muscular atrophy uses AAV-based 9, AAV-9. Um, some of the, re the recent um, Sarepta-based gene therapy for Duchenne dystrophy uses AAVRH74, which actually comes from a rhesus monkey. And for these studies, we used AAV8. And while these three viruses are actually pretty good, relatively speaking, at transducing skeletal muscle, they still require you to uh, infuse uh, patients with extremely high doses on the order of 10 to the 14 viral genomes per kilogram of body weight, uh, which is orders of magnitude higher than the level of AAV that we would naturally be exposed to in the course of a regular adenoviral cold, for example. So uh, because of all this preclinical work and because of our work demonstrating a sufficient patient population, I was able to work with a company, Audentis Therapeutics. I want to disclose that um, I was not an equity holder of Audentis, although I was a paid consultant with them. Um, but Audentis developed a, a trial called Aspiro, which was a phase one, two dose escalation trial where they treated patients either with 1 times 10 to the 14 VG per kg, um, and then moved up to a uh, higher dose cohort of 3 times 10 to the 14 VGs per kg. Patients were treated um, within the first five years of life, and then followed uh, with a series of assessments as shown here over time. And the efficacy was truly remarkable. So this shows the average time of day spent on a ventilator for patients. One of the inclusion criteria was that patients were required to be on a vent for at least half the day. Some of them were on 24 hours, and many of them actually were on invasive ventilation with a tracheostomy. And what's not illustrated here, in fact, is that um, many of the patients with tracheostomies actually were decannulated on the advice of their pulmonologists, which never happens in this disease. Once you go on that type of support, you, you just don't come off for the rest of your life. So um, not only was ventilatory um, uh, function dramatically improved, but so were gross motor functions. And you can see here in the top in the lower dose cohort in blue, a number of the patients followed long enough. And this was as of uh, January of 2021. Um, many of these patients were walking. Um, and um, all the patients here who don't have a black triangle there are still alive and have actually continued to improve. So on the efficacy side of things, this is a remarkably effective therapy. However, the black triangles, you'll see three patients with a black triangle. These are patients who died of an acute episode that I'm going to tell you about now um, unexpectedly. And, and what happened initially was that this was in the first phase of the trial. These three patients passed away. Um, the FDA and the sponsor put the trial on clinical hold. Um, after consideration, the trial was restarted again at the lower dose only because this was felt to potentially be a dose-related adverse outcome. And uh, a fourth patient died on that. So I'm going to tell you in total about four deaths, um, all treated at doses of 1 to 3 times 10 to the 14. So don't worry too much about all the details here. These are um, clinical information about the four patients who passed away. But the one unifying feature um, in the lower middle here says severe decompensated liver disease. And in fact, what, has, what happened in these four patients is that they all developed very rapid and fulminant liver failure, um, leading to death in a variety of related ways um, over the course of several weeks to a month or so. So again, I'm not going to show you the data for uh, lack of time. But um, long story short is that what we have come to understand is that there was previously unrecognized hepatic uh, deficiency in these patients uh, that was unmasked by the extremely high viral loads that were prepared here. So this trial has been on hold now since 2021, I believe. Um, and no further patients have been treated with this uh, particular drug based on the AAVA at these doses. Well, about the same time, um, in 2022 probably, um, uh, Sharif Tebi Bordbar, who um, was a graduate student when I, I was on his thesis defense committee, 
came over here and uh, did a postdoc with Pardis Sabeti, um, came into my office to tell me about his work on uh, directed evolution for AAV capsids to develop more efficient delivery to skeletal muscle, and asked if we would consider uh, validating this or testing this in the MTM mouse model. And um, I'll just again show you very briefly here um, that instead of 10 to the 14 viral genomes per kilogram, we treated a series of mice with 2 times 10 to the 12 VG per kg um, and compared the response of mice treated with either the AA legacy, in this case AAV9, or with one of Sharif's new vectors uh, we called MyoAAV. And I won't go through the details on the right, but essentially uh, the low-dose MyoAAV treated animals were, again, cured. I never use the C word, especially with patients, but they were undistinguishable from their healthy litter mates. Whereas the mice with, uh, treated with the same dose of the legacy vector AAV9 had a rapid decline. So last slide, um, Sharif, um, as you, many of you know, has gone off to bigger, better things. Um, he and I are, and again, by way of disclosure, both scientific co-founders of a company called Kate Therapeutics. I do hold equity in Kate, by disclosure. Um, but um, Sharif has brought this platform to Kate. The Broad has actually licensed its rights to my OAAV um, part for some diseases to Sarepta and for some other diseases to Kate. And uh, so we developed this at Kate. And in a remarkable turnaround, a month ago we announced that in fact um, MyoAAV has been licensed back to Astellas. Astellas Pharmaceuticals, a big Japanese pharmaceutical company which acquired Audentis, the company that had done the first round of clinical trials. So that's the two steps backward or one step backward we're now hoping to make additional steps forward. Um, and I think it just illustrates, though, the, the difficulty that in developing rare disease therapies that there are a lot of unexpected and unexplained things that can occur. Now, we have no evidence for the liver toxicity in any of the animal models, um, but very clearly the human patients had this. So one takeaway is you really don't know what's happening until you go into, into a patient. Um, you also have to think about the age. Um, pediatricians famously like to say children are not little adults, and that's absolutely true as well. Um, and so um, I'll just say that these uh, approaches are translatable. So um, I'm working extensively on selenon myopathy, which mutations of which cause rigid spine muscular dystrophy. Here, one of the challenges has been getting, coming up with good clinical outcomes to demonstrate uh, for, to investors and companies. Um, as well as the number of patients available. It's a more rare disease. And then an ultra, ultra rare disease, we only know about 50 patients worldwide, ADSS1 myopathy. Um, uh, but with the proper animal models, we're hopeful that we can actually develop uh, treatments for that. So I'll let it go with that. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. I'm JT Neal. Um, I'm a PI in the Novo Nordisk um, Foundation Center for Genomic Mechanisms of Disease and uh, co-director of the Type 2 Diabetes Systems Genomics Initiative here at Broad. And um, I'm very happy to be able to introduce the last two speakers in this session before we go to the Q&A. Uh, for our next talk, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and close collaborator, Raj Gupta. Raj is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School with a research lab in the divisions of cardiovascular medicine and genetics at Brigham and Women's Hospital. His research is focused on identifying new treatments for vascular disease using human genetics to discover novel biologic pathways. Raj is also the recipient of numerous awards, which I will not read, <laughs> uh, other than uh, uh, including the NIH director's uh, new innovator award, and will be talking to us today about large-scale CRISPR-I perturb-seq in endothelial cells. Welcome, Raj. Perfect. Uh, thanks for that introduction, JT. We we colluded a little on on how much to how much to say. So thanks for that. Um, 
It's a really you know, great pleasure, a great honor to present at this forum. Um, this is a, a bit of a departure for the work in my lab. We're interested in common disease, and you know, I've been at the Broad for about 10 years now, and most of that was in the variant to function community, which has been like this incredible environment to use high throughput methods to identify the biologic mechanism by which common variants affect disease. And so the story I'm gonna tell is using that technology, using those platforms, largely led by people like JT, to gain insights into rare diseases. And I think that theme has sort of pervaded the whole day is that there's this sort of common to rare and rare to common um, uh, synergy. And so, so I, I hope that my project sort of gives a window into that as well. So, you know, the, the big picture is that uh, we study diseases of the vas vasculature in my lab. Uh, and you know, the vasculature is you know, sort of the biggest system of the entire human body. It comprises of arteries, veins, and capillaries. And if laid end to end, it is 60,000 miles of blood vessels. And it, it can be linked to almost every disease. Every disease mentioned here today, muscles diseases, neurologic diseases, cancer related to angiogenesis, have all been sort of tied to some vascular dysfunction at some point in their story. But, um, the, one of the issues is that today I'm going to talk about the primary diseases of the vasculature. So um, some of my slides seem to have been <laughs> garbled here, so I'll see, see how far I get. But um, the, pr the primary diseases of the vasculature are, are diseases where the, the cells of the blood vessel wall are, are, are central to the pathogenesis of the disease. And that can be separated into the common primary vascular diseases and the rare primary vascular diseases. So on the left, you see the leading causes of death and disability in the United States and throughout the world. Coronary disease, stroke, peripheral arterial disease. And they're, they're characterized by atherosclerosis, right? Hardening of arteries after years of exposure to risk factors. But on the right are rare diseases like arterial venous malformations, cerebral cavernous malformations, lymphatic disorders, and thoracic aortic aneurysms. And, and what's, what's so what's incredible is that human genetics is showing us that the common and rare diseases are sharing the same genetic risk factors. So um, what, what we see is that you know, it's the same genes that drive both of these disorders. On the left, you see that for common diseases, a lot of this genetic association has been done with uh, genome-wide association studies. So for coronary disease, the biggest genome-wide association studies now have a million participants, and we found about 300 loci that explain risk, and that explains about 40% of the genetic risk. But on the right, we find rare diseases where all the genetic discovery's been in families, so family sequencing, and that's been discussed a lot here today. But what's fascinating is that the, the genes identified for the rare diseases overlap with the common variant association. So it's sort of pointing to the same genes, the same nodes, the same cells. Uh, when, when there's dysfunction of a vascular cell, it's often driven by rare variants or a common variants at the same sites. And so that's sort of the theme for our lab, is what are these shared mechanisms that link common and rare? And so the question we asked is, can we use high throughput variant function assays to improve our understanding of rare vascular diseases? And so the outline, and I'll, I'll sort of go through this uh, one at a time, is that I'm gonna share how we use something called PerturbSeq to map all the regulatory pathways. And then we implicated one regulatory pathway for both common and rare disease. And this is sort of the regulation of KLF2 in vascular cells. And then the second sort of is with that, with that map, we're able to search for new causal genes for rare vascular malformations. And so that's sort of a rare disease that shares the pathophysiology with coronary disease. And then finally, these maps and these new causal genes, can we harness that information to, to sort of motivate some drug discovery? And we're just now sort of delving into this, into this space. Uh, so PerturbSeq is the sort of mapping method that we used in the lab. And so this is developed at the Broad. It combines CRISPR knockouts and single cell RNA sequencing. I sometimes joke, like take the two most exciting things happening and just do them at the same time. And so, um, so what we did is we used a DCAS9 crab, which is also called CRISPR-I, to lentilly virally infect a pool of endothelial cells. And then we performed single cell RNA sequencing on each one of those cells. And so this had been done by Aviv Regev's lab and several others for handfuls of genes and known pathways. So we asked, could we apply PerturbSeq to all 2,000 genes that were within a megabase of every CAD GWAS locus? 
And so that's what we did. So over the course of three years, Gavin Schnitzer in the lab designed a lentiviral library where we knocked out 2,300 genes um, that were at the 241 CADG site. And we did this in endothelial cells. The middle panel, you'll see basically our raw data that was generated over that time, where we did single cell RNA sequencing on 215,000 cells uh, that represented 37,000 guide RNAs. And on average, we had about 90 uh, cells per target gene where we could compile data from. And at this point, we couldn't analyze the data with sort of traditional methods, right? So we you know, worked with our collaborators, Jesse and Greats, to apply something called CNMF, Consensus Non-Negative Matrix Factorization, a machine learning approach to sort of get that transcriptional signature from each cell and study it in a space where we can build these matrices that you see here. And so this is sort of the matrix plot that we were able to generate. So on the x-axis, you'll see each one of these topics. So in, in this method, you, you identify these topics or families of co-regulated genes. And we identified 60 topics from this data. And on the uh, y-axis, you see each one of our gene knockouts. So that's the 2,300 genes that we knocked out. And for the most part, it's white space, right? You knock out a gene, and it doesn't really have an effect on the transcriptional signature of an endothelial cell. But there are some sort of groups of co-regulated genes that have the same response to a gene knockdown. And so we named all of these sort of manually over the course of a lot of time. Uh, that we, we generated this catalog of programs, and we named each one of the 60 programs. Most of them are ubiquitous to all cell types. So they represent cell cycle or ER biology, cell, cell um, uh, mitochondrial function, for example. But 13 of the programs were endothelial cell specific. And, and these represent a lot of biological functions that you would think are related to, bio, to disease that would affect the vasculature. Um, angiogenesis, wound healing, or endo-MT, sort of cell state changes that have been linked to many, many human diseases. And so uh, we asked the question, which of these programs have the highest overlap with CAD genetics? And when we looked at the, the overlap, so, so what you see here is we took all the CAD GWAS loci and we saw which one of the programs had the greatest genetic signature of causality. And this is sort of, we use lots of different methods in, in collaboration with Hillary Finnegan, LD score regression, MAGMA. We used lists of positive control genes that had already been sort of linked to disease. And no matter what method we used, um, we, we, it was always the same programs that rose to the top. The orange programs in these charts are the EC-specific programs, and it was sort of always 8, 39, 35, 47, 48. And those were you know, the, the pathways that we are implicating for common coronary disease. And you know, when we look back at like which, which pathways, which biologic functions are linked to those pathways, we always found that perturbations in these sets of genes were sort of linked. And so this is a pathway. There's these three scaffolding proteins, CRIT1, CCM2, and PDCD10. And they bind MEK3, so this kinase that they sequester. And it results in this sort of downstream cascade that ultimately results in KLF2 activation. And the only reason that we know this sort of interconnected set of proteins is from rare disease research. So this mapped out pathway has been previously characterized by rare disease biologists in, in vascular disease. And specifically that vascular disease is cerebral cavernous malformations, a really devastating disease that we don't see very often. Kind of 0.1% of people are thought to have a lesion, but this very severe form that you see in this uh, MRI of the brain, that's extremely rare. And they get these mulberry-like blood vessels, these, these sort of enlarged blood vessels. It's often first diagnosed in pediatric populations when they have a seizure. But sadly, sometimes the first diagnosis is, was, is when one of those blood vessels bursts. The only therapy is neurosurgery to kind of remove each of these uh, enlarged blood vessels one at a time. But people had sort of very painstakingly sequenced a lot of these patients. And they found that there were mutations in one of three genes, CRIT1, CCM2, and PDCD10, now named CCM1, CCM2, and CCM3. And there's sort of beautiful lines in all these papers. They say, without human genetics, we never would have implicated these three genes because these three genes are ubiquitously expressed throughout the body. Yet, for some reason, mutations in these genes are driving this exclusively brain vascular disorder. And now we're implicating these same genes as causing risk for coronary disease as well. And so that's sort of, now that we've sort of understood that these pathways overlap, can we find new causal genes? It turns out a third of people with CCM, we don't have a known gi uh, genetic diagnosis. So they don't, they have the classic brain um, MRI, 
but they don't have a mutation in CCM1, CCM2, or CCM3. And so in our perturb seq, we not only find the known members of this pathway, but our map is a little bit more expansive. So in endothelial cells, we know all the genes that look like CCM1, CCM2, and CCM3. We can map all the genes upstream and all the genes downstream of the signaling complex in greater detail than was ever done before. And so, for example, one of the genes that sort of looks very similar to CCM2 knockdown in our data is TLNRD1, which there's a single paper on this gene in the literature, never studied in endothelial cells, but in our data, which you see on the left, you'll see that it almost looks identical to CCM2 knockdown. When we knock down CCM2, we see that CRIT1, which is CCM1, or um, uh, some of these MAP genes that are downstream, they sort of have the expected effects. But TLNRD1, a gene never previously described, looks very similar to it. So we did some protein modeling, some sort of interaction analysis with Marty Taylor, and we were able to see that, you know, you'll see in the scaffold uh, diagram on the right, that CCM2 is in green, and it, it binds to CRIT1, it binds to PDCD10 in, in, uh, in uh, yellow. But TLNRD1 also seems to have this really strong predicted interaction site right at the C terminus of CCM2. And this becomes very interesting. We did a little bit more work to specifically map that interaction site. We're actually to, able to predict with AlphaFold the exact residues at that interaction site. And then we did some IP studies to show that when we delete that interaction site, the, the binding interaction disappears. But when you go to, so how does this relate to disease, biology, people who see patients with CCM? It was really fascinating. So on the bottom panel here, you see the ClinVar for CCM2. And so there's pathogenic mutations kind of throughout the protein, but a lot of them are on that C terminus. And so previously, everyone thought that disease was driven by a loss of CCM2 binding to CRIT1. Well, that's all on the N terminus of the protein. How are these C terminus mutations also causing disease? And it could be that just mutations are destabilizing the whole protein, but we wager that it's actually mutations uh, that are impairing this TLNRD1 CCM2 interaction, sort of a novel mechanism of this rare disease. And so we've partnered with the uh, Angioma Alliance. It's called the Alliance to Cure Cavernous Malformations. Um, and we asked them, do patients with CCM disease have TLNRD1 mutations as well? So like I said, a third of people with CCM have unknown genetics, so you know, do some of these patients. So they have biorepositories of 200, 300 patients, and we'd like to sequence all those patients for these sort of new, new explanations for their disease and see if they're phenotypically different than, than people with the CCM1, 2, or 3 mutations. And so you know, overall, this is just sort of more proof. Now that we've implicated you know, more proteins in this, in this signaling cascade, it's just more proof that KLF2 regulation is critical for the pathogenesis of this rare disease. And so finally, just the last two slides, are, could this motivate drug discovery? Now that we have a better map and we have some better understanding of what proteins mediate this disease, could we harness this information for drug discovery? So um, you know, I think you know, Todd Gallup was here earlier. A lot of the great drug discovery seems to be done for cancer biology. And so one of the, one of the best labs is Nathaniel Gray, who makes these protacs to degrade uh, proteins. And he has this paper where they made a protac against ERK5 because there had been papers that said that ERK5 was really involved in cancer uh, proliferation, cancer cell proliferation. And so they made like a very specific protac. And the, in the paper, the biology is like really exquisite. They show that you know the specificity and it, it degrades 100% of ERK5, but they're able to publish this negative paper that says there's no effect of this protac in their in their systems. In cancer cells, they saw no effect on cell proliferation, no effect on IL6, no effect on IL8, right? So they, you know, it's nice to be so famous that you could just write a negative study <laughs> like that um, in cell, no less. But we we asked them for the drug, and in our, you know, so when we look at KLF2 expression, their protac is incredibly effective, right? It completely knocks down expression of this pathway. And so this is something that we're sort of now gonna collaborate with them on is, you know, so repurposing drugs now that you have a better understanding of the pathway and the mechanism. 
And so with that, I'll conclude that, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, this is just an early window into some of the sort of collaborative projects that we, we're excited about. But there's common vascular disease and there's rare vascular disease. And without genetics, you may never have linked them together. But it does seem that they share a lot of the same pathophysiologic processes. Here I shared that KLF2 regulation is one of those processes, very critical for cavernous uh, malformations of the brain. And maybe we could, you know, use that information to find new drugs. So I'll thank the people of my lab. Um, uh, so, uh, so you know, uh, Gavin Schnitzler and Helen King really led all the um, perturbed seek work, and then Shi Fang, Vivian Lee, and Ori Berry really um, uh, linked that that uh, large screen to the mechanistic biology. And with that, uh, I'll end. Thanks. All right. To close out our session on mechanisms driving rare diseases, last but by no means least, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mustafa Sahin. Dr. Sahin is a professor at Harvard Medical School and the Rosamond Stone Zander Chair at Boston Children's Hospital. At Boston Children's, Sahin is also the director of the Translational Research Program and the Translational Neuroscience Center, and also the founder and director of the Multidisciplinary Tuberous Sclerosis Program at Boston Children's Hospital. I'll try saying that three times fast. Without further ado, welcome, Dr. Sahin. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Anna and all the organizers for including me on this exciting symposium. Let's see, no slide, there we go. What I'd like to do today is to tell you about some of the translational work we've been doing at Boston Children's in uh, pediatric brain disorders. I'm a practicing child neurologist and the field of child neurology is really going through a transformational change. We are going from uh, being a discipline of describing symptoms and signs to a discipline where we can design rational therapies for children with these disorders. This is probably best em uh, exemplified by what has happened in spinal muscular uh, atrophy, which was a disease that was basically fatal in infancy. And since 2000, 2016, three different drugs have been approved, approved for treating these infants. And they are life-saving. They can now reach their motor milestones. And they don't need ventilator help. They can have normal lives. I've highlighted uh, Basil Darius, who runs the neuromuscular program at Boston Children's, as one of the lead authors of these papers, uh, because we see a lot of children with SMA at Boston Children's. And he's contributed significantly into the development of these therapies. So this gives us hope and aspiration that we can do this same thing for more diseases affecting children. There's a huge amount of unmet need, as you've heard so far. So the, the history of uh, rare disease initiative at Boston Children's goes a long way. The first uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, research center, IDDRC, was founded in 1968 at Boston Children's. And it's been a continuous grant since then. Menton Center, as Ellen Beggs mentioned, was founded in uh, 2008, has made a huge contribution across all uh, disciplines at Boston Children's in terms of genetic uh, finding. David Williams, who our previous CS, uh, CSO, started the Translational Research Center. And this uh, Translational Research Program, uh, which provides um, career development grants and pilot grants to investigators who are translational researchers at Boston Children's. And the return on investment of that program has been incredible. Partially um, stimulated by the TRP, we started the Translational Neuroscience Center in 2013. And a, a year after that, we got a grant from the NIH for Rare Diseases Clinical Trial Network. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on the uh, Rosamond Stone Zander Translational Neuroscience Center and the RDCRN grant. And I should highlight the speakers we've already heard from, Elizabeth Engel and Ellen Beggs, as well as Tim Yu, who's going to speak later in the afternoon, are all members of several of these initiatives at Boston Children's. So the Translational Neuroscience Center's goal is to accelerate translation of therapies from the basic uh, science labs to the clinic as soon as possible for pediatric nervous system disorders. We want to do this by reducing the boundaries between different departments and divisions, between basic scientists and clinicians, and between academia and industry. We need everyone's help to be able to solve these problems. And we also want to educate the diverse future leaders of this field, because there's a huge unmet need for new uh, uh, investigators in this field. The approach we take is uh, relatively similar to a lot of other centers, but we leverage 
the large number of rare disease patients we see at Boston Children's. We almost always start with genetically defined patients that are seen in our subspecialty clinic. We do deep phenotyping of these patients, and we also focus a lot on biomarker, biomarker identification because this is going to be incredibly important for uh, accelerating uh, clinical trials in these disorders. We focus especially on brain proximal biomarkers such as EEG or MRI, for instance. We've developed cell-based models of many of these diseases. In the past, most of these were mouse or rat neurons, where more and more we are using iPSC drive neurons for modeling disease. And in almost all cases, we have to go through animal models to test safety and efficacy. And then finally, we move into clinical trials. To accelerate this process, we've developed a number of cores, uh, human neuron core, medicinal chemistry core, uh, clinical neurophysiology core, translational and genomic medicine core, clinical research operations core, human behavioral core, and gene therapy core to try to address a lot of the gaps in this, in this discovery cycle. What I'd like to do is to spend some time how we apply to this, this uh, discovery cycle to one area of disorders, in particular autism spectrum disorder. As you know, due to advances in genetics and genomics, and uh, partly due to uh, the work of many investigators at the Broad, we now know there are about 400 to 1,000 different susceptibility genes for autism spectrum disorder. It's a huge success for genetics, but it's a potential handicap for developing treatments. One can think of a number of simple scenarios. Could there be a broad spectrum treatment for all genetic cause of autism? We think this is, as we know more and more about the biology of these disorders, we think this is relatively unlikely. On the other side, we may have to develop a different treatment, different intervention for every different variant, which is an incredibly labor and resource intensive scenario that I don't think we have the resources for at this point. So many of us in the field have proposed that there might be uh, subcategories of autism that share a convergent cellular or circuit basis. And if we can understand one of these disorders in that subcategory, we might be able to have, gain insights to a broader group of diseases in, within that subcategory. Along those lines, we propose that mTOR activation, either too much activation of mTOR or too little activation of mTOR, might be one of those uh, cellular convergence points. So I've been studying since 2002 a disease called tuberous sclerosis, a disease in which mTOR activity is high. We chose this disease for a number of reasons. 50% of the patients with tuberous sclerosis have autism spectrum disorder, and 90% of the patients develop epilepsy sometime in their life. But very importantly, many of these patients will be diagnosed either prenatally or neonatally because of the presence of heart tumors that are relatively easy to diagnose on the ultrasound. So we have an imaging biomarker, if you will, for this disorder. So that gives us a window of opportunity for intervention very early in life that is um, currently not possible for many forms of autism. We also are learning a lot about the cellular mechanisms underlying TSC through studies on the mTOR pathway, not just from neuroscience, but from oncology, from transplant medicine, immunology, et cetera. And finally, very luckily, we have FCA-approved inhibitors of this pathway, the mTOR pathway, that can be repurposed in either preclinical or clinical studies to interrogate various hypotheses. So the combination of these four factors makes tuberous sclerosis a really unique opportunity and a potential beachhead uh, in terms of autism spectrum disorder, a, a, a point where we can uh, start to learn about autism in general. So over the years, my lab and many others have try to understand the role of TSC proteins in various uh, functions in the nervous system. We've shown that they play a role in axon specification and guidance in mitochondrial dynamics and myelination, epilepsy, cerebellar circuitry, and circadian rhythms. I'm just going to show you a few pieces of data on epilepsy and their role in autism as related to cerebellar circuitry. So we and others have made mouse models of tuberous sclerosis using different Cree driver lines. And What's really common and robust in terms of phenotype of these lines is the fact that they all develop uh, seizures. And we've used uh, small molecules for the most part to show that we can suppress seizures using various mechanisms. However, when we try to take those mechanisms into the clinic, they do not work as well as they do in the, in the mouse models. There is still a huge unmet need in terms of refractory epilepsy in tuberous sclerosis. So as an alternative platform, we've turned to cell-based uh, human models. So through uh, a, a grant from the Mass Life Sciences, uh, we developed a human neuron core about 10 years ago at Boston Children's. We have, we have now 10 full-time uh, staff that is working at the human neuron core. And we have IRB protocols for developing iPSC drive neurons from not just patients at Boston Children's, but throughout the world. 
And we have standard operating procedures for making excitatory and inhibitory cortical neurons, spinal motor neurons, and spinal DRG neurons. And we have access to small molecule libraries as well as some high content imaging equipment to be able to do um, some uh, genetic and small uh, molecule screens. So one of my postdocs, Kellen Winden, a child uh, neurologist in the lab, decided to apply this uh, system to tuberous sclerosis. So he developed the allelic series of TSC2 expressing iPSCs, used neurogenin differentiation to turn them into uh, excitatory cortical neurons, and then looked at the phenotype of these neurons. And one of the um, striking phenotypes within this uh, allelic series was the fact that when he made um, uh, excitatory neurons uh, and cultured them, the TSC2 null cells showed much higher firing rate compared to the other two genotypes. And this was a very robust phenotype that was easy to quantify, as you can see on the uh, graph on the left. When you use rapamycin, which is an mTOR inhibitor, and applied it to these hyperexcitable neurons, it reduced the uh, mean firing rate basically back, back to uh, wild-type levels. And you, when you washed the rapamycin off, as you can see in the graph on the right, the hyperexcitable they came back. So we could see, we could uh, replicate some of the hyperexcitable that see, we see in the patient uh, epilepsy models, for instance, in, this, in a dish in for tuberous sclerosis. So we wanted to see if we could use this uh, phenotype to look for other molecules using a, a small molecule screen. We used a relatively small molecule screen uh, on a similar phenotype and identified heat shock machinery as a potential drug pathway for tuberous sclerosis. So we'd like to be able to expand on this uh, in the future using iPSC-derived neurons from different diseases as well. I'd like to also turn to autism. For reasons I don't have time to get into, we believe that cerebellum is a particular node for developing autism in, in tuberous sclerosis. So Peter Sai, a child neurologist in the lab, had the idea that he could modulate uh, TSC expression in just the Purkinje cells, which is the only output cell of the cerebellar cortex. And he wanted to ask whether that would have a behavioral phenotype in this mouse model. And then Maria Sandberg has been following, these, following up on these studies. So Peter uh, did this study where he knocked out TSC1 gene, either one allele or both alleles of the TSC1 gene, just in the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. And the mice that were developed had social interaction deficits as well as the repetitive behaviors, both core features of autistic-like behavior in the mouse. Peter also recorded from cerebellar slices and saw that the firing rate of the Purkinje cells that are deficient in TSC1 expression were lower than the wild-type cells, in, in contrast to the excitatory neurons that I told you about earlier. When Peter used rapamycin, he could improve the behavioral phenotype of these uh, mice, uh, could uh, basically block the social interaction, and repetitive behavior abnormalities. So we were excited about these results, but we wanted to see if the, uh, we could see the same phenotype in human cells. So Maria Sandberg developed a human Purkinje cell differentiation protocol. It takes approximately 140 days, but the end, at the end, you get about 80% of the cells to have a markers of uh, Purkinje cell uh, development. So she then recorded from these cells, and Surprisingly, we saw what we saw in the mouse model, that there was reduction in firing rate when they were expressing lower amounts of TSC2. And if you treat these cells with uh, rapamycin, you could also rescue the firing rate. In this case, you could increase the firing rate. So we believe having these different cell types uh, differentiated in cell culture from TSC patients gives us platforms to be able to do both small molecule chemical as well as genetic screens and see uh, we can identify new um, new intervention uh, possibilities. This is just one example of tuberous sclerosis, but we can apply this to a, a large number of diseases. This is the expected uh, therapeutic discovery and development um, pipeline. We've developed now um, core facilities that can accelerate each one of these steps. I wanted to highlight the clinical research operation score because for many disorders, the bottleneck is not developing the molecules or the targets, but actually, uh, being able to do successful clinical trials. There's a whole slew of um, you know, failed trials in Fragile X, for instance, that have worked well in open, open label studies but have never uh, gotten FDA approval. So we are paying a lot of attention to how to design clinical trials better, how to ex execute them better, how to analyze them better. We also very early realized that we couldn't do this just at our own site. For rare diseases, you need to have multi-site collaboration. So we formed a a uh, consortium that is called Developmental Synaptopathies Consortium that is funded by NCATS, NIMH, NICHT, and NINDS. And this is an 11-site uh, consortium that is studying three genetic disorders, tuberous sclerosis, P10, 
and Shank 3 mutations that all impact on the mTOR pathway. We are de doing deep phenotyping natural history, longitudinal and prospective natural history study of these uh, in, uh, disorders. We have approximately 200 patients in each arm, and we also have some biomarkers, including EEG, event-related potentials, and MRI from these patients. We've already done clinical trials in tuberous sclerosis and P10 hamartoma tumor syndrome patients, and the deep phenotyping data that we've developed for Shank 3 mutations is now being used by a, by a tech company for their application to the FDA as a historical control. So I think this approach is really potentially expandable to other disorders. In fact, we have a whole slew of disorders that we see large uh, groups of patients uh, at Boston Children's, all of them are seen in our clinics. We have some IPSC assays for uh, many of these disorders. We also have some in vivo assays, and uh, a few of them actually have therapeutic studies ongoing. Of course, we couldn't do this by ourselves. Uh, we need the patients and the families that are brave enough to take part in these trials and really promote us to push this work forward. Um, these are just some of the uh, patient advocacy groups that we work closely with. And without uh, their, their input, without their uh, funding without their contribution to the clinical trials, this work couldn't be done. At the last uh, uh, two slides, I want to uh, talk about uh, a potential new partnership uh, that has been uh, developing between the, between the Broad and, and Boston Children's. Our human neuron core has developed some isogenic iPACs from neurodevelopmental disorder patients, and we've also developed standard operating procedures for different neural, uh, differentiation, uh, neural subtypes. We have five patients recruited from each of these six monogenic neurodevelopmental disorders. And importantly, all of these patients are deeply phenotyped, so we know exactly what symptoms they have at what age. And we have developed isogenic, uh, CRISPR-corrected isogenic controls for these. So now the proposal is to develop a phenotypic library from this 30 isogenic pairs of iPACs for validated screenable endpoints. This is a idea we've developed with Anna Greca and the, the latter's uh, platform, and hopefully this will be the beginning of a, a new collaboration. We would like to get a collection of gene and protein expression signatures, as well as cellular staining from iPSC-derived neurons, and ask the question, can certain monogenetic disorders be grouped for therapeutic development or reversal of a phenotype? And of course, we want to share the library of phenotypes openly uh, with other centers, as well as uh, you know, industry partners. So this is our hope. I hope this will be the beginning. I want to end on this slide, uh, which I hope we all share in this community. Uh, our hope is to bring more therapies to, to more children more, with more diseases. And we, I look forward to the discussion about how we can do it faster. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this point, I want to invite all of our speakers up for a brief Q&A. Um, and if people want to make their ways down to the microphone, feel free to ask your questions. I do want to kick things off with a question for all of our speakers. Um, as a part of Ladders to Cures, we've been talking a lot about massively parallel mechanisms. Um, and we've been throwing around the idea of a mechanism um, of a disease. but I'd love for us to just establish as a community, what does it mean to surround a disease mechanistically, to really understand the underpinnings of what's causing the phenotype, and at what stage in each of your research programs do you decide, okay, it's time to leverage this into a therapy? Uh, well, and that, I think every disease has a different answer, which is one of the challenges that we're faced with. Um, I think the platform-based approaches that we heard about earlier um, not every platform is going to be applicable to every disease, but each platform is going to be applicable to many diseases. And so you can't just say we're going to take a random disease and hit it with everything. Um, but for example, um, cell painting, if you can identify a cellular phenotype, I think you can uh, potentially identify targets. Um, or if not targets, at least you can identify potential biomarkers or disease markers that you can then try to correct by various types of things. You're asking about how to understand pathophysiology. I mean, obviously, um, I think proteomics, metabolomics, and those types of l large big data approaches are important. Um, and they require animal models, and the animal models don't always relate to the clinical phenotype. So in my case, cell and unrelated myopathy, we have both fish and 
mice that are phenotypically completely normal as far as we can tell, and yet they carry the same mutations that lead to pa weakness in human patients. So I'll let other people expand or give their own answers. And I'll, I'll just chime in and say that um, it's, a, it's an interesting question because um, we obviously want as much information as possible. And I think there's a lot of ways to get it. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot at this symposium is so uh, you can harness pleiotropia, which is what our lab tried to do and sort of you know, find different genes that are in a pathway from different diseases that might seem unrelated. And, and um, I think every sort of screening technology gives us information on certain things. And transcriptional screens are really good for transcription factors. So it was like sort of no surprise that like the top hits were KLF2 or other transcription factors. But it wouldn't be as good for other types of diseases that might not be driven by that mechanism. So then maybe DEPMAP is more relevant for that. Or cell painting might, might you know, identify totally different kinds of co-regulated gene networks. Um, and so I feel like we're just scratching the surface. I feel like every time we do one of these sort of mapping assays, we find different information. And people often ask me, well, you did it in you know, static cells. Should you activate the cells? Should you use cells that are co-cultured? And I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, we should do it all. Um, so it just gets overwhelming. So how do you prioritize, I think, is often yeah. the, the challenge. We've been thinking a lot about how to prioritize, and it's a complicated question. I don't think we have a hammer and you know, everything looks like a nail. It, it's very complicated because diseases like a spinal muscular atrophy, we actually don't know how it works. We don't know what the gene does. But we have a cure, I mean, like, we have a very effective treatments. I shouldn't say a cure, but a very effective treatment for this disease because it turns out there was a second gene you could turn on. So I think you have to be really flexible and thoughtful about multiple factors about what makes a disease ready for development of therapeutics. And so as a part of this, Maya Chopra, who's sitting there, and some parts of our team have worked on a, a way of um, a framework for how to prioritize diseases, looking at the genetics and the biology. And the mechanism, obviously, is very, very important. But having enough uh, information about the patients and the natural history is equally important because you could have the best treatment but because you have, but you have no idea about how this disease develops or when to intervene. It's really not very helpful. You have to understand, I think, which cells you have to express the gene in, et cetera. You need to understand the timing of the expression. You have to understand the dosing effect, whether too much could be harmful or too little could be harmful. So there are a lot of bio, sort of uh, multiple uh, components that go into that. I would urge you to take a look at this paper by Maya Chopra that came out on gene targets. It's the name of the um, title of the paper. That gives us you know, some variables we think are really important based on our experience at, at, at Boston Children's. I think in the realm of um, metabolomics, uh, obviously we're able to generate extremely rich sort of biochemical signatures of disease states or the disease spectrum. Uh, and then the question is, how do you prioritize amongst the pathways that are uh, seemingly perturbed? And so we're, we're investing a lot uh, intellectually as well as uh, in tool development in evaluating causality. Um, because when you see altered metabolites, I mean, some of those are actually in the causal path towards pathogenesis. Right? Some of them are just epiphenomenon. Uh, and others are secondary to the disease state. And so we're trying to develop a number of uh, uh, frameworks with which to systematically evaluate causality. So as an example, one is the use of metabolite QTLs. So if you have strong genetic instruments that influence variation in metabolites, you know, under certain assumptions, you can begin to evaluate the causality of a closely related metabolite that's linked uh, to that particular QTL. So that's one strategy that can sometimes work. And then we also like experimental approaches. And so to some extent, in the same way that you can knock out a gene, we're trying to develop genetic tools with which to knock out metabolites as well, and then directly evaluate what is the impact of perturbing a metabolite. And so I think causality is super important because we're gonna see lots of kinase pathways that are activated, metabolic programs that are activated, uh, but I think in a lot of these physiological systems, um, I mean, sometimes uh, programs uh, that you see being turned on are both adaptive and maladaptive, depending on what the context is. Hi there. Um, thanks so much to all of you. Um, Matt Sampson from Nephrology at Children's. Vamsi, it segues on what you just talked about. This, this, this metabolomic 
panel, I can see being very useful for what you just said. I guess I'm wondering like, you know, uh, where you think it's most valuable. I think it's probably valuable in many ways. You just talked about causality, but at the same time, you also talked about using signatures for diagnosis, but also, hey, a lot of patients are diagnosed already, one of what's going to happen. Can, it, can you ima imagine also using it as sort of like a mitochondrial checkup amongst those who have a known problem that's just a biomarker that suggests a, a different treatment as well, or would it be just as useful? Or what happens when you take a bunch of people at Children's who have a su suspected well, with muscle weakness or lactic acidosis or nothing with reactive oxygen species, nothing about that, but uh, <laughs> who have, have some condition. And if you did that panel, you might see alterations that might be secondary. So how do you sort that all out in terms of all the use cases and platforms that we're all thinking about? Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a great um, question. I mean, in the same way that we have you know, liver function tests and kidney function tests, right? I mean, our, our vision is ultimately to come up with an organelle function test, if you will. And you can imagine if, if, if it's multiplexed, it may read out different aspects in the same way that liver function tests will read out biosynthetic function as well as detoxification. Having a rich panel, right, will allow us to classify these different diseases, but also could provide readouts of different aspects of this organelle's function and maybe even insights into the organ in which that pathology may be arising. And so we think there could be lots of uses for uh, these types of mitochondrial function tests. That's what we affectionately call them uh, in our laboratory. But I think before we can get there, we need to have something like a, a metamito project where we can look at not just the two genetically defined subsets that I described today, but we'd love to look at more and even have some outgroups as well and really create a biochemical space in which we can begin to make some of these connections. And as you point out, having these measurements prospectively is also super, super valuable. Right. Thank you. Jeff, can I ask one other question? For Raj, your question, you talked about um, using ProturbSeq three years, lots of different work readouts to look at uh, co-regulation networks and it's really elegant and getting at causality. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm sure you've thought about like the correlation between that and doing like you know, single cell RNA seq plus ATAC seq, or doing that in the same cell type, where you can make more specific gene enhancer maps. How do yeah. how do those two work together, complementarily, independently, or yeah. is, you know? Yeah, no, great question. Something you know that we thought about at the beginning. Um, so they're complementary for sure, right? So one would be like a TAC seq plus single cell RNA seq in a large population, right? So what's the N you would need for that? Like, would you need 500 people to find like single cell EQTLs and single cell chromatin accessibility QTLs. Would you need a thousand? Would you need five thousand? We don't know. We don't know the power, um, and so you'd have to collect samples prospectively. And you know we're probably a ways away from that. Like the biobanks just don't exist. Um, so perturbseq is almost like a stopgap, right? Like we, you know, just a cultured immortalized cell line mm -hmm. are able to reproduce some of that. Right. and make the same maps. Yeah, we can talk more. I guess I'm reading about you know, doing single cell, multi-ohm ATAC and RNA-seq from the same cell type. People tell me that all of a sudden the, the unit of measure for power is the cell, individual cell, not the number of samples. So I think it'll just be interesting moving forward. Sure. I'm just trying to avoid doing perturbseq for three years versus having kidney <laughs> tissue and doing single cell multi -ohm. Right, right. It's yeah, an interesting area. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Perturbseq's nice because you have control in the system. So Absolutely. You at some put point in stimuli you have, and things like that. At some point, yeah. Thank yeah. you. I think I'm going to invite us to take the conversation to the break. I want to thank all of our speakers. Um, we're going to take the next 10 minutes to go grab coffee. Um, I will ask that the participants for the remaining sessions come up so that we can give you a mic. Um, and we'll see you back um, at 2.52. Welcome back. OK, we're going to get started now. Welcome to our session on pa Patients as Partners, Portals, Biomarkers, and Patient Recruitment. So taking a, a little bit of a different look this afternoon. Um, so our first session is actually Eric Minical is going to present, and then so Sonia Vlab is going to also join us on the Q&A panel. Um, but Eric and Sonia are assistant professors at um, Harvard Medical School and MGH, and also at the Broad, where they co-lead a lab to develop preventative drugs for prion disease. Um, they 
had their introduction to rare disease, as, as many of you know from the stories they've shared in the media, um, first as a family member when Sonia's mother um, got unexpectedly ill and then passed away, and then when Sonia found out she also carries the pathogenic variant. And then that really changed the course of their lives in, in a way that echoes back to what Ted Love said in his story of really bringing patients to the table. And to, they, they brought, they sort of brought the table, right? So they, they changed the course of their lives. Um, they retrained and got PhDs at Harvard Medical School um, in working with various groups here, including Daniel MacArthur and, and Stuart Schreiber, um, and then have worked to develop, um, really organize the patient population to be able to participate in trials when they're ready to figure out biomarkers so trials could be designed and, and know what to look at. Um, and then finally, their end goal is to develop drugs to lower the PRP levels to try to prevent the onset of prion disease. And so they, they've done this all while really communicating their science through their research, through the media, um, through participating at the White House often and, and sharing the message with larger communities. And so today, Eric is gonna be telling us about the role of biomarkers and rare disease drug development. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much, Anne, for that really kind introduction. You saved me a lot of time telling our story. Um, yeah, so we're, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's about 11 years on now. Um, I was an engineer, Sonia was a lawyer when we got her genetic test report. Um, and we're now blessed to have this amazing community at Broad in which to do our work. Um, and um, I, I will reference again, as one other speaker did, the um, uh, subtitle of today's session, the escaping, uh, Achieving Escape Velocity. Um, I looked up and third cosmic velocity to get out of the solar system is 42 kilometers per second. And the nearest star is about four E13 kilometers away. So that's a 28,000 year journey. So if you're pointed in the right, right, right direction and you reach escape velocity, you'll get there. But will it be soon enough for you and your loved ones? And, and that it perfectly reflects the jeopardy that we have, right? So in these 11 years, um, we have deeply validated a therapeutic hypothesis, developed biomarkers and managed to get pharma interested in this. And so now to some extent, the project of curing prion disease has a momentum of its own, but the jeopardy is, will it be soon enough? And in particular, so Sonia's 39, average age of onset for her disease is 52 with a huge variance around that, so we don't really know. Um, but I think maybe the biggest piece of jeopardy is, will therapy get to pre-symptomatic patients in time? And so um, just a moment ago up there um, was the sentence, human potential rescued from disease. And I think it's very easy for pharma to fall into a pattern of treating symptomatic patients and you know, making a patient who is sick and would have died soon simply be sick for longer. And our goal is to preserve healthy brains intact, um, which makes it a much, a much more difficult journey. And so as I talk about biomarkers today, keep that in mind that we're sort of shooting for the stars and um, every disease is different and not every disease needs to have biomarkers play such a critical role as they might for us. Um, but I do think that in some larger sense, what we're trying to achieve in this room, everyone's got the same goal, which is um, you know, to find drugs that are safe and effective, gosh darn it, and most of them aren't. Um, so only about one in 10 things that enter phase one gets to approval. And some of the, a lot of that is off-target talks. A lot of that is wrong therapeutic hypothesis in the first place. But some of it is, did you treat the you know, right patient with the right drug at the right time? And I think that's where biomarkers can help. Um, FDA has this um, BEST glossary, which categorizes biomarkers into seven groups. I, I don't like this categorization because I find it kind of zoigmatic. It's a little bit like saying, you know, we analyzed samples from uh, Massachusetts, China, Africa, healthcare workers, and women over 40. Um, sort of this overlapping and slicing on different axes. So the way that I'm gonna categorize biomarkers is two different, two different orthogonal categorizations. One is what role does it play in your clinical trial or your development program? And the other is what biology is it measuring? And I'll go through three examples and talk about um, what biomarkers might fill this role in, in our project of, of developing drug for prion disease. So the first is patient selection biomarkers. So this is who is eligible for your trial. And I'll spend the least time on this because I think probably most people in this room think about rare disease and think about genetically defined rare disease. And so you were sort of born in this mindset of we have a molecular definition of who we want to treat. Um, uh, and it's not always genetic, right? Sometimes it's protein markers or imaging. Um, 
But um, the amazing thing to realize is that this isn't most pharma R&D, right? So um, most therapies that go into clinical trials are not genetically targeted. Those that are um, targeted at you know, a root genetic cause of disease have a higher success rate, but they're, they're really a pretty small minority. Um, and uh, this nice analysis from Andrew Lowe's lab at MIT found that only 6% of phase one programs had any molecular biomarker for patient selection. So um, what was the term used earlier was uh, you know, clinical diagnosis, right? Just looking at the patient's phenotype, naming that as a disease, and then thinking that that's enough information on which to treat it. Hopefully everyone in this room is on the page that we want a molecular definition of what the disease is, and then we wanna go after that um, with a therapy that is molecularly targeted. Um, not surprising that programs with those molecular biomarkers had an increased success rate. So in, in prion disease, um, you know, this disease is caused by post-translational misfolding of prion proteins. So the blue thing we all have in our brains, everyone in this room, every mammal, um, the misfolded thing is what causes disease. This is a pure gain of function disease. The knockout is tolerated. So our goal is to non-allele specifically lower the amount of that protein. Um, we can think about two patient populations, patients who are already sick and have the misfolded form. We detect that misfolded form in their spinal fluid with an in vitro seeding assay. Um, Pre-symptomatic patients we identify based on just a genetic test. Um, easy enough, right? We've found that there's actually, even those two things predated us, there's actually still a ton of work to do. Um, and some of it around, you know, sort of pre-symptomatic in particular, um, it's one thing to identify a patient um, who has a mutation, but to actually turn that into a trial-ready population by understanding their lifetime risk, their age of onset, their natural history, and how do we find and enroll those patients, um, segueing into the next talk. Um, so I, I won't spend any more time on patient selection, and I wanna to pivot to pharmacodynamic biomarkers. So this is, we designed this drug to, you know, let's say, inhibit this enzyme, or cause inclusion of this exon in a gene, et cetera. How do we tell if it's actually doing that job we designed it to do in vivo in a human being? So for us, our goal is to lower brain prion protein, and the proposed pharmacodynamic or PD biomarker is measuring that protein in spinal fluid. And compared to a lot of rare diseases, we were exceptionally lucky. So in 2016, when we first started thinking about this, you could go on VWR and buy off the shelf uh, uh, an ELISA kit for measuring PRP in CSF. Um, so problem solved, right? It turns out there was actually a ton of work to do and a huge focus of our lab over seven years and not done yet is understanding this biomarker better. And so I'll just show a few slides of things that we realized we had to do. So one is understand the pre-analytical variables, things you do um, in the process of you know, trying to run an ELISA or other assay on your sample um, that affect the readout you get. And it turns out our protein is super sticky. Every time it touches polypropylene, you lose half of it. Um, so being exquisitely uniform about how you handle samples and adding detergent mitigates that. When we launched a cohort study at Mass General and brought in uh, people at risk, measured their spinal fluid, um, PRP at uh, different lumbar punctures performed two to four months apart, we now saw exquisitely reproducible levels in each person over time. So we have a steady baseline and that's maintained out to um, three plus years now in the individuals we've continued to follow. Um, the other question was, uh, so you get this as tau is sort of the poster child for this. If you have different isoforms, different phosphorylation states, which one is the one that matters for your disease and are you measuring the right thing? Um, so we worked with proteomics platform and found that of six peptides spanning this protein, all of them behave the same way. So good, we have a easier situation, it's one analyte. Any way, any way we measure it, we get the same answer. Um, that commercial ELISA kit was only human, so now we made an assay that's reactive across preclinical species we care about. We then use that to go back and validate empirically that CSF is a valid sampling compartment for brain, right? What we really care about is brain. We're not gonna do brain biopsy. We wanna measure in spinal fluid. Does that reflect brain? We now have that evidence in monkey, hamster, and in rat. Um, and finally, FDA actually asked us to, ask, uh, to figure out does that CSF biomarker reflect the cell types that we care about? And so we did a, study, a single cell sequencing study in ASO treated brain tissue and were able to show that indeed neurons are knocked down by an ASO um, equal or even deeper than the bulk tissue. So we think that the CSF is probably not gonna lie about neurons, which are the cell type we care about in prion disease. Um, but this is just one modality, right? The answer could be different for any other drug that you throw in there. Um, so seven years later, we've 
you know, I think satisfactorily addressed most of these problems, um, but we're still not there. These assays, you know, to use in a clinical trial, it's probably going to have to be v GLP validated and done at a CRO at a standard of documentation that, you know, is just not realistic to implement in an academic lab. Um, I, I worry that all of that sounds intimidating for people who are working on like N of ones and things where the whole battle is just to get, you know, just to get any drug candidate out there. Um, and I want to note that there is this concept in FDA parlance of fit for purpose, right? So if you're using the biomarker to tell yourself, do you think that this is working? Um, that's a different standard than if you want FDA to accept that biomarker readout as, you know, the basis for dose escalation, the basis for approval, heaven forbid, which is exactly what we want to do. Um, so we don't have time to treat pre-symptomatic people and then follow them so long to show that their onset is delayed. Um, and so the idea is, could pharmacodynamic biomarker alone be enough for accelerated approval? Um, Prion disease easily checks all the boxes for accelerated approval. The question really came down to, biologically, is PRP so clearly central to prion disease that just showing you lowered it is enough to merit this provisional approval? And we were delighted in a meeting with FDA that at the 10,000 foot zoom level, they said, yes, we agree that that biology is strong enough and the case for prevention in this disease is strong enough. Um, but of course, they give us a ton of homework, including all the bullets that I showed you on a few slides ago, um, and, and lots more yet to do. Um, so the final thing that I'll talk about is disease biomarkers. And I, I think for many people, when they think of biomarker, this is the only kind of biomarker they imagine. So for example, the stuff that Vamsi Muto was talking about, I think would, would qualify as disease biomarkers. Um, these are things that measure the severity or the progression of a disease. What is the pathological state? Um, and these can be used in a variety of ways. And I'll just give two examples from prion disease. So again, we can measure the presence of misfolded prion seeds in spinal fluid. We can also measure neurofilament, this nonspecific neurodegeneration biomarker. And these were reasonably well established in symptomatic patients, but we didn't have any data in pre-symptomatic patients. And so six years ago, we launched this cohort study at Mass General. We're flying mutation carriers in from around the country to donate blood and spinal fluid. Um, and one thing we've learned is that people can become uh, can develop detectable misfolded prion seeding activity in their CSF before onset. And there is now some evidence that that predicts a relatively quick conversion to disease after that's detected. Um, there's also now some evidence that NFL begins to rise before onset, but it's proportional to how rapidly progressive a mutation you have. So wide window for slowly progressive mutations, but for rapid mutations, which is most patients, um, we have a very, very narrow window in which to try to catch people. So I actually think we should not be using these as patient selection markers for pre-symptomatic trials. I think we should treat everyone who has a mutation um, above a certain age. And I'll give you four reasons. One is we do the most good in animal models. We triple their survival um, when we treat early. And we do a much smaller benefit when we treat late. Um, also, rt quick doesn't work for every mutation. NFL actually has pretty poor sensitivity and specificity at the pre-symptomatic stage. Um, and most of all, it's already a rare disease. Please don't limit our trials to the you know, five or 10% of people who actually have a detectable prodromal marker. Um, but I think that all of this stuff is nonetheless useful because we could find ourselves in a situation where there's a drug with sufficient risk or at least perceived risk that it's tested first in symptomatic patients and you wouldn't yet contemplate giving it for years and years chronically to someone who's perfectly healthy today like Sonia. But if you saw somebody who's now had prion seeds in their CSF or their NFL had spiked, would that be enough basis to go file an expanded access IND and see if you could treat that patient earlier? Um, so I think there is still potentially a use case for these. Um, the other question is, will these be endpoints in symptomatic trials? I would argue they shouldn't be. I think this is a disease where we can get a rapid clinical readout in patients who are already sick, and we shouldn't accept a biomarker as a substitute for that. Um, but there's certainly arguments on both sides, and this is a debate that everyone in our field will continue to have. Um, so, you know, I think we all have this same goal of ideally there's a genetic, uh, there's, a, there's a molecular marker that tells you what disease is this, and then you're treating with something against the root molecular cause of disease. And you want to know quickly, is the drug doing its job at the molecular level? Um, so I think these biomarkers can be critical at every step. Um, prion protein illustrates that even where you already have tools to measure that biomarker, there can be a ton of work to do. But anything is better than nothing. It's always good if you can have some way to measure the effect of your drug or the progression of your disease, even if it's not yet at a standard FDA would accept. 
That's all. Uh, excellent. So uh, we'll save the questions for the end, but I'm uh, going to introduce uh, two speakers um, that I have to say I am uh, very much honored to work with closely at the Broad. Uh, so the first is uh, Claire Bernard, who is currently the head of the Data Sciences Platform. Uh, she started off her training as uh, a particle physicist, uh, which actually I've often told her uh, that that's not such an unusual background for a Brody, uh, although she actually came here in a somewhat unusual role for a physicist, which was um, to run the product management team in the DSP, and then a few years later took it over. Uh, then also there's Monica Yanamandala, uh, who is a physician, uh, trained at uh, Chicago as an undergrad and then UCLA, did her a residency and uh, then fellowship in cardiology at the Brigham. Uh, and the two of them have been doing a lot of efforts around uh, building up software to support uh, patient partnered research. And so I'll have them uh, come and talk about that now. So thank you. Hey, um, great to be here. So as Anthony said, I'm Claire Bernard. Um, I lead the data sciences platform at the Broad. Um, and this will be a diff slightly different kind of talk because it, um, we're a software group. Um, so we build software that supports um, a lot of scientific research like some of the projects that you've heard about today. Um, Anthony kind of stole my thunder here, but uh, my, my background was, was originally in particle physics. Um, I worked on, a lot of you probably know CERN. It's the home of the Large Hadron Collider, which is where the Higgs was discovered. Um, so that's where I did my PhD. Um, obviously very different science, but some, some similarities in terms of it being kind of very big science that re requires very large scale collaboration. Um, I went from there into, into software and then really missed science. And um, so Anthony recruited me to the Broad about five years ago. And I like to start by talking about myself because I think it helps explain a little bit about, about my group, the data sciences platform. Um, because my background is very typical of a lot of the people in the group, um, where a lot of the people in the group um, very interested in science, but come from kind of commercial tech backgrounds. Um, almost everyone worked either at a software startup or a company like Google or Facebook, um, and then came to Broad because we care about science and we care about the mission. So it's a, it's a really kind of mission-oriented group. Um, it's also a group that gets really excited about very large-scale data engineering problems. Um, so this slide is probably probably familiar to, to many of you. This is kind of describing the growth in genomic data um, generated at Broad. Um, and, and so it's you know, important to note, not only do we generate a huge amount of data here, but the rate that we generate that data is increasing exponentially. Um, and when the DSP was founded eight years ago, um, all of this data was managed kind of in on-prem data centers. And it's, um, the, the growth of, of data generation here, it's doubling every eight months. Um, to put that into perspective, apps like WhatsApp and Facebook um, at their peak doubled their data every six months. Um, so this is really like enormous scale, scale of data. Um, it's really difficult to double the size of your on-prem data center every eight months. Um, and so this kind of, kind of catalyzed the, the need to move to the cloud, um, which was one of the reasons for creating, creating our org. Um, the other thing that we noticed as we started this transition to the cloud was that this was an opportunity to, to rethink how, um, how we do data sharing. So genomics has always been, kind of since the Human Genome Project, has been really good about data sharing, um, but the way we've operationalized it hasn't been so good. Um, it's typically been operationalized by putting the data on a server somewhere, pointing everyone to that server, and telling them to download it. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of issues with that. Um, one is that it costs a lot, because it means we end up storing the data many, many, many times. Um, the other is this is really sensitive data. And when you're storing the data in all these different places and having grad students download it to their laptops, and um, then you, you very quickly run into problems where you don't really know who's doing what with the data. Um, and, and that's problematic and something that you know, the NIH is increasingly concerned about. Um, and so, so these were kind of the core, the core problems that we, that we set out to solve. Um, so what is the DSP? We're a group of about 230 people, mostly software software developers, um, and we create software and have capabilities that span the life cycle of biomedical research from patients to data generators to researchers. And there's three capabilities in particular that I want to um, talk about today that are particularly relevant here. Um, one is the Terra platform, um, uh, which is the, our main effort, the, a software platform that we work on for, for managing and processing all of this data. Um, the second is machine learning methods, and then the third that Monica is going to talk about is technologies around patient engagement. 
So Terra is, um, as I said, you know, by far our largest effort. Um, and it's, it's the platform for managing, processing, storing, sharing, and analyzing biomedical data. Um, and the goal of this platform, um, it's developed in collaboration with Verily and Microsoft, um, which is a huge, huge opportunity because it, it gives us much larger reach. And the goal here is really not just to create a software product, um, but to create an ecosystem and connect patients and data generators and researchers across academia, industry, and healthcare systems. Um, can kind of create this environment for large-scale data sharing and collaboration. Um, Terra is today um, one of the largest repositories for, for public data um, and hosts data um, from you know, the All of Us Research Program, the Human Cell Atlas Project, was also used widely by public health labs during the pandemic, um, both um, all across the US as well internationally for processing and sharing um, and sharing data that was generated locally around COVID sequencing. Um, so the, the second capability that I want to that I want to talk about is machine learning methods. Um, so our methods team, the the first product and kind of the most widely known product that they developed is is GATK, um, which is the set of methods used to process to do secondary analysis and process data coming off of sequencers. Um, that that has over 85,000 users and has really become an industry standard. Um, but increasingly, this team is also doing a lot of work in functional genomics, um, as well as in clinical data, um, which is also particularly important for, for some of the work that we do on, on um, patient engagement. Um, so for example, a lot of the, the clinical data that we get from patients comes in the form of you know, hundreds of pages of an unstructured PDF. Um, really difficult to to pull out the useful data, the useful information from from that data at scale. Um, and so we have a team here that focuses on being able to ex extract that data, working with imaging data as well as those just unstructured hundreds of pages, using very modern machine learning and LLMs, um, and turning that into something um, something that we can that's much easier to do research on and and drive insights. So with that, I'll turn it over to Monica, who will talk more specifically about the, the patient engagement piece. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone, uh, for having me. I also didn't know that Anthony uh, was going to introduce us, so I have a little slide about me. Um, I'm a cardiologist by training. Um, I recently uh, finished my general cardiology fellowship. Um, and I included this picture of my son with my stethoscope, one, because there aren't great photos of doctors rounding in hospitals. It's, dimly lit corridors, it doesn't look great. Um, but two, to also emphasize kind of why we're all here or, you know, to, to think about our families, our, our reasons for doing our research and um, to, you know, propel forward with finding treatments and therapies. Um, so a little bit of uh, background. Before I came to the Broad, I'd done uh, many different projects in uh, basic science labs, clinical research. Um, I worked with this wonderful group of mentors uh, shown here, um, and they really taught me the foundations of what it means to conduct this different type of research. Um, and I realized through that process that technology is really critical in accelerating what it means to uh, enable scientific discoveries. Um, and I also learned about myself that I really wanted to be the person building the tool rather than using the tool. Um, and then the second part of me is you'll often find me at the bedside talking with people um, and really listening to their stories. And, and throughout my medical training, uh, I was part of a program called Narrative Medicine. And so what that is, is that you really engage deeply with patients and you try to understand what are their motivations, what are their reasons for being there in front of you in clinic, um, and, and what do they need? Not just, am I trying to check off a box in terms of colonoscopy, colonoscopy screening, but why are they here? Um, and so when you think about um, you know, what we need in terms of clinical research, the thing that we um, often miss is those rich patient stories. And patients bring a lot to the table. Uh, they bring their experiences, which translates to um, uh, exposures, it translates to symptoms, it translates to phenotypes. Um, and so to really think about bringing both technology and patient stories together um, is ultimately what motivated me to join the DSP and um, Anthony and Claire. Um, Big middle button, okay. <laughs> um, so um, a new model for clinical research. So, um, you know, Claire talked about how we've optimized for scale and computational tools, um, but there's really many situations we're still missing the right type of patient 
or um, uh, you know, don't have enough patients or the right information to really study. Um, and this is especially true for rare diseases. Um, so how can we overcome this challenge? Um, and we really believe that going directly to patients is, is key. Um, so on the left here is the traditional route, which is uh, how most clinical research studies are done. You have a group of patients, um, often recruited at physical sites, um, and then you collect data and you perform research. Um, what we're doing is, is different. So we're actually thinking of recruiting patients on the web, on the platform, um, and uh, thereby uh, being able to um, uh, meet people where they are. Um, and really, there's two main things that I think make this possible. Um, the first is the technology to really connect with people wherever they are. And two is the Cures Act of 2016. So what the Cures Act did is that it mandated that health exchanges um, give uh, people the ability to share data. And so it really gave information about the medical record back into the patient's hands and let them control it. And we take advantage of both those things. So um, there's really a lot that's great about this model, and I think we're continuously learning more. Um, but really, rare diseases are spread across the country. There's no one medical center uh, that has enough patients with one rare disease. Um, it's more scalable. So when you don't have to deal with the physical inf infrastructure of a site, um, you can um, uh, more easily uh, recruit patients. Um, it lowers the cost. You're not managing any brick and mortar sites. Um, and uh, really, you're able to recruit more diverse populations. So, uh, you know, it, we're not tied to any one medical center. You can recruit across the country. Um, and CMI has done a lot of great work in publishing some of this data about where they've recruited patients. And often, when you look at most maps, it's, you know, kind of sporadically at the coast. And really, when you look at CMI's map, it's across the entire country. Uh, so really exciting. Um, and then there's the, you know, really treating patients as partners um, and thinking about, you know, including patients throughout the study design, including them um, in uh, the process of designing the study because they know what matters to them. They know what outcomes matter to them. Um, so including them in the process. So when you're designing your study, when you're powering your study, you know what you're looking for and you know, um, you know, how many uh, patients you need to recruit. Um, and then uh, ultimately, um, you, you know, uh, as we do this, we really realize that we can have greater impact uh, by working with the disease foundations, um, treating uh, patients uh, as partners. And um, uh, what we're trying to do with our technology platform is really to try and lower the barrier um, so that uh, uh, it's easier for patient groups and researchers to launch these studies. Um, and one really exciting thing that we didn't um, realize at first is actually this ability for not only researchers to initiate the studies, but also for patients to initiate the studies. So um, in some of the studies that I'll talk about, we've actually worked directly with the patient foundation groups to start the study um, and then recognize the, the impact and, and uh, the benefit to researchers. So this slide goes over basically a standard workflow um, for a typical study. Um, participants are recruited through a, a web-based interface. Um, they can come on uh, and on their participant dashboard, they can e-consent um, and uh, release medical information and surveys, complete surveys. Um, and then ultimately, they have a spit kit or um, that's sent to their home so they can return at home uh, genetic testing. Some of our studies have also uh, used uh, uh, um, uh, blood samples uh, where they'll you know, go to a local lab um, to be able to um, have samples uh, banked for, for biomarkers. Um, we will uh, talk a little bit about clinical data collected by DataVan. That's an, a new process, um, and we're working on integrating uh, imaging data into the platform as well. And so all that data uh, is collected and uh, presented on Terra, like uh, Claire talked about, and is available for, for researchers to use. Uh, so a little bit about DataVan. Um, so uh, we really believe it's important to, to our future success in, in producing some of these rich uh, clinical databases. Um, so on the left, we uh, is a kind of schematic that I made, um, but we all know that healthcare is fragmented. So in one sick visit to the e, uh, you know, ER, for example, you might run into all of these different systems. You'll run into the provider, 
the medical system, you'll run into any radiology that you do, uh, prescriptions, uh, the payer, laboratory, and all of those use different systems and all of that is very fragmented. Now, um, when you think about the average patient with a rare disease, it takes seven years to get diagnosed um, and often uh, people will see eight plus physicians before getting a diagnosis. And those physicians are often not at the same medical center. So imagine you're the clinical research coordinator tasked with gathering all that information, right? Like that's incredibly difficult. Um, and so what we're trying to do is solve for that problem. And so Datavant really, uh, we believe, has the potential to transform that. It's a technology company that brings together uh, the ability to tokenize patients, so essentially generate a code uh, that you can tag a, a person with and really attach all their medical data together. Um, and it combines that with an on-the-ground ability to uh, gather medical records at physical locations. And so uh, it can also chase down those tough to reach medical records. Um, and it brings all that data together and we think ultimately has that potential to create a complete medical record. Um, so we've had some really you know, exciting, meaningful impact um, over the past five years. Um, we've run over 20 studies to date, um, and some of them have had really amazing impact. So um, uh, with uh, Heidi Rehm and um, Anne, uh, you know, the Rare Genomes Project, there has been 139 patients, I'm sure more now, um, where um, uh, patients who didn't have a known diagnosis when they came into the study left with a real um, definitive diagnosis, which we know makes a huge impact for patients. Um, uh, uh, Eric and Sonia have talked about uh, the prion uh, registry and um, uh, that existence of that registry uh, led to Ionis Pharmaceuticals um, uh, uh, supporting the, the first ever uh, uh, clinical trial in uh, prion disease. Um, and I won't steal Tim Yu's thunder um, about talking about uh, ataxia telangiectasia, but uh, uh, our global AT family fund, uh, that platform uh, led to the, the data that ultimately um, Tim used. So um, I'll conclude essentially by talking about where we're looking to in the future. So we've had some great successes. Uh, we've been really excited. Um, and the challenge um, is that we're a technology company, right? And so we need to figure out how can we scale something that is uh, pretty unique. Each study is different. Um, recruitment is different. Uh, patient engagement is different. Um, so really thinking about scalability is key. Um, in terms of making sure that we don't break the technology platform, that we actually have the capability of growing and not creating um, uh, too many challenges with the, the um, tech. Um, cost, um, so anywhere from, I would say, five to maybe 15 engineers have worked on the platform at any given time. Um, and so how do we maintain and, uh, the platform while uh, uh, reducing costs? Because we know that um, the rare disease community is small. Um, you know, researchers um, may be strapped to, to fund some of these, um, this work. And so how can we think about reducing costs um, um, for, uh, for groups to use the technology? Um, engagement, this is probably my, my most favorite topic, which is, you know, how can we really give back to the disease community? How can we create a patient dashboard that really engages, returns results, gives those meaningful impacts back to patients? Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a mutual road. I think um, more engagement will actually lead to better science. Um, and then novel phenotypes. Can we think about the technology that we have, um, you know, Many of us in the audience are, are wearing Apple watches. We use Fitbits. Um, you know, we track all sorts of data constantly. You know, how can we integrate some of that information um, to, to inform our clinical research? Um, and finally, I want to just highlight the, the partnership with the newly formed research hub uh, with Count Me In, uh, Ladder Secures, and uh, the Data Sciences Platform, um, and really what that means. Each, each group is built bringing something unique to the table. So we're bringing technology. Count Me In is bringing their excellent expertise in, in running studies and in patient engagement. And Ladder Secure is, you know, is bringing the, the science and the uh, translation. So we're really excited for the future and um, excited to work with all of you. Great.
Thank you so much, Monica and Claire. Uh, I realized I forgot to actually introduce myself when I started, but sorry, I'm Anna Donaluria. I'm a medical geneticist at Boston Children's Hospital and assistant professor. I'm also an institute member at the Broad, really focused on improving rare disease diagnosis. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce Timothy Yu, who is in the same division as me at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, so this is very fitting. And so Tim um, trained at UCSF originally um, before coming to Boston for his residency at uh, MGH and Brigham and Women's in Neurology um, and leads a lab at Boston Children's Hospital where he's also an associate professor. He initially seems like was very interested in the genetics of neurologic and neurodevelopmental disorders. And it's always interesting to see where sort of one project is like, will be very successful, very interesting and, and kind of lead your lab in a new direction. And it seemed like it all started with like a Facebook message with a group that led him to both help diagnose a difficult to, to diagnose child and then was able to um, start really down this path of N of one therapies and has um, started with, starting with the success story of, of, of developing and reach, having a therapy reach uh, Mila for Milison, um, and is really now trying to take this process and scale it. And so I hope is going to share some of that with us today as we think about how we can further accelerate this. So the title of Tim's talk um, is going to be Actionable Genetic Targets in the Era of Gene Therapies. Thank you, Tim. Thanks so much, Anne. Uh, it's a real pleasure to follow uh, Claire and Monica in this session on uh, patients as partners and uh, on platforms. And uh, I hope that the story that I'll tell will be an example for how these two things can really synergize in a way that's just we're only beginning to tap into. Um, and I think it's actually one of the most exciting things about this whole Ladders to Cures initiative that Anne, and I thank you for, uh, for leading, uh, that uh, the, the chance to continue to find ways to take this multiplication factor and apply it to more and more projects. So um, I'm a neurogeneticist at Boston Children's Hospital, and um, I, I'm going to be talking about, uh, as uh, Anne mentioned, a project, uh, the project that ate my lab. Um, it, it began about four years ago, um, and to set it up and to motivate how this connects to the platforms that you've been hearing about, um, I'd like to first uh, set it up intellectually and cognitively first. Um, my disclosure slide. Um, we, we all appreciate we're living through a pretty remarkable era where there's a growing wave of genetically targeted therapies. Uh, the, the number of submissions to the FDA is rising and rising. The, the number of new modalities and new tools that are uh, being developed um, just continues to astound those of us who've been in the field and sort of waiting for this moment. Well, it's happening now. And one of the cardinal features of many of these modalities is that they are programmable in some instance, that they can be used and reused over and over again very flexibly. Um, and part of that is because most of these, uh, these technologies target at their core the human genome, which is the ultimate program. And as an example of some of these modalities on the right, um, I'm going to be focusing on antisense oligonucleotides, which have been already introduced in this, uh, in this symposium earlier. Um, I think Mustafa talked about the, this remarkable success back in 2018, 2017, 2018 where we discovered that a splice-switching antisense oligonucleotide was a really remarkably effective drug for a devastating pediatric neuro neurogenetic condition called spinal muscular atrophy. Now, this is uh, what that drug looks like in the top left. It's a simple sequence of slightly chemically modified nucleic acid, uh, mostly RNA-like molecules. It's an 18-letter sequence. And it's that 18-letter sequence that conveys its targeting properties that allows it to bind to a specific site in the intron of the SMN2 gene. And what it does to the SMN2 gene is it refurbishes it. Uh, SMN2 is a gene that, was, uh, that arose as an evolutionary duplication uh, of the SMN1 survival and motor neuron gene. And in the process of creating this uh, evolutionary duplication, it actually acquired a mutation that caused exon 7 to be systematically skipped. So despite the fact that it was a duplicated backup copy, uh, it didn't work until clever scientists like Adrian Craner and others um, advanced this program initially in the lab, then through Ionis Pharmaceuticals, to target that uh, evolutionally acquired mutation and to silence its effects and allow exon 7 expression and incorporation to be restored. And it is a beautiful example of how this type of genetic technology can show proof of concept first and then spin off multiple additional 
uh, daughter drugs, such as zolgensma, a viral gene replacement, a small molecule replacement for SMA. And I think it also highlights the, this point that these new technologies, they often require mutation-specific action. And other examples besides this uh, Spinraza example, phosphorin. Phosphomorpholinos, another programmable technology for exon skipping mutations in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Uh, obviously, CRISPR editing for recurrent mutations and sickle cell disease. These are all examples where mutation-specific therapy is uh, both the power and also the requirement for how these work. The challenge, of course, though, what we all recognize in genetics, especially at the Broad, is that because of the, of the allelic architecture of disease, these opportunities are usually the exception, not the rule. And most of the time, mutations are found in only a subset of individuals, or sometimes even private entirely to a single patient. And this is the intriguing space that we've landed ourselves in, intriguing and challenging space that we've landed ourselves in because of a Facebook post, as Anne mentioned, uh, four, four years ago. So I will just, again, to motivate to get to the platform, um, I will provide three brief case examples, uh, some of which I've talked here about before. The first is that patient we met on Facebook um, who uh, had a very devastating condition called Batten disease. And this was a child who was suffering insidious neurologic symptoms for several years. Um, she was diagnosed with an orphan disease for which there were only 70 patients described in the literature. And at that time, there were no existing therapeutic efforts. No commercial company had expressed an interest in this gene. Um, and by nature of her specific mutation, uh, we found that she had an unusual mobile DNA element insertion, a deep intronic mutation in uh, the sixth intron of her gene. And this mobile DNA element insertion created a new splice site that led to trapping of the normal gene product. It also created this therapeutic opportunity, which is to develop a splice-blocking antisense oligonucleotide to block that, uh, to restore that exon trap, or to inhibit the use of that exon trap. And we were able to show that this could be used to functionally restore proper gene expression, to show uh, it could rescue lysosomal function, which is the uh, still somewhat mysterious function of this particular gene product. Um, and it, we were able to use it to justify an intervention in this patient. Um, and the time from meeting the patient to the time of delivery of the first experimental drug was just one year's time, illustrating that this type of technology is very flexible and can be deployed rapidly with appropriate negotiations with the FDA and other parties. Uh, this, um, we're, um, this first effort has led to the FDA now opening a door for continued careful exploration of this type of work. Um, with the release now two years ago of guidances, focusing uh, their first guidances on individualized medicines. Um, and it's narrowly restricted right now to antisense oligonucleotides, but people are really hoping that this will begin to set a stage for what other types of individualized genetic approaches might be coming in the future. And we've been really gratified to see that this uh, effort um, has led to many other folks stepping into the space to, again, tackle this very challenging and intriguing problem. Um, including the FDA and, and the Center for Biologics, Peter Marx especially, who's been on the road talking a lot about the promise of these platform technologies. Uh, the NIH through efforts like the, um, uh, there's a bespoke gene therapy consortium uh, and the PAVE GT project to modularize uh, other efforts for viral gene replacement therapies. Uh, the oligonucleotides uh, therapeutic society and many other institutions have now spun up centers, some of which are devoted solely to trying to advance these types of mutation-specific uh, RNA-based oligotherapies. Another example that uh, will connect to our platform is uh, adapexin. So adapexin is an individualized splice switching ASO we designed for an infant with ataxia telangiectasia. Uh, this uh, newborn had an abnormal screen at birth that led to her being one of the youngest patients ever diagnosed with this condition. Typically, it's not diagnosed until around age five. But she had a mutation that was picked up because of uh, immunologic screening at, at, at birth. And uh, rapid exome sequencing done pretty quickly afterwards showed that one of her mutations, like our Mielsen mutation, created a new splice site. 
And the creation of this new splice site, which in this case was not Intronic, but with an Exxon 53, allowed us to play the same trick as before, to design antisense oligonucleotides against that site, to hide that site, and to allow a restoration of protein function demonstrated in patient cell lines, and FDA permission to treat this patient who now has been uh, going on treatment for almost four years. This uh, is a second example, a third example is shown right here. Uh, this is a five-year-old child who uh, came to our attention actually at the same time as our original Batten patient, referred by the same clinician, Dr. Austin Larson at the University of Colorado. And she had had a history of self-inflicted uh, self injuries noted since birth and progressive vision loss. Uh, her geneticist and her ophthalmologist uh, made a clinical diagnosis of a very rare condition called posterior column ataxia with retinitis pigmentosa. This is two dozen cases uh, published in the, in the world. And it's caused by mutations in, the, in a gene called FLVCR1, which uh, has some similarity to heme transporters, but its actual cellular function is relatively poorly understood. In this particular case, though, their geneticist had reached out to us um, because we were uh, able to assist them in deducing that this also was an unusual mutation, a mobile DNA, DNA element insertion. And it also created an exon trap by creating a new splice site. And Bo Zhao in my lab, a fellow, a very talented research fellow, um, working with Deborah Chiabranda, who originally cloned this gene, showed that uh, this could be rescued uh, with a, a splice blocking antisense oligonucleotide. So you get the idea. And um, this uh, cellular proof of uh, principle uh, was uh, brought in conversations with her Colorado physicians, uh, ethicists, and obviously the family and the patient herself. Um, and in uh, consideration of her neurologic symptoms, which are likely static, but her vision loss, which is progressive, um, there has been sufficient evidence in the literature that intraocular injection of ASOs may be sufficient to forestall uh, inherited retinal diseases. And uh, the FDA just a few months ago granted permission in principle to proceed, uh, and a drug is working its way through the pipeline that we hope may, uh, a trial may start this fall. So as I mentioned, the, the motivating piece of these theme of these three cases is that these are mutation-specific therapies. And each of them involved some unusual story about how they came to attention, both either by social media or happenstance clinical referral or sophisticated genomic analysis. And the question is, how many patients like this are really out there? And how can we more systematically identify them to understand what the scope of this really is? And that's where our work uh, with the DSP actually uh, comes uh, to, to together. And here, we were really fortuitous that we connected with the AT Children's Project. Uh, Brad Margus is the founder of that, and some years prior, he had had the foresight to sit down with Anthony and develop the AT Global uh, Family Data Platform. And this is an international registry of uh, AT patients that uh, includes phenotypic and genotypic data, as well as biosamples contributed here to the sequencing platform. And there was ready and waiting a set, a set of uh, whole genome sequencing data that he had been systematically collecting, along with carefully curated and high quality clinical records for each of these patients with an established diagnosis of AT. And what we realized that the, what this allowed us to, uh, to do was to answer a question prospectively, which you actually don't get that, uh, you don't get that many chances to do in clinical medicine, to have a clean cohort with a very clear clinical diagnosis for which you can prospectively do whole genome sequencing. Because oftentimes, by the time someone gets the whole genome sequencing, they've had single gene testing, panel testing, exome testing. Maybe the clinical diagnosis was unclear. There are all sorts of ascertainment biases that come in. So we took this set and we developed a taxonomy to describe the types of variants that we had seen and that we hypothesized could be seen that could make them amenable to this type of strategy. And I won't go through the details because I think this is not a molecular genetics talk. Um, but in looking at the 235 cases of AT that came through, uh, a pittance by broad standards, but this is a rare disease. Um, and using comprehensive genomic variant calling, using a variety of algorithms to look for uh, structural variants in addition to the vanilla types of variants that we typically see, uh, we were able to show that about 15% of these 
individuals had uh, mutations that we could predict might be treatable via this type of splice modulation approach. Uh, a couple of other uh, features, 70% uh, of the treatable variants were deep intronic and uh, so far away from exons where traditional clinical sequencing could have uncovered them. Another statistic that's not on the slide, 20% of them involved complicated DNA rearrangements like mobile DNA element insertions. So again, you would have missed these cases if not for whole genome sequencing. And I think that the cases that we are seeing right now that are randomly coming to us um, are just at the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, um, as we see justifications for whole genome sequencing uh, roll out and actually we see better, broader adoption. We'll find more and more of these. An important feature that we were really looking for was not just the number, but the distribution. And this is a small data set, 36 amenable patients out of 235, but this is the distribution. And this distribution is really instructive because it tells us that these were not all ends of ones. There were many private mutations, but they're not all ends of ones. And when you run the numbers, there was one recurrent variant that you could treat with one ASO, and we actually developed a, a prototype variant like uh, ASO for it, that could be used to treat a third of them. Five ASOs could cover 70% of the individuals we found. Uh, but then if you were to treat every single one, it would take 15 of these different drugs to be made. And so you see, I think, both promises and challenges in those numbers. But it did allow us to do some practical things. For instance, expanding our initial adapexin trial, targeting one specific point mutation. We identified a second AT mutant, uh, a, a second AT individual with the same mutation in Europe um, who is now receiving experimental treatment. And uh, additional five patients in Turkey where the regulatory challenge is a little bit, well, substantially uh, more uh, difficult but we are working on uh, recruiting them and adding them as well. So uh, where does this all go? I, with respect to this type of mutation-specific and individualized therapy approach, uh, I don't want to discount the, the challenges that are ahead. Safety and efficacy, how does one establish that this is actually efficacious and can be made safe? Uh, what, uh, how do you streamline the process to actually scale it? Um, is this the right chemistry that we'll settle on, are there other chemistries that will be uh, more beneficial down the road? Ethical questions about whether this constitutes care or research, societal questions about how this is, uh, expectations ought to be managed for types like, of uh, efforts like this, and, and how would this be funded and sustainable? Like how do we just define what constitutes a standard for approval uh, and reimbursement? Uh, I think that these are uh, really important questions uh, we don't have the answers to. Um, but key to uh, answering some of these, including the efficacy and safety question, are the ability to build on platforms to recruit patients and to build on platforms to uh, aggregate and create meta trials out of individualized efforts. And I think that's where some of the uh, fantastic resources and talent that exists here could really be bought, brought to bear as one of the examples where we could advance rare disease uh, treatments. Thanks, and I'll stop there. We're gonna have all the speakers come up and sit in the chairs. Hi everybody, I'm Sonia Vallop, as you might have gathered from earlier. Um, so sometimes you see a slide and it's like you've been stabbed. Have you guys ever had that experience? Maybe not, okay. Earlier, um, so you might have seen a slide that um, about the Prion registry that said that Ionis Pharmaceuticals has now taken an ASO in the, in the clinical trials and I just wanted to correct the record a little bit. Um, that's certainly their intention, and we're not there yet. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm gonna lean into my pain on that subject to like reflect with you guys a little bit, because sometimes the time to a clinical trial is a little bit like Uber minutes. You're looking at your phone and you're like, my Uber will be here in three minutes. And then three minutes later, your phone still says that it'll be there in three minutes. And um, I think that's what the years before a clinical trial feel like to me. Um, and that has been really painful. Those of you who have walked ahead of us on this path know this already, um, but those of you who are sort of in a different part of the drug development arc um, might not be there yet. I, I would say that this like 
darkest moment before the dawn, the moment where there is a tremendous amount of promise and still nothing for the patients, is its own special kind of hell. It's like the hardest time, um, not that there was ever an easy time, to hear from patients who are dying today, um, knowing that hopefully in a few years, hopefully we're not that far from being able to give them a different message, but actually in the clinic today for pre disease patients, despite everything I feel has been accomplished in, you know, in the research world over the past 10 plus years, um, the situation is absolutely no different than when my mom was dying in 2010 in the clinic. Um, so um, I guess that all leads me to a sort of uh, reflection and request for like the Ladders to Cures community, I guess, which is, um, you know, sometimes we imagine, and in the world of common disease, lucky them, maybe it's true, that you take something so far and then you get to hand it off. And that has so not been our experience. Every new chapter that opens is a new chapter that we have to learn how to tackle. And this like run up to clinical trials and the asymptotic appro approach to first in human is, is no exception. So I hope that's, despite being less technologically sexy than many of the stages that come before, um, I hope that's a, a phase of the drug development process that we'll learn how to support each other through, I guess. <laughs> so I have a question around thinking about patient registries and you know there's obviously work being done here at the Broad in that regard that Claire and Monia talked about but one of the challenges I've seen in this space for many many years is just a thousand registries and some of them many of them are disease specific pop, you know group specific but then that is not very efficient because everybody's got to build their own same way to do everything. And so I, um, yet I've seen lots of groups try to build the be all, one all, you know, patient registry and not have as much uptake in individual communities, anxiety about someone else, you know, taking control over their community's database. So I wonder if any of you, you know, want to comment on, on what is the best way for us as a community to support patient registries, because in my mind, it's one of the most critical things to finding the population, to, to you know, defining the natural history of disease, to identifying patients for clinical trials, it, it, you know, understanding mechanisms, everything kind of relies on our patient populations and the data that we can collect. And so I'm curious, you know, from your experiences, what is the best way to strategize on this sort of challenging topic? I have a, a thought on why it hasn't been done yet, but I'm not sure that I have an answer on how to fix it, is I think this is one where the vision is easy, but execution is hard. And so if you want to make just add water registries that are really easy for any patient community to just deploy, you have to bring together a lot of things. You, you need to bring together, you know, the ability to make secure and compliant software. This is very sensitive data. You know, it, it's not easy to hit all the regulatory requirements. You have to have scientific vision to be able to understand what data to collect and how it might be used. No end of examples of registries getting built that weren't actually collecting useful data to power or design the trial. You know, you need to be able to capture the hearts and minds of patients and get them to engage and be part of it. And then finally, you need to have a way of supporting it that's aligned with the interests of patients. You know, you can imagine if a company did this and suddenly kind of business model would probably involve selling access to patients or selling their data, both of which pretty quickly start to feel uncomfortable ethically. And so to bring all of those things together, it's hard. And, and I think that's, um, that's been the missing step is, is just execution, not vision to me. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you articulated really well, like one of the biggest challenges that we grapple with all the time is, you know, what, what elements of the registries do you, do you try to build standard so that you can increase the efficiency and lower the cost of creating each new one while still recognizing that each one is necessarily different um, and you need to support support different things with, with each one. I might just also add, it seems that one of, one of the, the natural constituencies, the most natural con constituency, of course, is the, the patients and, and the foundations um, and that they will by and large do what is right 
Um, not that there isn't fragmentation also within those communities too. Uh, but some of the, the natural forces that might keep uh, a registry from merging from another, if it were company sponsored or even sometimes academic sponsored or whatnot, uh, are less likely probably to be true. It's just that patients haven't had the resources and the technology hasn't developed to yet to create the turnkey solution that empowers them to do what they would otherwise do, I think. Yeah, I was interested in learning more about um the N of one and or N of a few treatments that uh, were being described earlier. Um, how is this being paid for now, these treatments? Like, wait, what is the funding mechanism? And do you see a, a future state where payers will um, be willing to pay for an N of one type of treatment? Uh, is there a health economics argument to be made there? N of one or N of few uh, therapies right now? It's a very important question. Thank you. Um, are uh, going through a, a, an awkward early toddler stage uh, where uh, this work is being funded by philanthropies and some research grants. Um, but the scale of work required, the scale of resources required to do these, um, the price tags that, that uh, are charged for this type of work are inherited from the large pharma industry, not from uh, a rare disease or patient-focused uh, type of effort. Um, I think that there are a number of foundations that are uh, working and philanthropists who are working hard to support it during this time. Boston Children's has spent a lot of time thinking hard about this and uh, developing appropriate policies to govern the space. Um, I think we, everyone is looking forward to a time when um, venture capital could be unleashed on this. Uh, but the really critical question is on my slide, what are the standards by which uh, something could be considered approved? What are the models by which the FDA could um, even uh, meet its own statutory requirements for what it's uh, required to do by congressional law for ass assuring that uh, there is substantial evidence of, 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 uh, of benefit? Um, those are currently unanswered questions. And until that, I think we'll be in this awkward phase. Hi, uh, Sarah Morton from Boston Children's Hospital. So I'm a neonatologist and in the newborn medicine division. So. I'm familiar with the idea that many disorders can proceed at un, um, unexpected paces. And so when you think about measuring the success of an intervention, with an N of one, by definition, there's going to not be a reference group to measure by. Most of the kind of conditions you're discussing have very high cost of a non-intervention arm um, if there is benefit. And most of the patient groups you're working with are probably willing to accept a good amount of personal risk um, to be in the treatment arm. So how do you redefine outcomes? Can you kind of use some of the computational tools to model an expected course and compare to that? Do you use biomarkers that were what you qualified for the test? I'd just love to hear, because you're all thinking of different life stages and different disorders. What outcomes do you use? <laughs> uh, I, I can talk a little about Fran disease. I think everybody probably has stuff to say. Um, so one place we can go is natural history controls, and we've put a lot of effort into gathering, obviously in a rare disease, we're not talking about terabytes of data, we're talking about a thousand cases, but like we, we gather what we can, and hopefully that can be some basis. Um, obviously, you know, but randomized control trials are also being discussed in our disease. Um, and I agree that there's a really high patient cost and the pros and cons there are super tricky and we talk about them all the time. But in, in a sort of low end scenario for our disease, I, I do think um, neuronal damage biomarkers can be helpful. And I, I think we have to set our sights, you know, you have to realistically assess the whole spectrum of what you could see. This is a disease that kills people so rapidly that it's very easy to, to fixate on an outcome where if you stabilize someone or see any ounce of, of improvement, that's unprecedented in the history of mammalia for prion disease. But we can't count on that either. Um, so we're definitely scrambling hard. Biomarkers are a huge part of what we think about in that regard. Maybe to add on to uh, what Sonia said, I think that uh, Another point worth making is that there are standards for approval, saying that this drug is ready to be marketed and to be paid for by insurers. And there may be other standards uh, for 
continuation and or continuation of the program or continuation of the strategy that uh, could be enabled, even if you haven't hit the magical endpoint that establishes commercial approval, uh, all of the, the biomarker strategies, the surrogate markers that have been described, uh, doing more with less with wearables that give you repeated longitudinal measurements of the same individual um, in a scientific way, but literally doing more with less um, can give a program reason, maybe not, even if it hasn't achieved the uh, commercially approvable uh, marketing uh, approval, uh, it might uh, keep uh, a program alive to come back another for another bite of the apple in a slightly different form. In the interest of time, can we, I'm really sorry, we're running about 30 minutes behind still, but we will have a more of a chance to discuss during the panel discussion. So I want to thank um, all the speakers and chairs. This was uh, great. And I think it's going to be the seed for the continued conversation in uh, a little bit. So thank you so much. Feel free to stand up from your chair if you're feeling a little sluggish. I know it's the postprandial afternoon slump, but let's just keep powering on because we have some really interesting discussions coming up. Um, Alex. <laughs> Hello, my name's Alex Bergen. I'm an Institute scientist and director at the Center for the Development of Therapeutics here at the Broad Institute. It is my great pleasure to introduce um, the fourth keynote speaker today, Dr. David Meeker. Um, Dr. Meeker is a trained physician scientist, started at the Cleveland Clinic, but then very early joined in 1994 uh, Genzyme and held a variety of roles over two decades. Um, first as medical director, eventually VP of medical affairs, chief operating officer, and eventually CEO. Um, the latest position there at um, Sanofi Genzyme, he led the specialty care unit which was a responsibility for rare diseases, MS, oncology, and immunology franchises. So in that role, um, really instrumental in launching several rare disease therapeutics, aldurazyme, fabrazyme, myozyme. Um, after that, he was then CEO of uh, KSQ Therapeutics. And now, most recently, he is chairman, president, and CEO of Rhythm Pharmaceuticals involved in finding uh, therapeutics for rare genetic or disorders of obesity. And I can't think of anyone more qualified um, to speak about rare disease therapeutics will be very nicely lead into the last panel discussion. Welcome. Thank you, David. Thank you, Alex. And uh, it's a great to be the last speaker um, prior to the panel. Um, where's my... Yeah, yeah. So this, uh, what I'm going to talk about in uh, 20 minutes here, and we're going to blaze through it uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the title slide says uh, April 2018. I actually gave a talk in April 2018 at a symposium that Anna Greco put together, which was very similar to this. It was actually a very similar talk, and I pulled it out, and I looked at it, and I said, nothing's changed. And then I'm thinking back, and I've been in uh, this part of the business. Uh, I wasn't so young when I joined, so you can do the math. But uh, I've been in this part of the business for 30 years, uh, much of it in rare disease and the like. And I will argue the science has progressed in just an unbelievable way. And we can all point to innumerable examples where the practical developmental challenges of getting a drug approved and available globally have not changed. Some things have gotten a little better, some things have gotten worse. So net-net, I'm, I'm not sure we, we've made so much progress. So, um, and the other thing is, I'm not gonna tell you anything you haven't heard already today. I was sitting there listening all day and I'm going, yep, that, that, that. So I'm gonna reinforce a few things, but you're probably not gonna hear any news. So, uh, if you wanna think about developing a drug, developing a disease area, you wanna know what good looks like, it's cystic fibrosis. And I'd really encourage everybody who's in this field is to study that story and study the role of Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and the patient organizations. They were the convener. Um, but it was right from the beginning. I mean, we sort of may have tuned in late um, into the progress that's been made, but CF obviously didn't always look like that. Registries, addition to newborn screening, standardization of care, centers of excellence, clinical trial, driving the research agenda, massive 
course, the money part of it, which a huge part, but again, it was through their success and their power um, as a uh, organization. And uh, we will aggressively fund research until CF stands for Cure Found. And interestingly, in 2019, it may not be a cure, but essentially, if you're one of those fortunate individuals with the susceptible mutation uh, greater than 90%, you can expect to live a normal life now. And that's, uh, again, unbelievable, so I won't call it mission achieved. When I uh, started in the industry, Genzyme 1994, I started to work on cystic fibrosis gene therapy. The gene was cloned in 1989. Everybody thought that this was gonna be the very first gene therapy approved. Um, cystic Fibrosis Foundation played a huge role in convening it. Everybody was turning lungs blue. Uh, we were uh, working with uh, an adenoviral vector because they were easier to manufacture. AAV manufacturing had not been solved and the like. Um, as you know, adenovirus did not succeed, but um, we ran a bunch of trials. We ran seven phase one, two trials over a period of about three or four years. Um, early stages, the famous DNA Recombinant Advisory Committee, the RAC, um, you had to go not only through the FDA, you had to go through that process, and we were going to be spraying genetic material all around, and so how do you prove to the world that you can do that safely, and you didn't know what you didn't know, and so I can tell you there's about nine layers of containment in there, and I'm in that middle of that, uh, trying to make the case um, to, the, uh, to that committee that we could do this in a safe way. So Genzyme exists because we were lucky, and we were lucky because Gaucher, Genzyme no longer exists, Genzyme existed because we were lucky. The first disease, Henry Tamir, as um, probably most of you know, um, it was started uh, around this disease, Gaucher disease. And the reason we were lucky, and there's a wonderful story which we don't have time to tell about how that all evolved, but we were lucky because the efficacy was so dramatic. And not only was it dramatic, is we took a problem and we reversed it. We didn't slow it, we reversed it. And again, as we know in drug development, if you can reverse something, of course, that's the sweet spot and that's where you wanna be. And all during the day, people have referenced situations where how do you show the role of biomarkers and the like. We didn't need a biomarker here, 13 patients. That was all that was in the phase three trial. The dose that was picked, as people famously said, Henry, how did you pick the dose? He said, that was all the drug we had. So he just gave as much as he could to the 13 patients, got the response, and over time, decade, the dose ultimately was figured out and you know people played with it in the real world and the like, but we got to prove. So playing around with this concept of node and how we do leverage some of this stuff, arguably Gaucher disease opened up the lysosomal storage disease node and suddenly everybody looked at it and said, well, what are the other lysosomal enzymes that are defective and substrate accumulates? And so let's quickly knock those off because it worked in Gaucher, we'll just make the enzyme the common technology is available, you could produce it. And so the world was all primed to go. The problem was um, one of the, the next one, the sequence, and Genzyme was uh, one of the companies that was in this race, if you will. So mucoid polysaccharidosis, there's multiple of them. This is MPS1, Emil Caucus, uh, young researcher um, who basically heroically did this, soup to nuts. We've got some other examples here today of working the soup to nuts part of that. That's what he did, so basically, Enzyme, cloned it, produced it, put it through the talk studies, and then fused the first patient. This is the first patient he treated. And Emil, um, <laughs> I got to know him well during this whole period, and um, he was gonna just go to the FDA with a bunch of videos and say, look, look at the video, this works. And yeah, you look at the video and there's no question it works. The problem is you can't write a label on a video. And so then the challenge was from a regulatory standpoint, how do we, run a trial or do something that allows this drug to be put through the FDA with a label. And so um, you can see, again, just on the picture that you know, these individuals um, have restricted motion due to involvement of their, um, their joints and the like, they have cardiac dysfunction and the like. And so uh, we came up with this incredibly sophisticated primary <laughs> endpoint, which was a six minute walk. I'm a pulmonologist by training. It actually had been validated for COPD. Now you can imagine six minute walk, I mean, you couldn't have a more crude, it's effort dependent, there's all kinds of variables and the like, but it was good enough. And since then, the six minute walk has become one of the more commonly employed because the regulator, the FDA in this case, the EMEA as well, other regulatory agencies, 
It measures functionality to a extent. You can describe, you know, you get confidence that there's, you know, and a benefit to the patient that you um, can describe. And so um, it's gone on to be used. So that was great. So we got the second one. Third one, Fabry disease. So here's Fabry disease. Um, this is the Hill family. Um, they live in uh, New Hampshire. They get together, or many of them do. They get together annually for their um, family reunion. That part of the family is afflict afflicted by Fabry disease, X-linked um, disease. <clears throat> and they were just incredible partners in the whole process of, again, trying to develop a therapy for Fabry disease. And you know, motivated family, they got organized, participated in the like. So that partnership was a key part of this. The challenge with Fabry disease is those patients presented children, genetic disease, with pain and tingling in their hands and their feet. Now, when a child presents to a physician with pain and tingling in their feet, I'm pretty sure the first disease they think of is not Fabry disease. The other manifestations, slowly progressive renal disease, cardiac involvement and the like, progresses, develops late and progresses slowly. The average age, we've talked about average time to get diagnosed is six years in a rare disease. The average diagnosis for a patient with Fabry disease, and I think this is probably still true from the time we did the survey, is 29 years. At age at 29, genetically at birth. Why? Because, and one of the quotes I heard this morning from Simon, who was describing his daughter, and what stuck out to me is, we were lucky. And he was lucky, his daughter was lucky, because they went to a physician who'd been to a conference the week before. So that physician was looking at his daughter having just been to a conference and connected the dots. In Fabry disease, there's no dots to connect. And so the challenge of getting into a diagnosis is much, much harder, and you, you have to create this whole level of awareness. So again, this disease had its, all of its own challenges, but how do you get this approved in a clinical trial? Because the progressive renal disease over a long period of time, and there weren't that many patients that we knew of, so running a large trial with slowly progressive was not possible. So we went to biomarkers. What is the substrate? Uh, global triacylceramide builds up. Where does it build up? Multiple organs. So we'll biopsy one of those organs, the kidney, not an easy disease. So we did a phase three trial with kidney biopsies. We had those biopsies looked at by a central reader, and they just scored the amount of GL3 that was in there. And then we argued that that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit, and the drug was approved. But that pathway requires that you get, that you then go on to confirm the clinical benefit in a subsequent process, so that's what we tried to do, and we ran a heroic, and I can tell you it's heroic, it's not going to sound heroic, 89 patients, 89 patients in 29 centers, globally, and when, so we're not talking about, you know, local driving, you know, to all these centers, this is a glo massive global trial, rare disease population, at a time where the drug was approved, and so the patient population rallied around this, and there was patients in the U.S. who could have accessed commercial drug who were willing to go into a placebo-controlled trial to do this. So, again, the willingness of rare disease populations to do what is necessary for the greater good, to me, is just remarkable, and this is not unique to Fabre, it's just, I think, part of the overall world that um, these um, individuals are living in and working in. So this isn't about the data, but the point is we looked at a renal, slowly renal progression and uh, how do I do this? Uh, P-value 0.14. Now that was in our intent to treat. The problem was with all our wisdom, we didn't realize we needed to stratify for proteinuria. If we'd stratified for proteinuria, the p-value would have been 0 0.06 in the 10 to treat, and in the per protocol, it would have been 0 0.034. And again, you just don't know what you don't know, but we probably should have known this. So where does the substrate accumulate? The substrate accumulates in the podocyte, the podocyte being one of the key structural elements in the kidney. It disproportionately accumulates in the podocyte, the podocyte, of course, being when this dysfunctional, proteinuria and the like, and so you could anticipate, in fact, that proteinuria, very good market, we should have you know, stratified for that. We didn't, we didn't prospectively do that. We ended up just in a stalemate with the FDA. They didn't withdraw the drug, we just agreed to kind of go away, and that's where we ended up. Now, multiple years later, we went back and we finally got the, the drug fully approved and the like, but um, again, not easy. Pompe disease, another one on the lysosomal storage disease. This is a birthday party, it's a birthday party in Taiwan. All of those children have Pompe disease. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing about Pompe disease, this is a disease where patients um, present with weakness. Again, fairly nonspecific, and then ultimately get cardiac involvement as well, or 
be early as well. Um, so weakness and not necessarily the first thing you're going to think of, particularly if you're seeing an older individual. The neonatal form, 90% mortality at one year. So how do we run a trial? We couldn't run it in older patients who were slowly getting weaker. And how do you measure that? So we ran it in the neonate. The challenge with the, running a trial in the neonate is that the average age of diagnosis is three months of age. We had to get them enrolled before six months of age to have time to show. And again, it was a global trial, so we got about 16 patients enrolled, and we literally were canvassing the world. And when somebody was born, we had people flown from Japan to Europe, from the Middle East to Germany. So you just did what you did could do to try to get these patients enrolled. Now, it worked. We dramatically changed it. The child in the, um, uh, the wheelchair who's, on a, uh, who's intubated on, with a trach uh, was in the trial. And this is what you have. You can see the natural history. So there was no control group here. Obviously, controls would not have been ethically appropriate. The FDA regulators accepted that. There was reasonable natural. Actually, we went back and we did a natural history retrospectively, and we went through the chart, did that chart. Um, that's the natural history in Taiwan. There's what happened in the clinical trial. Now, remember all those other little kids in the, uh, the trial who looked pretty healthy? Newborn screening in Taiwan. And so with newborn screening, those kids subsequently were started on enzyme at birth because they had, and just that three to six month difference made all the difference. So it's back to, again, timing is everything. Newborn screening is if we could do one thing to transform the world of rare diseases, it would be newborn screening because, as we all know, OK, so now, um, how am I doing? Now, uh, let me just talk a little bit about the world I live in today. Um, so uh, as Alex mentioned, um, Rhythm Pharmaceuticals were working on initially rare genetic diseases of obesity. And this is an amazing time for patients who are living with obesity, as you have to be living under a rock to not understand that that world is changing, that you can go out and get Wagovi or Monjaro and that these drugs. And, and those are amazing drugs. And what that has, what's happened now with that whole world is that suddenly a, a part of our world, which we've looked at as a, a lifestyle choice, um, is increasingly being recognized as a disease. And like the problem, um, rising tide lifts all boats, that's all good. The problem is that you've got drugs which are amazing right now, but people think problem solved. Again, we've got a hammer, everything's a nail, we're not good. But of course, obesity, like many diseases, is not one disease, it's many diseases. And so, we are working on a very small slice of that, a rare disease, and it is a classic rare disease, but it is much, this is the toughest rare disease I've ever worked on, despite the examples I just gave you. And one of the things that makes it so difficult is not only is it unrecognized, not only is it not diagnosed, not only are there no tests to diagnose this disease, there's all the societal biases, and the people who have the worst bias are physicians. And so the patient's chance and opportunity to get diagnosed here is extremely Difficult. So here is a child, um, two-year-old child with a leptin receptor um, um, mutation, um, 40 kilos, uh, 40, sorry, a BMI of 40 um, at the age of two. So again, you get extremes. Not everybody is at that extreme level, but you know, this is extreme. And our world, um, the way you know, we all operate, I think, we're focused on the weight. The problem here actually isn't the weight. The problem is the hunger and their energy expenditure, their, their metabolic rate. And so the pathway we're working on, and, and this is a, a second nodal area, so we've talked about you know, an organelle a node, if you will, in unlocking this. So here's a pathway. And this pathway um, is the melanocortin-4 pathway. Um, so we have our gut-brain access. We eat a meal, our gut hormones signal to the pancreas and the adipocyte, adipocyte left into the brain, and you get signaling down through the, in the hypothalamus through this arcuate nucleus with two pathways or multiple pathways, one of which is appetite-stimulating, leptin inhibits that. The other is this melanocortin-4 pathway, which it activates. So if you have a defect in that melanocortin-4 pathway, you're not producing alpha-MSH, melanocyte-stimulating hormone. We have an analog for that, so we're essentially just replacing that. If you're deficient in that, you're hungry all the time. You eat a meal, and you don't recognize you've eaten a meal. I just got a compassionate use request for a patient with an extension of this disease. I'll tell you about in a minute. A three-year-old has been hospitalized for five months because they cannot manage her hunger. And, and so again, you can think about that. But now think about hunger. This is the other challenge with hunger. 
We all know hunger. I miss lunch. I'm hungry. Everybody says, I know that. I understand that. That's not what this is. And so getting the right language, getting the right tools, helping people understanding, helping physicians begin to look at this as this is a pathologic manifestation of the disease. You need to think about it in the same way. The problem is people look at these patients, they go, the weight. There have been kids who have been taken away from their parents because they felt that their parents were abusing their child because they weren't controlling their intake, and the kid kept gaining weight each time they see the doctor. And so, again, it's, it's a devastating world, and it's extreme. Oops, sorry, let me just go back one sec. Um, so what we're working on, the pathway, and because we have a precision medic medicine medication, so our medicine is, is precise for the MC1 uh, recept uh, sorry, MC4 receptor, it in itself becomes a diagnostic tool. So we could, and we have our running a basket trial of about 30 different genes, which we think there's some association with this pathway, but there's not enough evidence in the literature to know that it's causal. So we could enroll them in a basket trial, give them the drug, and try to look and see which patients respond to the drug and which not, and use the drug as a way of sorting you know, and defining the population. So regulators aren't quite there yet, but at least from a developmental standpoint, it makes sense. So that's what we're doing. Um, so uh, the quick developmental history is here. We ran in that leptin receptor, biallelic forms, and then a POMC, um, another gene downstream of that, both with these severe manifestations. Drug worked dramatically. Both of those trials were about 10 patients apiece, extremely small. Um, as you can see right here, um, there was a blinded withdrawal period. So this was uncontrolled with the exception that they went on, uh, sorry, placebo during that period. The hunger comes right back and the weight gain came right back. So the on-off piece was very convincing, so the drug was approved. There are about, our epidemiology had many more, we thought maybe between these two groups of 2,000, 3,000 patients in the US. After two years, and we've been looking for these patients for five years or more, we have tens of patients on treatment in the US. So the challenge isn't just getting a drug approved, and like, I'm sure those patients are out there. They don't know who they are. We don't know who they are. They're not getting the right therapy. So um, the next one is bardet beetle syndrome. bardet beetle syndrome has a lot of things that we were looking at today. So this is a syndrome. Um, this is Izzy and her mom, Lay. Um, again, the same you know, pathway defect. It's a cilial defect. Um, we believe that it interferes with signaling again through this leptin receptor. So the hunger issues are there. And as you can see, this is her on the bottom here is her history. So multiple excessive weight gain, surgery, and then by four years old and been seen by 15 doctors in six states. As you can imagine, it takes a rare family to be able to go to you know, six states, see 15 doctors. So that's not what happens usually. Um, and those are the stories we tell, but that's not the normal world here. But even with that, um, you don't get a quick diagnosis here. And the problem with the US is, uh, oh, sorry. So we ran a trial. Um, the, we, BMIs came down, but this is the hunger score. It's just a VAS score, 10 point scale. Um, and you can see the placebo group in gray, the treated group in the dark, a um, little placebo effect, but then they separate. Um, it was for the first 14 weeks, and then everybody goes on treatment and it came down. So it's a very reliable signal, but we've had a lot of challenges you know, getting the FDA to recognize this as a, a legitimate manifestation of the disease that we've managed, in, uh, that we've measured in a uh, qualified, a reliable way, which again would allow it to be put into the label. So um, onward, you know, with all these challenges. So here's the issues with syndrome. So the way, of course, as we know, many diseases, um, they're described by phenotype. So people present, a physician sees a bunch of patients that look similar, they describe the phenotype, they deliver, develop some clinical criteria, then maybe the gene gets developed and becomes a, a genetic diagnosis. Well, the challenge, so here it is in Beale's criteria, it's very complicated. You gotta have multiple first and second groups of those. Um, the problem with genetic testing in this case is, so here's genetic testing in general, and this is where rare disease companies and the challenge with this, you can't get genetic testing in the US. Um, you can, but it's rare, it takes an act of God, you have to refer the patient to the geneticist, you can't get in to see a geneticist for six to 12 months, you do a genetic test on your own, you get it back, you don't know how to interpret it. Anyway, we are in a really challenging one of, Europe is so far ahead of the United States, my humble opinion here, just so you know, in terms of ability to get diagnosed. The interpretation, so pathogenic likely pathogenic, ACMG criteria, I'm not a geneticist. Pathogenic likely pathogenic boost, boot, variant of unknown significance. The problem is the variant of unknown significance, that's the big pool. And the pathogenic likely pathogenic is a tiny little slice there. So in theory, that's the loss of function. This variant of unknown significance, 
What do you do with that? What do you, you enroll those patients in your trial? Are they diluting your sample? Are they not diluting your sample? If you get that as a physician, does the patient have the disease, not have the disease? So you can see BBS on top of all of that is not a monogenetic disease. There's 23, maybe 30 genes that have been associated with the ciliary dysfunction and maybe the cause of the disease. And so you can imagine physicians sending the genetic test, and I can tell you the world's in a bit of chaos in a healthy way right now because in the past they weren't even, they didn't even care. At least now people being forced to confront the issue and think about whether or not my patient may or may not have the disease. So the last thing, am I still okay, Tom? Okay, the last thing is um, hypothalamic obesity. So this is not a genetic disease. <clears throat> and it turns out back to, you know, pathway as a node and, and how you different lens. So patients with cranial, often benign tumors, craniopharyngiomas most commonly, which are tumors um, that develop between the pituitary and the hypothalamus commonly. There's other uh, tumors in that space as well. But if you injure the hypothalamus, either the tumor itself growing into it or the surgery and or radiation that patients get to have it treated, about half of those patients come out of surgery, as it's been described, some of them jump off the table hungry. Um, they explode off their growth chart. And as you can see, this is on the right, I'm sorry, on the left here is the patient's height. Right on, just a normal kid, you know, growing normally. But you can see where he, this was an individual who was below the 50th percentile for their weight at the time they got their surgery, and then they just explode off. You've got weight in the middle, and you've got BMI, which is probably a better reflection of what, what's actually happening here. So literally straight off, they try a bunch of things, and then they got put on the drug, and, and they had a dramatic response. But everything's been tried in this population. They're a desperate population. The three-year-old child I was telling you about is an example of child in that population. But the pathophysiology was not well understood. And the results that we got were when we, we tested 18 patients with this, and essentially every single one child didn't take the drug or was very poorly compliant. 17 out of 17 who took the drug had a response, varied somewhat, but it was consistent. In many and most cases, it was dramatic. So the consistency here just told us, I think, to a large extent, what is the underlying biology of this hypothalamic obesity. And you know, here's one child you can see who lost you know, 28 percent of their BMI, they had a decrease in their dose, that's their doses, the, the hunger scores are here. So you can see the hunger comes down very quickly, then the weight, you know, quite rapidly actually, and um, they tried decreasing the dose, and now they're gone back up. Um, and this is the, the kid, and, you know, this is the kid at one year. So um, again, pretty dramatic. Uh, I'll skip this one, that's just working with it. So I'm just going to finish with just a couple of, of sort of uh, basic editorials, if you will. So managing an R&D portfolio, we haven't got asked, you know, which drugs do you go after? How do you decide which diseases you're going to pursue as a company? And one of the big things that's come up here, I mean, talk about Tim's world of N of 1, the challenges there. In the company world, absolutely, it, there's this whole sustainability, and you, Tim mentioned it. I mean, we need, you need to figure out, you have to keep an eye on sustainability. So managing an R&D portfolio, um, it, it's really basic. Um, it should be really basic. It's not always basic. You know, is there an unmet need? Do you understand the biology? Don't be guessing out there. And then is there a path forward? And don't underestimate the importance of having a path forward. It's wishful thinking to think, you know, just, well, I, I got it all figured out. We can just keep going. Science versus markets. Um, and if you're, in fact, I was at spent time at a big pharma, Sanofi, so I've sat at an executive table in a big pharma organization, and I can tell you how a lot of that portfolio management is by the numbers, and you do calculations about the different potentials and what it would take. You do what's called a net present value calculation, and what that does is it takes the probability of success times the size of the market, and you get a number. If you have a very low probability of success and you multiply it by diabetes, which is a very large $50 million population, you will always get a bigger number than if you have a very high probability of success and multiply it by 5,000. So that is a challenge. Safe and effective, it's got to be safe and effective. You know, we can talk about that more. I mean, these are the regulatory challenges and the challenges of small disease and the problem with small disease is the heterogeneity on top of the small disease. We had to mix in our weight trials, VMI trials, kids and adults, because we couldn't run, you know, an 18 and above, a 12 to 18, 6 to 12. I mean, you, you, we just, all comers, and you, you group them, and you hope like heck that you get a, your result um, wins in the end. It's all about the label. Um, it's not enough. You have to be thinking about the labels you run these trials because if you're just thinking about, I'm just going to get it approved, if I get my positive p-value, I'm good and I'll be great. No, access. Getting your drug approved is not the end game. The end game is access, and it's access globally. And you may be able to get it approved and access in the U.S., but you've got to be thinking about Europe, which is, of course, tough. You've got to be thinking about emerging markets. You've got to be thinking about, I mean, there's just... 
It's tough. And one of the things I hate off is when my regulatory person tells me, you can't do that because the regulatory agency won't let you. And it's like, no, we do not know what they're thinking. Um, and how do you address that? You be credible. Just bring something that's credible. Understand their challenge. You have the same goal, safe and effective. You have to prove safe and effective. And you want a label that will support access. And it's often about totality of the evidence. It's not about a phase one, two, three. I hate that terminology. We don't use that terminology. It makes no sense in a rare disease world. You can talk about proof of concept. You can talk about pivotal trials and the like. Don't talk about one, two, three. And I'll finish with the business case. Um, this is a tough business. And it, it's tougher the smaller you get, as you might predict. Healthcare system was not built to care for real disease and no awareness, little knowledge, few experts. There's no community. We do not sell a drug. We have a drug that's approved. We do not sell a drug. We work to develop a community that has the ability to make sure that patients with that disease can be seen by people who are knowledgeable with that disease, that there's a diagnostic tool. Genetic testing doesn't exist. Rhythm has an 80 gene panel we provide for free. Anybody, you just go on the web and you can do this. So increasingly, that is not cheap. If we didn't do it, nobody would do it. It makes a difference. Um, but it gets back to sustainability. How do you do it? Um, developing this drug, I mean, Ted Love said in the very in the beginning, he spent a billion and a half developing his rare disease drug. That's not a crazy number. Um, I, you know, we're, we're up there. Uh, global access, you got to think about that. Inflation Reduction Act, um, and this is my next last slide, it's a node killer. Um, good intent, it's a node killer. The idea, they, they if you have more than one indication, you become eligible for price negotiation. Already companies are starting to say, I'm not gonna use my drug in a second indication because it might move me into that category. And there's all kind of knock-on effects I won't go into here, but it is a node killer. Um, it, it's really unfortunate. And arguably, um, this child who's part of a population of tens of patients in the United States, we would not have developed the drug for this population if in fact we knew that that would kick that drug into that population because it just, it would destroy the sustainability and our ability to help that other. It sounds ludicrous, but that is the unintended consequence of that world. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. In the interest of time, we'll go straight into the panel. Is that okay, David? Yeah. And we'll just, yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's invite the panelists up uh, up to the podium. This is actually like we saved the best for last yeah. because we have a lot of yeah. great um, representation from all the different uh, constituencies. And Eric Lander to moderate. <laughs> an amazing day and what a great panel to have a, an integrative discussion about what has been going on in rare disease. Um, I am old enough to remember when cystic fibrosis was cloned. Uh, the day I heard it was on chromosome seven. And I remember spinal muscular atrophy, a meeting that took place at the Whitehead, where there was a researcher who had a postdoc friend, and they had a child with spinal muscular atrophy who was about to die, and the gene was not known. And then as more and more genes got known, it became, of course, the case that we couldn't do anything about it. We all knew we couldn't do anything about it scientifically. There was no way to treat. And then there was no market. So there were all of these reasons why nothing really could be done. Now, we've just heard a, a, a fabulous talk about, about the experiences from David Meeker about, about treating uh, rare diseases. On the one hand, um, it still is hard. On the other hand, it exists. It's possible. And that's like mind-blowing that all the things you, you were talking about really can be done. So where does it go over the coming decade or so to make this even more doable? to streamline it. One of the problems with having 8,000 genetic diseases is if each is its own separate special adventure, that's so much harder, to the extent that there's synergy across diseases through biological pathways. I think the word that several of you are using are nodal biological pathways where you can get leverage across many diseases. That may make it attractive enough to bring in capital. It may decrease the cost and complexity of 
developing. So there's nodal biological pathways. There's also platforms, platforms for being able to develop drugs rather than each drug being its own adventure, drugs that take advantage of nucleic acids that are more predictable, for example. Those are what I might think of as drug platforms. Or patient platforms has been talked about here, where we can assemble patient registries and be able to gain access in efficient ways and share that infrastructure across. And then, of course, regulatory platforms. The regulators are really smart and they really care. That's why they went into this, was to move along safe and effective drugs, keep ensuring that they're safe and effective and they're getting to patients. And so the FDA thinks a lot about how do we build platforms so we don't have to invent everything from scratch. Now all that said, every disease is different. There are disease specific aspects and we have to understand the aspects, there'll be disease specific endpoints. The conversation for all of you is, is to help point us toward a world in which those things, nodal pathways and platforms of different sorts, can help us do what we're seeing the examples of from all of you, from Tim Yu, from others. We can see this happen at a tenfold higher rate. So that's it. We're gonna try to accomplish that in the next few minutes. Um, let me go down though and ask each panel member to introduce themselves. Some of them have spoken, but nonetheless, to introduce themselves briefly, say a few things about you, and also say like one inspiring success that you've seen. We all know the frustrations, but say pick one. And I realize some of you will have 10, but just pick one which says, wow, you know, 20 years ago, I never would have imagined this is possible, and it's happening. Can we start at the end? And we'll work our way back down to me. All right, hello to everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Carrie Jo Lee. I am a pediatric gastroenterologist hepatologist by training, and I am at the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. There I serve as the uh, program manager and lead for the rare diseases team. Um, our team is a program management office for CEDAR's new Accelerating Rare Disease Cures program. And that program is really put together in order for us to harness our collective experience and um, drive really scientific and regulatory innovation as it pertains to drug development and rare diseases and increase our ability to engage both within the FDA as well as with our external partners and stakeholders in rare diseases. Um, and I would say that in terms of the most inspiring things to me in the world of rare diseases, you know, I'm, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, hepatologist. A lot of these children with rare diseases are my patients, uh, were my patients. Always feels like they are still. Um, I think that for me, moving to the FDA and being able to be a part of a center and really FDA-wide coalition to collectively do something to accelerate rare diseases and cures has been incredibly heartening. Um, we are a very scientific organization. We are mission driven, and it feels like I get to go to work every day and really try and help drive things forward to help patients. So I'm Heidi Reem, and I um, part of my world is in at Mass General Hospital, where I'm the chief genomics officer and really work in implementation of genomic medicine. Uh, and then here at the Broad, spend more of my time in rare disease research and gene discovery, working with Anna Donaluria and other colleagues in identifying the genetic causes of rare disease. I've spent a lot of my life directing clinical labs and trying to offer genetic testing to patients. And as far as you know, one of the successes, um, about seven or eight years ago, we built a platform called the Matchmaker Exchange. Um, and it was a way to match patients with extremely rare diseases where any individual researcher is unlikely to ever find a second patient. And it was a way to build evidence by matching candidate genes. And it's, in my view, been one of the single most successful ways to discover novel causes of genes through just matching researchers around the world. So I'll stop there. 
Great. So my name is Vamsi Mutha. I'm uh, an investigator here at the Broad Institute, founding co-director of the Metabolism Program. Uh, and I'm also an investigator over at Mass General Hospital in the Department of Molecular Biology. You all, some of you heard me speak earlier in the day today. I focus entirely on uh, mitochondrial biology uh, with a strong passion for rare mitochondrial diseases and how they can actually connect to the common uh, as well. Um, and just one technology that just emerged recently actually came out of the Broad from uh, David Liu's laboratory, and we, we contributed a, li a little bit, but it really came from David Liu's laboratory, was the development of a new technology with which to edit the mitochondrial DNA. As many of you know, CRISPR is pretty awesome, but CRISPR does not work on the mitochondrial DNA, and so for decades, the only mitochondrial DNA variants that we could investigate are those that are naturally occurring, and so uh, David uh, used his uh, uh, a base editing technology. We were able to get it targeted into the mitochondrion, and now we're actually able to make not every possible mutation, but a lot of very interesting ones. And for the first time, we actually have really interesting cellular, even animal models of mtDNA disease on isogenic backgrounds. And so I don't think it's quite ready for therapeutics, but it's, it's great for modeling and really, really uh, an important uh, advance for a subset of the rare mitochondrial disorders. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nancy Andrews. Uh, I come to this from several different perspectives. Uh, I was at Boston Children's for the first 20 years of my career, left for a while to be a medical school dean down at Duke University, came back um, going on two years ago to Boston Children's as chief scientific officer and executive vice president. Um, but I also have a perspective from now being in my ninth year on the board of directors of Novartis, uh, a company that has been relatively adventurous um, in, in space related to this. Uh, also on the board of Charles River Labs and Maze Therapeutics, which is a, a small biotech. Um, so different angles on uh, the kinds of things that we're talking about today. Um, my own research was in iron homeostasis. Um, we discovered the causes of several uh, diseases of iron homeostasis. And um, I think uh, this isn't very original, but uh, thinking about what um, has really made a huge impression on me over the course of my career, it's really two things, and Eric mentioned both of them. Um, the potential cure, we, we hope, too early to know, um, for spinal muscular atrophy. I remember taking care of those children as a pediatrics resident. Uh, it was horrible. And also um, the amazing treatments for cystic fibrosis. And again, that seems like a miracle. Uh, David Meeker, I've had my moment here, but I'll make the provocative statement. Uh, if we had to pick between improving our ability to diagnose and getting more cures, I would pick improving our ability to diagnose. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Daniel Fisher. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Tavert Biosciences. We're developing tRNA therapeutics to treat uh, rare and severe uh, diseases. One of our platforms is uh, called a suppressor tRNA. We can treat, um, address premature stuff codons across multiple diseases. So talking about uh, platforms or, or nodes. Um, our lead indication and the reason we started the company is to treat a very severe type of epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. Those were our, our, the name of the company comes from reversing Dravet, thus Tavard. Um, we happen to have, my wife is there, a 14-year-old daughter that suffers for, uh, from Dravet syndrome. That was the original goal of, uh, of starting the company. Um, for me, inspiring, so 14 years ago, we got the diagnosis of my daughter living in Atlanta. I don't come from a medical field, I'm an electrical engineer, so the doctor says, well, your daughter has Dravet syndrome, and I'm like, okay, so cure her, you're a doctor. And he looks at me and says, oh no, you can't do that. And I'm like, what do you mean no? I mean, I've heard about something called gene therapy. He's like, oh no, no, that, that's science fiction, that doesn't exist. 14 years later, we're, ha we're here having this conversation. For me, that's, that's the miracle. Great. Um, I'm Anna Greca. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm uh, an institute member here at the Broad, and you heard me uh, from earlier this morning and throughout the day calling you back into the room. Um, for me, 
you know, what's most inspiring, I think I'm going to riff off of what Daniel just said. Uh, I think we are living in an unprecedented moment in biomedicine. I mean, maybe all scientists at their time feel that, but I really do feel that we have so many tools at our disposal and more knowledge than we've ever had before. And so now it's kind of incumbent upon us, all of us in this room, and all of us in this building and all the buildings in this Kendall Square area and the Harvard Medical School and MIT and all the research institutes beyond that to harness this power that we have for good. And there are so many decisions that we need to make and so many things that need to happen and go well for our patients to be best served. But I think it is incumbent upon us to figure this out. And so I'm most inspired and excited by the fact that we're all here trying to struggle with these questions and trying to come up with some good answers. So very much looking forward to our discussion. Pretty amazing panel to have all sitting here. Thank you very much. Um, I think that my, my suggestion is we be, be that we chew off a topic and have some free discussion on the panel, and then we'll move it along. And I had a first topic, which I'm now going to uh, postpone in light of David Meeker's question, because I want to actually get at that question. As I understand it, you're saying if you had to choose, diagnostics is our greatest need. And there's no real excuse, because we know how to do it. So being you know, not content with that alone, I want to ask the panel, how critical is it to be able to deploy diagnostics for children who have some unusual condition as an absolutely routine standard of care? And how important would it be to deploy preconception screening for couples? Because the easiest way to, quote, cure a genetic disease would be not to it would be to have a child who didn't inherit it. So we have that ability in principle. It's hard to deploy, but there's no longer a scientific problem with doing that. There will be problems with VUSs, variants of unknown significance, and the interpretations will never be perfect, but maybe the perfect shouldn't be the enemy of the good. So, all right, you're now in charge of the US medical system and medical systems in other countries. What do you all recommend? Have at it. Just jump in and keep your comments short enough to give other people uh, a time, but I'm not going to try to do all the air traffic control. So this is um, not meant to be an advertisement, but I actually think we do pretty well with diagnostics at Boston Children's Hospital, and I think it's moving along uh, very rapidly. It, it, so it's not the pain point that I worry about. I worry a lot more about how fast we can move clinical trials um, and how we can collect all of the many things that have been mentioned that are necessary for clinical trials. Um, we still have a ways to go, of course, on diagnosis, but, but I think that that is moving very quickly and, and our capabilities of speeding up clinical trials are, are still in the early stage. And preconception? Ah, yes. So, so actually, uh, I think the state of Massachusetts, you can do a test. I know this because it happened for a friend of my daughter's for SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, preconception. And I think we're rapidly moving, and we have someone at Children's who um, has particular expertise related to this, to doing in utero treatments. And um, So that, that there's preconception if you know you have a risk. Oh, sorry, preconception. I meant prenatal. Excuse me. Oh, prenatal. Well, both, actually. So now I mean in preconception fact, with no risk, yeah, no, in no fact, special risk. Just it, everybody in Massachusetts who wants to get married has a chance to, to screen and find out. So I don't know why it was exactly, but um, my friend, my daughter's friend and her husband were both screened preconception. Uh, unexpectedly, it turned out they were both carriers for SMA, and then the, the baby was straight pre screened prenatally. Got it. What others think? Heidi. So you know, one of the challenges, I think, in the preconception screening is that most of the physicians who think about this testing are the OBGYNs, and they don't see the patients until they're pregnant and they show up. And so one of the things that we're doing at Mass General Hospital is putting a genetic counseling service on top of primary care. Um, and the you know challenge in primary care is that most of those physicians are not comfortable with ordering genetic tests and how to use them, how to consent and return results, but if you give a genetic counselor to a primary care physician who can do the pre-consent, who can do the return results, who can do the logistics of test ordering, and in fact, that is covered in insurance-wise at 
it's the same coverage whether you show up pregnant or it's preconception. Insurance will cover that. So I think part of it is just implementation. It's where do we put this? Do we, you know, when you go to your physician, part of the, for a primary care visit, the one question that should be asked: is, Are you contemplating having a family? Right. So I, so I think there is a way that we can get preconception. Now it doesn't cover the fact that a lot of genetic disorders are de novo mutations, and you're not going to catch them, right? Right. Um, and Going on to the diagnostic part, um, you know, as a clinical lab director by training, I am 100% behind the diagnostic being key here. The numbers of families that gain so much relief just by having an answer is immense. Um, and so the, it is the first step of, of management of a disease is understanding what you have. Um, and I think in some areas we're doing better, as, as Nancy said, um, severe neurological disorders, widespread testing, but there's a lot of disorders, and, and David, you know, talked about some that aren't, just aren't recognized as genetic and aren't appreciated in terms of the need for testing. On top of it, if we're ever going to solve the VUS challenge, we really need the whole population tested so that we have all the controls and their phenotypes to help interpret the VUSs. So my view is it's just everybody needs a genome. And the question I have is, is it going to end up being a research argument that actually ends up getting there quicker through programs like All of Us and others where people are getting their genome sequence before our stupid healthcare system catches up? <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Anybody else want comments on this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I do agree that diagnosis is uh, is critical. I mean, we we if you talk to um, families with rare epilepsies, uh, generally diagnosis is a uh, is a journey and not a nice one. Um, I think in Boston we live in a bubble. It's, it's much easier to get a diagnostic here. As you move outside of Boston, if you move outside of the U.S., um, it's much harder. If you can think about it, seven thousand rare diseases. Most physicians are not aware of most events. So at the end, it comes down to many patient organizations just creating an awareness. Uh, and that's really, at the end, parents go to Facebook groups, reach your friends, families, in order to get that diagnostic. So the more we can do to standardize the diagnosis, that will be extremely helpful. Carrie Jo? I'll just make a, a quick comment on this from the thinking about my perspective coming, coming to this as a regulator who would like to see adequate and well-controlled um, trials that are designed to demonstrate substantial evidence of effectiveness and get characterize the safety assessment as well. It's You still have to do the work of not just the diagnosis, but given the heterogeneity and the challenges in rare disease drug development, different genotypic uh, variability, different phenotypic variability, you still have to be able to tie that diagnosis to what you expect to see in the patient in order to enroll the correct patients in the trial who will benefit from the therapeutic that you are testing. And so I just don't want us to lose sight of that. Good. All right. Oh, did you, uh, yes, this is your since question I, to yeah, provoke I, this. So I started off. Um, I was gonna, the BBS example that I gave you, I think um, one thing I'm sure about rare disease epidemiology is it's wrong. Um, we started out, I'm more and more confident that that number, we think there's four to 5,000 patients with BBS. That's probably an underestimate in the US. We know something under 1,000, I think, are diagnosed. I will make the projection, and there's now a therapy. With, it's a good therapy that it can have a significant impact on their lives. A decade from now, I predict that at best will be 2,000 patients diagnosed. Some significant number of those may be on therapy, and at least 3,000 plus undiagnosed. So I can give you multiple examples. So I'm back that even though if you get to children's, I'm sure you get the diagnosis. Most of us won't. So that that's why and, the and drug doesn't get you there. And Can, maybe Anna will comment on a disease that only affected 11 families. Well, yes, that's how we started. And then I thought that that's impossible. And then we built a registry and found that there's actually now up to 2,000 patients with this disease worldwide. And we're still having the numbers go up. So that there's definitely you know, great uh, benefit to that. And I would say that the promise of a possible therapy through some of uh, the work that I have been involved in obviously motivates uh, physicians and patients and families. But I want to come back to this democratizing the access for patients, because I think that that's uh, where it that we might be able to solve some of this. I mean, it seems probably Pollyannish to think that, you know, we're gonna do this across all, you know, seven or 8,000 rare diseases all at once. But then the question becomes, how do we prioritize which 
uh, patient groups might be able to get on these platforms that um, Claire and Monica so eloquently uh, described today. And the idea is that there, if you have a mailbox and a computer with internet access, that you can participate, you can be a part of this of this uh, world, you know. But how do we still prioritize that? And so, if we think about it from a ladder secures perspective, which is sort of my remit, um, do we do this for the diseases where we actually think we're closer to a therapy? Is that the right, the ethical thing to do? Um, is there some other way to prioritize how we approach this? I just want to hear from anyone who may have a thought on that. Great. Well, we won't hear from them right now because I want to move to another topic, but it's good you're raising it. I want to turn to the technology platforms that we've heard a bunch of examples and we've got some people here who are great experts at the technology platforms. Many of them rely on the fact that nature decided to encode genetics in a very beautiful digital kind of code that we can do nucleic acid directed therapies of many different sorts. We can do antisense oligonucleotides. We can do other variants of interfering, you know, small interfering RNAs. We can do CRISPR genome editing. We can do mitochondrial genome editing. We can do tRNAs, for goodness. We can do suppressor tRNAs. They all rely on the fact that genetic information is information. If you know what's wrong in the sequence, you kind of can write a therapeutic. You still have to test it, it might not be totally right, but as compared to trying to find a small molecule, um, you have a pretty good leg up to have a therapeutic. What's gonna be going on in the next coming years in terms of this range of seven or eight different modalities for approaching things from a nucleic acid point of view. And maybe, Daniel, I could start with you because I, maybe people don't know as much about the suppressor tRNA route. Um, you can even tell us why should this, you know, how it works, why it should work, and what you see as the view, your, the vision for that. And let's, let's just imagine how far we could get on this, please. Sure, so uh, w what we do in our case, we, so you, you have a subset within diseases of cases caused by um, nonsense mutations that end up being a premature uh, stop codon. For instance, in Dravet syndrome, 25% of all cases are caused by, uh, by nonsense mutations. In Duchenne, it's somewhere between 13 and, and 15% and other diseases. In Red syndrome, for instance, is 40%. So in humans, there aren't any natural occurring uh, tRNAs that will read a premature stop codon, and that's on purpose. Because the, the, the purpose of a, of a stop codon is as a ribosome knows when to stop, and then when to stop adding amino acids to the polypeptide chain, and the protein is complete. In many cases, in diseases, you have one letter that changes, and what was supposed to be a codon that should be coding for an arginine or for glutamine, suddenly it becomes a stop codon. So when the ribosome is reading, ribosome gets to the premature stop, stops, and then you get a, a, a truncated protein or you get a totally non-functional gene, non-functional uh, protein. So what we've done, we introduce um, a tRNA, which in principle we have to make other changes, Basically, we switch one letter in the anticodon so it could recognize the, the premature stop codon. And, so and this is an idea that's 60 years old, of course, because, because bacterial geneticists discovered this. Yeah, so one of my co-founders is uh, Harvey Lodish. And Harvey told me, you know what, my, um, when I did my PhD, I was working on suppressor uh, tyranates. So it's been around forever. Now we know much more about them. We can uh, deliver them as well. We deliver, we're delivery agnostic, we can use multiple methods. For Dravet, we use uh, AV vectors, and you can fit many suppressors there. So suddenly, it became a reality. The beauty of the suppressor tRNAs is that they're mutation-specific. So the same drug that we can use to treat Dravet, the same drug, meaning the same delivery vector, the same suppressor tRNA, and the same promoters, you can use it to treat other epilepsies as well. Um, right now, with the drug or the construct that we will have for Dravet, the idea is then to do a clinical basket trial 
for, for other epilepsies at the same time. So when we go to platforms, to know it all, that's our way of okay, so this scaling is a, and building it's a good up. idea because there's only a limited number of stop codons. But of course, the natural knee-jerk reaction molecular biologists would have is, well, there are stop codons at the end of every gene. Aren't you going to suppress them and read through? So the difference between a premature stop codon and a naturally occurring stop codon, can the cell tell the difference between those? And are you going to not cause more trouble than you're going to cure? So that's a great question. It's a question that I get from every every single investor. It's the um, obvious question, <laughs> right? So the, the the answer is no. And for reasons that we don't completely understand, the suppressor tRNAs read over the premature stop, but do not read over the natural termination codon. We've done proteomics work. Uh, others have done it as well. We've done Robinson profiling. And on average, uh, in about 1% of cases, the um, suppressor tRNA reads over the natural termination codon. There are two factors that we think why, why that happens. Well, first of all, there are fail-safe mechanisms. So on average, after 50 bases, after every uh, natural termination codon, you have another um, termination codon. So if the first one doesn't catch it, you have a fail-safe, the second one will catch it you might have a piece of extra protein that eventually gets uh, degraded by the cell. The other reason is that you have um, proteins that are release factors. And what they do, they're very abundant, close to the natural termination codon, which is close to the three prime UTR of the, of the message. And there you have quite a bit of abundance of the protein release factor. What the protein does is when the ribosome gets close to the um, natural termination codon, it binds to the A site in the ribosome and then releases the polypeptide chain that becomes a protein. Close to where the natural, the premature stop codons, you don't have high concentrations of protein release factors. So at the end, what you have is a competition between the suppressor tRNA and the release factors. Where the premature stop is, you don't have high abundance of release factors, so usually the um, suppressor tRNA prevails. Close it, to the free prime UTR, the release factors prevail, so you have very low levels of... Uh, good, of thank you. No, it's a very wonderful story how nature has set it up to favor such a therapy. It's very cool. Okay, but we have all these other therapies we can do with nucleic acids. Vamsi? I think I think um, one thing that I'll just point out is that you know it's one thing to use gene replacement or gene editing to fix the actual gene that's mutated to begin with, but what I think is very exciting is targeting modifiers, and we're seeing so many of that again using nucleic acid therapy, but targeting a gene that was minding its business to begin with, right? Whether that's the spinal muscular atrophy story, right? You're going and reawakening a quiet gene next door. Uh, or PCSK9, whether for rare or common cardiovascular PCL11A. disease. PCL11A. PCL11A. And so I find that these are really, really interesting because one of the real challenges for these ultra-rare diseases is the extremely long, long tail. And coming up with a gene editing or replacement program for every single one of those ultra-rare diseases is tough. But if we have a really good modifier, and that's going to come from a lot of genetics, a lot of good deep biology, which is the case for all three of those that we're talking about, then why not go and you know, uh, mess with a modifier to, to, to help lots of patients? I, I completely agree, and I think it's not that hard to identify them with the data that's out there now. Um, so completely agree. So, yep. Anna? Just to be provocative, though, just if we think about the examples that have already made it to the clinic, maybe to David's point and to Ted's point earlier today, it was small molecules for, for CF, uh, small molecules for um, uh, for uh, uh, the sickle cell disease example that we saw this morning, and so I'm just thinking the long tails. What about you know understanding nodal biology that allows you to platformize a small molecule approach or any approach? It could even be a modifier approach, but platformize based on understanding of shared uh, nodal biology as a way to take care of these long tails in rare diseases. Diseases, do you, mm -hmm. Bamzi, I was curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think you're right. I think for those to the small molecules first. I think for SMA, the ASO was first actually, and so. But the beauty of the nucleic acid approach is it's relatively generic, right? So if you really do have a good 
genetic modifier or an environmental modifier that can be gotten to through genetics. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that as a means of, and, and at least based in cell culture studies, you can find too numerous to count genetic modifiers. It's not easy to find genetic modifiers purely from human genetics because there's only seven or eight billion people on the planet, but hopefully, uh, you know, more modifiers will be identified through either systematic approaches or just good old-fashioned biology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cystic fibrosis, of course, was in a way a very unusual case because the protein was made and it just didn't fold and get out to the surface. And so obviously the absence of a protein is a whole different story. Who knew that, that cystic fibrosis would agree to be something that could be treated by screening for something to get out. But I think what this indicates but, but, is... But, but really quickly, I think yeah. one of the key, key uh, papers on the CF story came from Michael Welch's lab, if I'm not mistaken, was a discovery that the Delta F508 was a temperature-sensitive mutant. Yeah. Because that suggested that if you modified the environment, there's nothing intrinsically wrong. Now, if you identify small molecules that do something morally equivalent to stabilizing the temperature... You know, Right. The protein. Okay, so we're beginning to develop a catalog of if it's a temperature sensitive mutant, that's a kind of platform thing. It suggests you probably can make a molecule to stabilize. Yeah. That that's right. Keep going. Just let's look at all the different sorry, changes sorry. we can ring on this. Oh, sorry, David, go ahead. No, just um and Eric, I thought this might be where you're going as well on the platform concept. So back to the stop codon. I mean, and is there a regulatory framework where an approach to the disease, the indication is defined by the underlying biology, i.e. the presence of a stop codon. You don't have to run clinical trials in every patient indication. You've yep. documented it. And, and then the question is, how many of those would need to happen before there could be an in vitro or an in vivo preamble to say, because as we know, there are... Uh, Fabre disease, um, where they tested in a certain number of mutations, they've added to the number of you know eligible mutations based on in vitro work, and so is that okay. a pipe So we're getting or? to regulatory platforms connecting to these platforms. Yeah, based on non-traditional concepts. I mean, right now we're we're disease. What is the disease, right? And now we're. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're in a space that we, we are right here, right now, and this is what where we are learning and gaining experience and trying to determine exactly what things like that might look like. I mean, from the regulatory perspective, I can tell you translational science and the um, how well you define the proof of concept of, of your molecule is critical. I mean, critical to rare disease drug development. Most of our rare disease drugs, at least in CEDAR, are approved with uh, one adequate and well-controlled trial plus confirmatory evidence. And the strength of that confirmatory evidence matters greatly. And you have to think about that early and do the work required, you know, so that it's, it's high quality and high fidelity uh, when it comes in, in order for us to make a regulatory decision. Um, you know, we have, in terms of the regulatory framework, we have the, the animal rule when it comes to infectious diseases and areas where you could not do a trial um, in humans. And so and that, that's really the framework where that exists at this point. So, Carrie Jo, do you imagine a world where now you're at Cedar, not I'm Seber? At Cedar and not Seber, yeah. And for people who don't know the difference, Seber is biologicals and Cedar is drugs. But nonetheless, you think broadly about the whole agency. Could you imagine a time when the FDA is, is getting a very large fraction of its applications being these kinds of platform things. We already know like mRNA vaccines that arose during the pandemic. We're now going to see mRNA vaccines for tons and tons of things. So there'll be a platform, there'll be a package of information about the vaccine as a general thing. And then of course, there'll always be, you know, the vaccine applying to a particular disease. Um, but you could see it for every one of these technologies that we're going to build some transferable knowledge about how these technologies work and then some disease specific knowledge. And do you see the agency evolving to, to be able to think in that way? Well, I, th I think the agency, you know, uh, we evolve to, to meet the ch regulatory challenges that are before us. In, in order to work within the front, we keep up with the science and these are all new things. It's impossible for me to speak 
you know, on behalf of, of CBER and how they're looking at mRNA vaccines, but in the CEDAR world, you know, ASO technology and how we, how we apply that. It's why it's the reason we put out multiple guidances on our thinking of what goes into what a good package looks like. What do you need to think about when you're going to different indications and it's been the ones that, for which these have been used, because it may not act the same way in different um, patient populations or with different constructions based on the same platform. And, and I think, you know, so far the experience has been that it's not plug and play. We'll get to that point eventually, but I'm not sure it's very close uh, for ASOs or for gene therapies or right. for mRNA probably um, even vaccines. So I, I think we're still a ways from that. And that's part of the reason that I'm so fixated on uh, trying to find faster ways to go from um, a proof of concept, which usually uh, is pretty early and doesn't mean it's going to be a safe and efficacious um, treatment for a patient, to actually getting it to the patient. You know, Anna said Anna said something earlier that um, struck me, which was we will always need to do it in mice. And when you said that, I was thinking maybe not. Um, and you know, I, I think the faster we can get to reliable, informative preclinical models um, that that don't require mice or don't require animals. Um, we're not there yet, but mm -hmm. you know there are interesting concepts around digital twins and that kind of thing for both human and, and animal studies. So. Yeah. Now, it, clearly, none of this is plug and play. I think the question is, 10 years from now, could we be at plug and play? And I just want to make a yeah. an advertisement for the FDA, which is that people, the FDA gets a lot of grief from people. <laughs> But ah, the problems with the FDA, I guess every time I have approached the FDA, they have been very eager to try to figure out how to do these things. And so this is just a brief yay FDA advertisement to put in there, unless Carrie Joe objects to that in some way. No. Okay, good. Um, can we turn to this question of nodal biological pathways? Um, we see enough examples, even represented on this panel, of two furs and three furs and maybe 50 furs where you can, by understanding a particular pathway that affects many diseases, think about developing not nucleic acids, but small molecules that may intervene in a certain way. And I wonder if people could, could talk about those examples because they really speak to why we need to understand pathways qua pathways. Vamsi, you're nodding your head and I know you care a lot about this. No, I'm happy to talk about one example from our lab, but also what I think could be an interesting approach more, more generally. Uh, and from our lab, I presented a piece of that earlier today. One of the discoveries that we made back in 2016 is that, um, again, just to refresh you, there's about 300 different monogenic forms of mitochondrial disease. We breathe about 500 liters of oxygen every day. A lot of that has been consumed in our mitochondria. And so, when the mitochondrion is broken, there's actually an accumulation of oxygen. And what we've discovered is that for some, but not all, but for some very important mitochondrial diseases, we just lower the ambient oxygen. They're oxygen-sensitive mutants. They're not temperature-sensitive mutants. But it's actually a way of actually addressing not all, but a reasonable number of models in a preclinical setting. And so I think this is an example of where it was just good old-fashioned biology uh, uh, leading uh, serendipitously to a rather counterintuitive uh, uh, approach, but it looks like one that is really exciting on the preclinical side. Um, so that's just an example that we're super excited about in our lab, the idea of hypoxia as a medicine. Um, but I think to try to systematize it, the plug that I'm going to make is for metabolomics. I just think that plasma metabolomics is high, high dimensional, lots of insights into biochemistry. It samples genes, it samples the environment, it samples chance, and it can be repeatedly done, and it represents a great space, okay, a, a great mathematical space in which two different rare diseases can be co-localized to each other, and maybe a common disease can also be co-localized. There's mechanism there. Sometimes the metabolite itself is the medicine, right? Sometimes the metabolites are the biomarker, uh, and they also provide a metabolomic nosology for a lot of the rare. So I, I view that 
as a very, I know you like single cell RNA-seq. I like metabolomics for a lot of these disorders because of almost the exact same reasons you like single cell. Well, we can agree to like them both. <laughs> yes. And, and so on, I wonder if you would, you, would you be willing, or, or is there any way we could stop you from talking about protonopathies? Uh, probably not. <laughs> Um, well, this is in some ways the genesis for ladder secures, the story of the genesis of ladder secures. How did how did we even come up with this idea of sort of getting all of us together to think about ways to identify null biology? Um, it really comes from work that happened uh, with uh, with my team who are here in the back. Um, so several years ago, there was this very obscure um, kidney disease that uh, no one really understood. Um, Eric and Mark Daly uh, found the mutation for this disease, and then the job was to try to understand what it does. And so I'm a cell biologist. We tried to understand mechanisms inside cells. We identified that this mutation is, in fact, a, a part of a large group of mutations, uh, toxic gain-of-function mutations, uh, otherwise known as toxic proteinopathy. So the mutation generates a misshapen protein that accumulates inside cells and ultimately accumulates so much that it actually kills them. So interestingly, in trying to understand, again, doing hand-to-hand -hand combat, as I call it, for this, with this one obscure disease, we actually identified that the retention of these toxic proteins is not just a one-off thing that happens in this particular rare kidney disease, but it is actually a common thread among more than 50 different toxic proteinopathies that affect the kidney, the liver, the eye, the brain, the lung. And so now we have understood that there's this thing called a cargo receptor that grabs these misshapen proteins and holds onto them too tight. And too much of a good thing is a bad thing in the cell, and the cells ultimately die. And so now we can target the cargo receptors as a nodal biology to solve more than 50 toxic proteinopathies, hopefully. This cannot be the only example in nature. Vamsi's work with the hypoxia illustrates another nodal biology that could subserve many of these um, mitochondrial cytopathies. We should be able to go out there and systematically find more of these nodal biological mechanisms. And I think that's the inspiration for a lot of what, um, you know, led us to some of the discussions that actually led us to today. So very interested in, in moving this idea forward uh, further. And can I ask you one science question? I mean, earlier I brought up uh, the, the 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 value of genetic modifiers, but de novo discovery, especially in the human population, is very very tough. But through biology, you've identified through rare disease, through good biology, you've identified a pathway that potentially modifies the risk of a lot of different proteinopathies. Now, if you do the inverse, is the pathway that you've identified does that is that a genetic modifier for common uh, proteinopathies? Well, that's an interesting question that, you know, remains to be answered, not that it's known at the moment, uh, but something that one could imagine exploring further, and in fact, we are quite interested in that. But to take that idea a little bit further, essentially, you could imagine discovering this through a systematic way of doing modifier screens. So what if you would play this forward and say, is it at all possible that you could take, let's say, for argument's sake, all 8,000 genetic diseases, you introduce selected variants into cell types of choice, and that's perilous because what the cell type will be is one of the big questions. But let's assume you solve that. And then you do massively parallel modifier screens against all of these different uh, variants. What would you discover? Would there be these nodal pathways that you're able to discover that then perhaps coalesce into places that are now targetable by therapies, such that you're not doing hand-to-hand -hand combat anymore? That's part of the idea, you know, of maybe something that we could do to over the next 10 years, accelerate our progress. But I'm very interested in what others think about this. He's thinking I'm talking too much. Um, <laughs> I, you know, of course, you can also um, look for uh, extreme situations where the genetics would predict a disease and somebody doesn't get it. And so there are modifiers that have been ascertained that way. And I think that's a a space that still has more um, room to, to tap, a pool that has more to tap. Heidi? So one thing that's happened over the time that we've been doing genetic testing is we largely sequence coding regions and we find predicted loss of function variation and um, gain of function mutations and missense things pretty 
mostly null variation that has severe effects. But, you know, already today we saw good examples of cryptic splice sites, of uh, uh, regulatory elements. And I think over time we're going to discover that a massive percentage of the disorders that we study are actually due to variation that we've just not looked for to date. Um, and I think as, you know, just in the last couple of years, uh, the ability to do routine RNA-seq to do to use tools like Splice AI and be able to actually predict just from the sequence disrupting you know uh, variation, I think will lead to an entirely other area of commonality in thinking about therapeutics that can better in common ways address things like cryptic splice sites and regulatory expression that that will create another common element that doesn't require you know unique protein based or other sorts of approaches. All right, I know we have already run over the time that we have allotted for this. So in a moment, I'm gonna to turn to the panel. How many of you listen to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me? Anybody? Yeah, okay, we have enough takers. So at the end, they always ask the panel to, to give a headline that we will read next week. I'm gonna ask you to give a headline we're gonna read one decade from now related to this field. Um, uh, some optimistic headline that you think is plausible, has at least a 50% chance of being a headline published 10 years from now. I will take a moment of tap dancing to give you time to think about that, to, to say this, is, this has been a remarkable panel, a remarkable discussion. How many of you would like to see this collective group write an awesome review of the state of this field? Those in favor? Because I think it is falling together in a remarkable way. There's so much to say right now. I love this ladders to cure things. You guys are thinking, right? I'm talking to them. Um, this ladders to cure thing, because it makes me think about you know, some castle wall that seems impregnable. And we've got all of these ladders now that we are laying siege to it, laying up against the capital, you know, castle wall. And sometimes we're gonna we're gonna breach the castle on this ladder and by that ladder and by going up this ladder and hopping over to the other ladder and things. So I think I think somebody needs to draw the graphic of this remarkable assault that is going on with regard to uh, being able to bring all of these ideas systematically, plus, of course, disease-specific knowledge about each and every one of the diseases. We can't forget about that. But even there, we're going to get knowledge from medical records around the world that will be integrated and things. So I'm, I'm like blown away by what has been happening. I'm blown away by this panel. And I have killed enough time for them to have put together their answers. And so... Anna, what, what headline will we read 10 years from now? All right. Um, first to be put on the spot. So ambitious, but I think doable. Headline reads, International Ladder Secures uh, Consortium uh, uh, announces 8,000th genetic disease treated or cured. Maybe on a 20-year timeline, but. As they say on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And if that happens, remember you heard it first here. <laughs> Daniel? Yeah, mine would be rare diseases are no longer rare because they share pathways and they share cures. So the end of rare diseases. Uh, whole exome screening is uh, now available, not just available, it's uh, required. There's no, you don't get to uh, choose whether you get it, just every baby born in, <laughs> in the United States. It's mandatory. With, with, with the accompanying appropriate uh, insurance and, you know, policy statements around it so you're not penalized. And the side note to that will be the U.S. catches up with the rest of the world. So. It's a long headline, but a good one. Mine goes the other way, that the, that the rest of the world goes up, gets caught up with the U.S. Um, in that uh, in the global south, it's possible to deliver treatments for diseases that now we can only do with very expensive boutique therapies. Bomsi? I loved where you were going earlier, Eric, about the idea that moder with modern technology, we can actually prevent any of these 
a very large number of these rare diseases from even happening to begin with. And so it would be awesome if the headline reads, eradication of all 8,000 recessive uh, diseases. Uh, and one thing that I'll point out is, earlier we we're talking about things like prenatal, uh, preconception types of testing, but in, in India there was actually one company, in, in order to understand the name of this company, I have to provide one brief background. And so uh, there's uh, the concept of Janama Patri, which means Patri is marriage, Janama, based on the stars. Right? Oh. So based on the astrology and the stars, marriages are made. Genetica Patri. Genome Patri yeah. is a company that was actually started, it exists in India, but then that's moving things even <laughs> further back. So whether it's through Genome Patri or whether it's through other means, it'd be wonderful if the headline reads prevention and, or eradication of all diseases. Yeah, uh, Heidi will of course point out there are de novo mutations. <laughs> yes. yes. Just to be a spoiler on that, but almost complete eradication, says Vamsi. Heidi? Researchers across the globe have generated and shared enough genomes to saturate the identification of all human variation. Here, here. Gary Joe, you get the last word here. And I realize as, as someone working at the FDA, you are required to be cautious and all that. And, and at best you can give us draft headline it is, rather, it is a draft. It needs to be clear guidance, through, clear through uh, many, many levels before it goes into print. Yes. But nonetheless, with all those caveats, what headline could, could you suggest, at least in draft? Uh, I'm actually going to take this moment, because I think this is super important, uh, to let people know that they should go to the Cedar Arc webpage. And it's not just self-promotion, because it ties into my, my headline of what we are trying to do, which is to really clarify the regulatory process so that scientists and innovators and academics and early drug developers and those that are really championing these things um, think early about how to construct adequate and well-controlled trials uh, so that we can have more safe and effective therapies for rare disease patients. So it's kind of less of a headline, but um, it, it's, it's really more of a, um, it, it's a statement for of awareness uh, because we are really invested in helping you make safe and effective therapies. Oh, I think it's a great headline. I, I'll, sh I'll just shorten it to scientists finally understand how to turn discoveries into approved cures. And with that, let's thank this spectacular panel. Just uh, very brief because we're really late. Um, so uh, I just want to thank everyone for their participation, the speakers, the panelists, the chairs. Um, it's been a remarkable day. I think we learned a lot. Uh, of course, there are more questions than answers. This is always the case with this symposia. But I consider this, this was called the inaugural symposium, and I consider this uh, the uh, beginning of a conversation, not really in any way, the end. This is just the very beginning, actually. And so I just wanted to summarize some of the themes that we heard today and maybe just try to put it in perspective of what we're hoping to do and sort of, again, consider this your invitation to uh, let us know what your thoughts are um, as we move forward and how we can advance this effort together. This is meant to be, you know, I, I, me I meant it tongue in cheek, but I hope that this can go international because obviously the kind of resources um, uh, and knowledge that needs to be marshaled for this problem to be solved is not a Boston problem or a US problem, it's an it's a international uh, global problem. So some of the themes that we're hoping to advance through this um, Ladders to Cures Accelerator uh, is really the idea of uh, catalyzing progress across the research uh, ecosystem to accelerate advances toward treatments and cures for patients with rare genetic diseases. That's the mission and everything that we've talked about today is sort of here to serve um, this mission. And this beautiful graphic, I think, hopefully captures a lot of what we talked about today. Um, the ladder, the word ladder was selected because we're trying to scale, you know, kind of like climbing a mountain or climbing a ladder, we're trying to scale, we're trying to use scalable technologies as well as approaches to try to serve more and more patients with rare diseases. So of course everything starts with patients at the very beginning of this ladder that we're all climbing. And they are the patients and the advocates are of course the most important stakeholders for everything that we do. We're all here to serve our patients. 
But of course, scientists, all of us here, physicians, advisors such as um, our incredible advisors from the uh, biotech world, for example, who came, or from the regulatory space, like Carrie Jo, who was here with us today. We are all important stakeholders in making this uh, effort a success. And so we're sort of all climbing uh, this ladder together. And you know, we're starting with genes of interest. We want to understand nodal mechanisms of disease. We want to build therapeutic hypotheses and ultimately find the path to the clinic. That's in summary what we hope to accomplish across as many rare diseases as possible. And so again, uh, patients being the key component of this. And so then there's two other components that I can think of to summarize a lot of what we talked about today. And these are just examples. They're not there to really be what's actually going to happen, but more like a proposal of what might happen or what we could envision happening over the next decade or so. But you know, we learned a lot about cell imaging as being an important technology, large scale perturbation. We talked about modifier screens across all rare diseases, if one can imagine doing something like that. We talked about uh, understanding uh, with our new knowledge of protein structure, how uh, variants in particular genes can lead to our under a new understanding of how they fit into protein structure and ultimately function. So we talked about that. We, of course, talked about gene therapies, nucleic acid delivery, platformizing that. How can we develop a postal code for every cell in the human body so that we can ultimately have this be a problem that is easily solvable for any cell type of interest? Very far from that, but something that we can aspire to. And of course, drug screening and repurposing. Small molecules have a role. We heard success stories today. We want to utilize that as much as possible. So I call this enabling technologies. We have to think of new ones that don't exist today, and we have to build on the ones that we know about in order to make progress. And we're all climbing, we're all climbing using these technologies. But of course, we ultimately have to also demonstrate the use of these technologies in some leading edge projects, some case studies in which we can show success. And so I think, you know, hopefully this emerges from the community and it's like a groundswell of interest in this area versus that area that allows us to prioritize where we're going to go first. We can't do all 8,000 diseases all at once, but we already heard some incredible biology, for example, from Bamzi, from um, Elizabeth Engel, from so many others today, from Alan Beggs. I don't want to pick on anyone in particular, but just to say we heard incredible biological stories that could serve as future examples of what uh, we can accomplish. Again, this is uh, something that we have to build together as a community um, and, and all for the benefit uh, ultimately of patients. And so we finally come to the end of the day. We started a little late and we ran a little late. Um, I'm grateful for all of you who stuck with us throughout this day. Again, this is just the beginning of this conversation. There's actually some excellent posters and there is a reception outside for us to mingle and talk some more. And with that, I'd like to thank again, everyone who contributed to the success of today, which is all of you. And uh, until next time, thank you so much.